Hello, and welcome to the Corporate Cults Marathon. This series was streamed from October 2019 to July 2020. I decided to do the marathon because things in our world have deteriorated in unexpected ways since this series was aired. There are so many important reminders that need to be heard. The marathon starts with the early shows that had very low visuals, but begins to pick up with visuals later on in the stream. This is to let my listening audience know what to expect. Also know you can rewind and pause this stream if you want to back up or stop and focus on a slide. Thank you all so much. I'll be in the live chat interacting. Please tell us your thoughts and experiences as you listen today. And in particular, listen out for how much has changed since this series aired. Please share this marathon with a friend and help free another corporate cult member. Thank you so much and enjoy the show. All right, everybody. Hello, hello and welcome. Happy Sunday to you. Welcome to all the first timers. If this is your first live stream with me. Congratulations. You made it to our first live stream. We usually have a really, really good time. Hey, everybody. All right. Well, we will go right ahead and get started with our live stream. So today's topic is corporate cults review part one of i have no idea how many how many parts this is going to be because guys there's so much to talk about in this book and i'm actually not even done with it so that should tell you how excited i am about bringing it to you because i i'm not even finished with it i'm actually on chapter five so i just started chapter five but we we had to start having this conversation right now let's jump into our actual topic which is this book that was recommended to me by a viewer and they know who they are thank you so much for the recommendation honestly you know it's very rare that i come across a book that has me stuck okay and what i mean by stuck is you'll like read a page or two and put it down and you kind of have to think about what you just read for like two weeks and then pick it back up and read a little bit more then put it put that down and think about it for a month because it's so profound and it, it does so much unraveling for the mind that you can't just breeze through the book which is why i'm still not done i've had it for about a month and i just can't i can't finish it because every time i read a page i'm like oh my god and then my head just goes Poof. then i'm stuck for like a week because it's going to take some time to break this apart and i think i'm going to commit to this one because I think we're at a turning point right now in our society and with our economy and the different things that we're seeing where we need to talk about this work, work life, business, the corporation, the influence of the corporation, the power of the corporation. We have to talk about this, how it affects people's lives, how they affect the planet. We have to have this conversation now. So we're pretty much going to have very low visuals this live stream. I apologize, but hopefully you guys are kind of used to that. Um, just kind of listening and taking it all in. Okay, you guys. So here's how I figure we'll do this. So I'm going to click off of the creepy screen and I'm just going to go back to our normal hangout. So this book is called Corporate Cults. I'll flash the picture one more time for those just joining. It was recommended to me by, by a viewer. Anyone who's watched my channel for any length of time, you know how I feel about businesses and corporations and the structures and what they do. But hopefully you also know that I really believe in business. I think the reason I'm so passionate about it is because I know it can work. I know it can. I've seen it work. I've seen it fail and I've seen the in between. And the thing about it is when business works, everybody benefits. Everybody, the business benefits, the employees, the owners, and the customers and society at large. Like we can't sit here and lie and say, we don't benefit from some of the products that some businesses create. We do, We've been, and some of us benefit more than others. Some of us live in countries that benefit so much, we have to take some of those products and put them in another business where you just store them indefinitely until you either part with it or move or whatever. 
So some, there's so much floating around, but some products that are really made that are made are truly beneficial to society. They really have a profound impact, and we know that to be a fact. So we should really invest in making sure that something so vital to us works and functions well. So while I'm very disgusted with how they've been behaving, I believe in their ability to do the right thing. I do, and I push for that. Here's the other half of that, and I think I get into this in the book that I wrote called Surviving Narcissists in the Workplace, is that we all have to work. <laughs> we have to work, at least for now. At least right now in our society, we all have to work. Now, we might reach a point in, in our development where everything is so automated that nobody has to work. You just have to have someone pushing a button somewhere. We might reach that point, but that's also like a very scary divergence point, but we won't get into all that in this live stream. But anyway, the point is, as it stands right now, we need money to survive. We do. And most of us, the good majority of us, the way we get that money is through work of some form. And, that, and that's just the current setup. For better or for worse, that is the current setup, right? So if those are both true statements, then work should not be a place where you go to get abused. If you have to have money, then and you that means you have to work, then work should not be a place where you go and get abused in order to get the money. Do you does that make sense? What's a better way that I could say this? What's something you don't have to have? Well, abuse is never <laughs> Abuse is never warranted in any circumstance, but I guess what I'm saying is it's so vital to life. So we can't abuse something or we can't experience abuse in a place that is so vital to life, that is so important to our very well-being as an individual and as a society. So that's what I'm profoundly against. And that's what I've seen a whole lot of. Instead of people being focused on the big picture and the mission, which is the production or of whatever product or service that hopefully is a, is a good to humanity overall, their focus is on these petty little wars and these interpersonal dynamics trying to be little kings and tyrants and dictators over people, getting their jollies that way, totally wrecking people's minds, hearts, emotions, destroying people's lives in the process, taking, taking, taking from them in the process, getting very little in return to the point where people have to strike against your own employer and protest because they just won't do the right thing. You sit here, you watch them bring in billions, but you're not seeing the, the byproduct of those billions. You're not seeing the byproduct of that hard work. So you occasionally have to remind them why the business functions at all. That's not supposed to be a place where you get abused. It's not, it shouldn't be. And these corporations tolerate individuals who will facilitate that abuse, perpetuate it, and do everything to work around the abuser, but won't fix the actual problem, which is just getting the problem child out and helping the people who support your business in the first place. Like it's so common sense. But what I'm learning is the more money these people make, the more deluded they become in regard to how human beings work. They forget. They no longer know. They, they start to lose touch with the average man or woman because there's so little that they have to do for themselves now. So because they don't have to really engage with society to that level, they forget how society thinks, acts, and operates. They even forget how they would feel, which is, that's the strange part that they can't even put themselves in the shoes of their employees anymore to the point where a show like Undercover Boss would actually have some relevance. I think it's ridiculous for two reasons. One, you don't know what your CEO looks like. You don't know what your board of directors looks like. Wow. Two, you're so out of touch with your operations that you have to go in disguise to see what happens to know what's going on in your own business. You people are insane. You're insane. And we're going to get into a little bit of that insanity as we digest this book, Corporate Cults, by Dave Arnott, or Arnott. I think it's Arnott, though. So here's how I figured we'll do this. So I'm, once again, I'm going to click off of the screen because it's just a wee bit creepy. 
how many chapters in this book? I think there's like 10 chapters. Hold on. No, there's 12. There's 12 chapters. So because I, I know I'm going to get carried away on some of these points, we're going to go really slow through this book. Um, bit by bit, probably two chapters per, per live stream. So that's, <laughs> that's what, six live streams, 12 chapters, two per live stream. Yeah, that's six live streams, but that's going to be paced out over the course of some time. So we'll be talking about this well into the new year because I'm still actually not finished with the book. Cause I do want to see if he's going to make any recommendations on how to avoid them or things like that. So I'm not that far in yet, but we're just going to go like two by two, digest, um, talk about it. And then we'll just slowly move through it, you know, in the mix of other live streams and in the mix of other videos that come out. So you guys can look forward to having this discussion over an extended period of time <sighs> because there's so much to talk about. It's so deep y'all. My pages are littered, just covered in highlights, writing, anyway sorry so now that i've said all that let's start to digest this book chapter one is called when culture becomes a cult most companies today if you go and like kind of look through the job postings and the job listings they rant and rave about their culture it's our culture what makes us special is our culture we have such a unique culture we have such a strong culture 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 and in the word culture is the word cult this book has changed the way even I thought about certain things, and we'll get into that. He opens the book out up with, work has become too important. Oh, and by the way, this book was published in the year 2000. Let me make sure. I think that's so important to, to say that. Yes, copyright 2000. So this book is 19 years old. It says, corporate cults are dangerous because they take more from the employee than they return. Individual identity is replaced with organizational identity. And then I wrote off to the side, it has become our full identity. And it has. Everyone I know, all we do is work. Work, 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 work. That's all we do. We're constantly working. And But the thing about it is, we're so inculcated, we thought that was normal. We're like, well, yeah, we're young adults. You know, we a lot of us went to school, graduated. Some of us went and got trades. Some of us went to the military. We all, you know, did our thing. Now this is the part of our life where we work. So we didn't think there was necessarily anything wrong with it, except for the fact where you start to read up on all the recent statistics of mental burnout, mental health problems, anxieties through the roof, depression is through the roof. <laughs> Yeah, because we as a culture and a society have totally lost ourselves in employment. And that goes back to what I was saying in the beginning of the live stream, which is because we need money. So as long as we need money, most of us, the good majority of us are willing to do what it takes to get the money. But there, there's, a, there's a side of that that we had not considered. So that's what we're getting into. He wrote down here... Um, the following is, is an example of a corporate cult I visited recently. It said, in the first 10 minutes, the visitors took a pledge to do whatever the leader said to do. Visitors were invited to apply washable tattoos to themselves. All attendees participated in a dance. The speaker said, we fire for attitude. The first training session for new employees is done on company time. The remaining courses on, are taken on the worker's own time. And I wrote under that imbalanced and non-reciprocal. So from the very beginning of the relationship, it's deeply imbalanced and non-reciprocal. Non In a lot of states, that's illegal. You can't have your, your at least for hourly employees. In a lot of states, you cannot have hourly employees doing things off the clock unless you plan on paying them for it. And that's law. And isn't it funny how most laws are designed to protect basically against narcissists, to protect against these crazy people, man. It's like, why is this your natural instinct? Why do we have to design laws against your natural instinct, which is to exploit? Why? Why do we have to do that? If you look at the root of almost every law, it's designed against somebody's natural instinct to exploit somebody else. It, it just, why is that your default? That's what I need to know. 
Okay, let me talk about this We Fire for Attitude line. So for anyone who might be, who maybe has the book or who might listen to this on a playback, I'll give the page numbers too. So this is page one <laughs> that we're on. We Fire for Attitude. That is so foolish. That is so foolish unless you're, you're the company ambassador and your job is to be happy and cheerful and make people feel good and welcome and charming and jipper. You know what I mean? Chipper. But some people have jobs that are, or have careers or skill sets that aren't necessarily going to make them happy people all the time. They might have to focus on minutia, but it's very important minutia. They might be very detail oriented. They might be drafting up charts and graphs and, you know, highly complicated things that require a lot of attention that make it to where they can't be like pumped up and like, yeah, all the time. You know what I mean? So this we fire for attitude. Like I get if someone has a nasty attitude, they're rude, disrespectful, mean, belligerent, you know, obnoxious, you know, just nasty people, you know, that's one thing. But they've taken this whole attitude thing to another level to where it basically means if you're not smiling all the time, if you have an opinion that goes contrary to the cult leaders, which we'll get into, if you just happen to see something differently, if you have a different idea, all that is encompassed in this whole conversation about attitude and it, and to fire a talented employee because they're not smiling 24 seven, like they're coked up is the most stupid, foolish business practice that I could process in my spirit. I can't even, I can't think of anything dumber. If I have someone who's supremely talented doing a very specific job for me and they're gene, they're brilliant at it, they're savants at it. And they just happen to look sad all the time. I'm going to check in. Are you okay? Did, is it, did anything happen? Is everything okay? If they say, Oh yeah, I'm fine. I'm, this is just my face cool beans. Here's your paycheck. Rock on kid. I don't care if, if you're sitting over there crying, I'm going to check on you because I want to make sure that it's not something I'm doing. Like, are you okay? Did I make you cry? What happened? Can I fix it? What? Ha I, I just, is everything okay? You know, privately, like I don't want to pry, but are you okay? And if they say, no, I just cry in the morning. That's just what I do. It's part of my morning ritual. I do yoga, I meditate, I cry, and then I'm good. I'm like, all right, kiddo. Well, here you go. Here's your paycheck. Rock on. I'm not going to bother you because of your attitude, because human beings attitudes fluctuate. They change. They, they go in and out of different phases. Sometimes you are going to be happy. Sometimes you're going to be kind of neutral. Sometimes you're going to be down. Sometimes you're going to be mad. You're a full human being and you have the right to experience all of your feelings the key that we're looking for is that you're not just being mean and narcissistic and abusive and nasty for no reason. You know what I mean? It might be a very stressful time of year for your particular industry and people can't be happy right now because they're extremely stressed out. You got to let people be, let people's children be, leave them alone. If they're talented and they're giving you their commitment to the job that you've hired them for, and they're having a bad day, leave them alone. But again, I'm pleading with cult leaders. You can't plead with cult leaders. You can't reason with them. Anyway, I told y'all this is going to take a long, long time to work through. You might as well order the book and uh, get it yourself so we can work through this together because it's going to take a while. All right. So then let's see here. He, he uh, goes on to detail more aspects of the different things that kind of were big red flags that it was a cult. But the one I, another one I highlighted, it said members of the organization often spoke of it as a family. And I wrote right above the word family run in capital letters. Guys, I can't tell y'all how many times I've been in an interview and I've heard the words, we're like a family here. I can't tell you how many times that's happened. And here's, and like I told you, this book is is shifting my own paradigms. It's opening my own eyes to a lot of different things, including where I've gone wrong and choosing 
and accepting different job offers. And almost every single job offer <laughs> that ultimately I ended up having problems on started with that whole, we're like a family here. And for me, <laughs> someone wrote, run like Usain Bolt. <laughs> you better. Because to me, I'm like, that's so awesome. And I'm, this is just PTE confessing how her own eyes are opening and the scales are falling off of my own eyes. Because they would say that and I'm like, well, that's great. Who doesn't want to be like a family? Like, that's awesome, you know? Cool. That means I'll be treated nice. <laughs> that means they'll be nice to me. Wow, they're like a family. That means they like each other. That means they respect each other. That means that, you know, they're there for each other through thick and thin. Mmm, ooh, child. Listen, mm -mm. y'all, that is so off. And we're going to get into how off it is, but it is so, so off. And I'm going to jump way ahead of myself and just tell you now why it's off. It's because only your family is your family. And he's going to go way into that. We're going to get real deep into that. But only your family is your family. And part of the reason that you see uh, a lot of people putting marriage off. So they say the millennials are getting married later. Millennials are either opting not to have kids or they're having kids later. Everything is getting pushed back is because work has become their family. It has. They don't have time for any other family because they already have a family and that family is work. And that is not okay. <laughs> it's not okay. And we're going to get into why it's not okay because some of you might be sitting there going, what? Just like I was, you know? What do you mean? Like, I love my, co like, for those of you who love your coworkers, you are blessed. Okay? You truly are. But if you're watching a live stream called Corporate Cults Review, <laughs> chances are you may not love your coworkers so much. But my point is, we're going to explore why this is not healthy. This book should have, this book needs to go viral. I hope it does. I hope this book, book goes viral because work has completely superseded the family. And now I'm getting ahead of myself, so let me slow down. But I'll just say, only your family is your family. Unless, of course, you work with your family members, literally, <laughs> like your mom and your dad, your sisters and brothers, your cousins and uncles. Obviously, that's different. But if these are a group of strangers, they're not your family. They are not. That is your place of employment. And we'll get into that. Okay. So let's see here. Let's get into some more of my highlights. Oh, and that whole family thing is on page two. All right. So now we're moving. <laughs> okay, I wrote on the top of page three. This is my, this is what I wrote. I wrote, I'm naturally not designed for this. You want every piece of me. And when I reflect on where the, where the heads butt and where the roads diverge, because it's always all good for a brief period of time. It's all good. Like the first couple of weeks is beautiful. And then our roads start to diverge and this book, I've been, like I told you, I will sit and just reflect on it. I'm like, the reason I have so many problems on the job is because I refuse to give them 100% of myself. I refuse. And it's a natural refusal. I didn't even really have the words to describe it. It's just like, no, I need to go home. I need to rest. I need to eat my food at my house. I need to sleep in my bed. <laughs> Um, I need to be with my pets. I need to go see my family. Um, I need to tend to the few friends that are available because the rest of them have been completely gobbled up by their jobs too. I have a life. I had a life before you. I will have a life after you. I exist always. Like I, I don't cease to exist because I now work for you. 
Now, when I'm working for you, I will give you 100% commitment to the job that you hired me for. 100%. Whatever you've hired me to do, I'm going to do it to the best of my ability. And if I falter in an area, I'm going to try to figure out how to fix it and perform well in that area as well. So you have my full commitment in regard to the job that you hired me for, but you cannot have me. We're not married. Okay, so here's fun. Here's what's funny. Before the book arrived, like a week or two before, I keep a list of topics that I want to do videos on. And one of them was we're not married. Let me see if I can get my list. Give me one second. So, so I guess this is me doing that video now. Because the thought that I was having was essentially these companies like want to marry you and we're not married. We're not married, bro. <laughs> we're not. I would never marry you. You don't know how to treat me. You don't. I would never marry you. If, if you were a human person, I wouldn't marry you. I think you're a terrible person. You don't know how to treat people. So why would I marry you? But uh, hold on, let me see here. I make the oh yeah here we go okay so let's talk through this really quick <laughs> we're not married and i made a list of things we're just gonna go through it right now might as well because we're here i made a, a list of things that would actually cause me to marry you right a list of things that would actually incline me to marry you and that list is loyalty fidelity slash faithfulness trust love, <laughs> sex, respect for personhood, gifts, and money. So let's talk through those. First of all, I'm, I'm, we're not married. And I wouldn't marry you because you're not loyal. And I've seen that disloyalty out of these companies more than once. More than once, when it comes to you versus the money, they choose the money every time. So, and that's kind of the salt in the wound because so many people sacrifice their whole life to these organizations. And then as soon as the money becomes the issue, they'll cut them and just kick them out. You mean nothing to them. So you're disloyal. You wouldn't know loyalty if it slaps you in the face. You, you're not faithful. Okay, you have no faithfulness or fidelity about yourselves. You're crooked as shit. So, you know, you're always engaged in some sort of shady business dealings. You're always, you know, looking to see who you can replace with whom. You're told you're not faithful. You're not loyal. I can't trust you largely because you don't tell the truth. You don't tell the truth. You lie to us. You lie to the public sometimes. So you're a dishonest person in general. You don't love me. So love is totally out of the equation. You don't know how to show love. You don't know how to demonstrate love. <laughs> you wouldn't know what love is if it sat on your head. You wouldn't know. You wouldn't know what love is if it crashed into the back of your car. All right? You don't know love. So I would never marry you. Um, can we talk about gifts? Okay. You want someone to marry you, where is my, my diamond? You know what I mean? This little plastic cup and, <laughs> and post-it notepad and company branded pen is not my diamond, honey. Where's my, where's my gifts? You don't know how to treat me. You don't know how to love me. You don't. You don't even know how to propose to me properly. Do you see what I'm saying? You don't. Money, can we talk about money? Since these corporations want you to marry them, darling, you don't pay me enough to marry you. You don't. <laughs> I'm still worried about money. I work for you and I'm still worried about money. You don't pay me enough. You don't give me presents. You don't bring me flowers. You don't sing me love songs. You hardly talk to me anymore. When you come through the door at the end of the day, okay? I'm not sleeping with you, all right? So sex is totally out of the equation. And you don't respect me as a person. Just that you see me as just a, a means to an end. So, you know, that's me going off on a complete rant 
about how these corporations want every piece of you. Essentially, they want you to marry them, but they don't do anything marriageable. You don't present yourself as a reasonable suitor. You didn't propose to me correctly. Thank you for this, um, what is that material? You know that fabric that like um, reusable shopping bags are made out of. Thank you for the little reusable shopping bag and the plastic cup and mug and peppermint and pen and post-it notepad, but that is not a proper proposal. It's not. I think companies should start giving jewelry if you want people to stay with you. Give the men either a nice wristwatch on day one or a nice uh, chain or a nice, um, you know, some men wear rings other than wedding rings. Give the women a diamond if they want one. Y'all better start proposing to people properly if you want them to commit to you up front. That's another thing. They want all this full commitment up front. They want all this commitment from like day one. I don't even know you yet. We don't know each other. So we need to date a little bit. Like we kind of need a courting period a little bit. And these little two or three interviews are not courting. That's not courting. You know what I mean? How can I commit to you and I don't even know you yet? And you haven't even issued a proper proposal. Propose. Giving me a laptop that I have to give back is not a proposal, honey. Giving me a laptop that I get to keep. Now that's a proposal. Okay, let's see here. So then he actually kind of starts to get into a discussion about how industry itself changed. And he was saying, talking about how like the industrial revolution introduced the concept of standardized manufacturing in which efficiency became the determinant of organizational success. So then he started talking about how in the past, people had a deeper connection to their work because they were connected to the whole process. So he was talking about the process of pen making, pen, P-I-N, um, I guess for like um, maybe sewing pins or needles or whatever. And he was saying how they draw the wire, cut the wire, sharpen the point, mount the head, wrap the pen in paper, put the pen in its box. So the worker was connected to the whole entire process. And then he was saying how people got more value out of that because they saw the whole thing happen from start to finish. But as things started to get specialized and technology started to enter in, people were basically only doing one part of that process, which totally disconnected people from the work, which was not a good thing. Human beings kind of need to see like the whole thing happen. Um, otherwise you kind of become a robot. So he was saying how then it moved, it moved away essentially from your skill to more so who you were. So now this quote, is on page five. He said, employees are unabashedly devoted to the organization as shown by their willingness to work extra days, stay late and attend parties and other business functions on their own time. That's good for the organization, but it's bad for the individual. It's bad because it takes away the indiv individual's identity. Spending time and effort in the pursuit of organizational goals reduces the time and effort available to spend in pursuit of individual goals. And if you think about it, that is exactly what's happening to people. Like, if you've ever sat or heard like someone introduce someone who's had like a lengthy career in a certain field, it's all related to like work. You know, they were the, the VP of this division, and then they went and headed up this, and they were the district manager of this, and da 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 da, da. And it's all quite impressive. And then they always add in at the end, he, he or she is also a wife or husband and has two, two sons or two daughters and a dog. And it's like, well, thanks for the, thanks for the honorable mention. But this, this person has been completely devoted to work. And here's the thing. If you love what you do, if you love it, if you live for it, if you get up in the morning and it's what you look forward to and you're making a difference and an impact, there's not necessarily anything wrong with that. And we'll kind of explore that. We'll, we'll, we'll explore that a little bit. So this is still page five. And it says, unfortunately, 
Uh, well, it says corporate cults use individuals to achieve organizational goals. Unfortunately, there is an ample supply of cult candidates, people who gain their identity only from what they do, not from who they are. And that's kind of where I was going a second ago. They gain their identity from what they do, not who they are. And who you are is more important. But once you become a corporate cult member, little by little, who you are gets stripped away from you. So then he's, he starts talking about himself a little bit. This is page six. He says, my personal value was derived almost exclusively from the list of my accomplishments. And he was saying how this individual, this person in his life helped him realize that even if he didn't succeed, he was still valuable as an individual. So how many people have we heard stories about where if they lose a particular job, they've lost their whole identity. Like they, they cannot recover from that because that is 100% the totality of who they were as a person. Okay, so this is page seven, and it says, I am concerned when individuals find too much value in what they do at work and cannot find value in who they are apart from work. There is a difference. And I wrote off to the side, I am a person outside of this. And I am, I'm a person outside of this. This is not the totality of my identity. And it never will be, darling. Again, we've gone through We've gone through the list. I would never marry you, ever. You don't know how to love me or treat me. You don't know how to reciprocate. You're not trustworthy. You're not loyal. We're certainly not sleeping with each other. You don't give good gifts. You're cheap. You're cowardly to a degree. I would never marry you. All right, so let's see. This is still page seven. It says, these employees also allow their own moral and ethical codes to be violated to satisfy the demands of their organization, which they have made into a corporate cult. And, and is that not the truth? How many people allow their moral, their personal moral and ethical codes to be violated just to please their cult? Doing things that they know are wrong just to make their cult members or their cult leaders happy. So, okay, so interestingly now, he, well, I won't say interestingly, because that sounds like I don't agree. I guess it's interesting in that I'd never thought about it this way. So this is still page seven. He puts a lot of responsibility on the cult members themselves. He really does. And I feel like I'll do it a huge disservice if I try to explain it myself. But essentially, he says that they're prisoners by choice. He makes reference to an old song called Hotel California by Don Henley. I'll just read this. He says, in the 1976 song, Hotel California, Don Henley of the Eagles sang about membership in a drug cult. The song concluded that once the members joined, they couldn't escape because they had joined of their own free will. Like the visitors to Hotel California, members of corporate cults are prisoners by choice. They enter freely. No one forces them. It's a cult of their own device. Then he says, what we know as traditional cults have, what we know is traditional cults have leaders who find prospective members who have a proclivity to be dominated. The prospective cult members have low self-esteem, so the organization is their only source of individual value. That is so sad. The most likely members are employees with a hole in their soul that is patched by membership in the organization. <laughs> oh. It says the trait, this trait often takes the form of team play or loyalty when in fact it is a yearning to belong to anything. And I'm laughing because I'm laughing at my note. I wrote up under that paragraph and I'm very full. So it's not that I don't have holes. I think everyone has a hole or two. It's that most of my holes are small enough to where I don't need them to be filled by this. And that's no knock on anyone who has a bigger hole, who needs it filled by something like a membership with an organization. Because a lot of people do find a lot of value in that. So I'm not knocking you for that. I'm not knocking you for the potential low self-esteem that he that he says, but 
I think for me, what it is, is I've always kind of been, I've always had interest in my own life. <laughs> I don't know how to explain it any better than that. Like I go to work to support my life. Does that make sense? Like I don't go to, I don't, what's the flip of that? So if I go to work to support my life, I don't use my life to support my work. Would that be the inverse of that? I'm confusing myself, but I think you guys get what I'm saying. Like, you know, I, I willingly and voluntarily will go to work and I'll work hard, but that's all in an effort to support this life that was given to me some 30 some odd years ago. So do you see what I mean? Like when you were born, you weren't born an employee, you were born a human being. So at what point did you stop being a human being? He makes a comparison between prison and work. It says prisoners may have a better life than you do, according to the following comparison. In prison, you spend a majority of your time in an eight by 10 cell. At work, you spend most of your time in a six by eight cubicle. And in some places you don't get that anymore. Some places it's a table with dividers and some places it's just a table that you have to share. So at least in prison, you get your own office. In prison, you get three square meals a day. At work, you only get one break for a meal and you have to pay for it. In prison, you get time off for good behavior. At work, you get rewarded for good behavior with more work. In prison, a guard unlocks and opens the door for you. At work, you must carry a security card to unlock and open all the doors yourself. In prison, you watch TV and play games. At work, you get fired for watching TV and playing games. In prison, they ball and chain you when you go somewhere. At work, you're just ball and chained. In prison, you get your own toilet. At work, you have to share. <laughs> In prison, they allow your friends and family to visit. At work, you can't even speak to your friends and family on the phone. In prison, all expenses are paid by taxpayers with no work required. At work, you get to pay all the expenses to go to work, and then they deduct taxes from your salary to pay for prisoners. In prison, you spend most of your life looking through the bars from the inside wanting to get out. At work, you spend most of your time wanting to get out to go to the bars. In prison, you can join many programs that you can leave at any time. At work, there are some programs you can never get out of. In prison, there are sadistic wardens. At work, the managers take care of all that. So I thought that was hysterically funny. I thought I highlighted at work, you get to pay all the expenses to go to work and then they deduct taxes from your salary to pay for the prisoners. <laughs> all right, so this is on page 10. It says the days of command and control are over. And I mentioned many live streams or videos ago, how I'd seen something on LinkedIn that said the future will be kind, the future change is coming and the future will be kind. And that made me think of this. Command and control are over. That's done. Like we've, we've evolved as a society. We don't have to do that anymore. We never really had to, but at, there was a point in time where mass production was the goal. We had to get things out in large numbers and we had to pump it out at a relatively quick rate. We don't have to do that anymore. We can evolve and we need to find the new things now that we need to fix. So there's a lot of old things that we kind of have a lock on, like we got a good system for it, great. Now it's time for us to explore new things to fix. There is new work out there, but we have to figure out what it is. So he starts talking about three circles, right? So everyone has three circles, family, work, and community, right? And he said, a person who lives a balanced life is comfortable in all three organizational circles. He or she exists as an individual who can retain a personal identity while becoming a part of work, a part of family, and a part of community. So in other words, they don't lose themselves in any of those. They are an employee here, they're a family member here, and they're a community member over here, but none of those three consumes them totally. What he said has happened is work has become the largest circle totally taking over the family and community circle, basically. It says, he says, my concern is that employees are stealing time from family to invest it at work. And they are. 
they are. And, and the saddest part about it is so many of us think we're doing the right thing by doing that. We think that that's the sacrifice that we have to make in order to get where we want to be. But listen to what you're sacrificing though. You're sacrificing your family, your family, your friends, your, you, your life, like your life outside of even those things. Like you're sacrificing everything for work. I saw a post on LinkedIn last night, actually. And just as I went to screenshot it, I think this person deleted it because so many people were speaking against it and I couldn't believe it. But basically she was saying that she had just come from the funeral burying, I think it was her brother-in-law. I'm scrolling through now to see if I can find it. And he was 46 years old and she started listing off all the stuff he did for work. Like he did this and that and climbed this ladder and climbed that ladder and blah, blah, blah. And then he had a heart attack. So she was basically saying work is not everything, guys. She was like, you got to remember to take care of yourself. You got to say no. You have to put up boundaries. And people were in the comments like, well, while I agree that you have to put up boundaries, you have to remember that you're a team player too. And like, I could not believe people were speaking against this woman on a post where she's saying her brother-in-law just died because he basically worked himself to death. And I think that's why she deleted it because she just... I guess she got tired of the commentary and I was so mad that I didn't screenshot it before she deleted it. But I read it and I read, I got the gist and she was basically saying how many people are out here just killing themselves for, for the corporation who doesn't even know how to properly court you and make a proper proposal to you. They want you to marry them, give you their whole life like a true narcissist would, and they want to give you very little in return. We've got to upset that balance. When I see these strikes all over the place, do y'all know how much joy that fills my heart with? I don't think you do. I don't think you all appreciate how much pleasure I get out of these strikes. I think they just said GM experienced $1 billion in losses as a result of the strikes. Good, good, go hard. Keep going until you get what you need. We're not asking for more than what we need. Ooh, okay, so this one's gonna hurt. This is on page 13. He said, an individual who invests resources that should go to the family and community in the work circle is not an emotionally mature, fully functioning member of society. Ouch. He basically said, if you, if you put work over everything else, you're not emotionally mature and you're not a fully functioning member of society. Let's see here. He said, obviously reasonable people hope for the proper balance. Employees who enjoy their work, but are able to leave it and pursue other self-satisfying endeavors outside of the workplace. Wait. It sounded like an incomplete sentence, but it's not because there's a colon in there. Basically saying the proper balance is you enjoy your work, you like what you do, but you are able to leave it and pursue other things outside of the workplace and not feel like one or the other is being shortchanged, basically. He said the workplace environment has become all three, work, family, and community to the culted worker. Has it not? It's work, it's family, and it's your community. So you don't need a life outside of work when work is all three. Work is your life. That's why people go home, go to sleep, wake up, and they do it again the next day. And they say, well, I, I don't really have a life. Work, I, all I do is work. Well, work is all three. Work is your family. They're your community and your work. So how could your young population, how can your young population get out date okay all right so let's 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 really break that that apart we discourage dating at work especially now because things are very very tense and tedious i guess you could say between the genders everyone's afraid of everybody else and that's fine because work really should be work to be honest with you but so they you know dating is discouraged and at some companies dating is flat out forbidden between um employees it's highly discouraged and if not forbidden altogether so then 
if your employees can't meet and date each other, which happens, it still happens. I know some companies, there are married couples who met at the company and both of them have been there 20 and 30 years. Talk about a cult. Anyway, how can your young people get married and start their own families when they already have one? They're already married to you, their employer, and they already have a family, which is their coworkers and peers. Okay. And in some places they already have children because some of us have to manage the mental disorders of the people around us. So, you know, managing a toddler can often feel like managing someone with a mental disorder. So some people in the workplace take on the mother father role, whether or not they want it. So they're constantly managing their children at work. They're managing their husband or wife at work and they're managing their parents at work. So they're already married. They spend all their time with you. All their money really is devoted to you. The food that they eat, the clothes that they wear, the purchases they make, the car that they drive is all to get back to you. They are already married to you. So they're married to their employer. Some of them already have kids with their employer. How could they ever get out and date in the quote unquote real world and find a real spouse and start a real family separate from this. If you work a nine to five, Monday through Friday, nine to five, that's standard and respectable, right? Yeah, nine to five, okay? Unless you live across the street, you really work like seven to seven or seven to six because you have to wake up, get dressed. Some of you work out when you get up in the morning. You have to eat breakfast, some of you. You have to drive over there or commute to where you're going. So for many of you, that means waking up at least by seven o'clock to get to work on time. So if you're 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., that leaves like four or five hours for you, for your personal life during the week. And then, okay, sure, you have your weekend, but what do you really do on the weekend? You spend your weekend catching up everything you couldn't do during the week because of your family, your first family, which is work. So you're running errands on Saturday, Sunday you're washing laundry, picking up dry cleaning, getting ready to go back to your main family, which is work. So how can your young people get married? How can they have families and start, start their own family? They can't, they already have a family. And most people can't do, most people can't maintain two households. It's very hard, so you're gonna end up cheating on one of them. And which one do you choose? You usually cheat on yourself and your, your real family and your real friends. He says, if your employer has shown commitment to you, perhaps you owe commitment in return, but I would suggest you should return to the corporation what it is paying you for, commitment of your time and talent, not your soul. You don't owe your soul or any other part of your psyche that you consider valuable to your company. He said, but corporate cults want more. Workplaces that invest in their employees win emotional allegiance from their workforce and increasingly more of their time, which has to come from family and community commitments. Then he gets into talking about how devastated people are when they lose these jobs because that was who they were. That was their whole entire identity. Okay, let's see here. This is page 14. Corporate cults gain efficiency by taking increasing contributions from workers while returning decreasing financial rewards. This made me think of the concept of paying for your own travel. For those of you who've ever had to travel for work. Now, the good companies will pay for everything up front or they will provide you with a company card, okay? But there are a lot of companies who have taken this position and personally, I think it should be against the law because it's not right because it makes you an investor in the company and you get no return on your investment. But basically they make you pay for your own travel up front, then they reimburse you. So for some of you, that would mean paying for airfare up front out of your pocket, your credit card or your savings, paying for your hotel room up front, paying for your rental car if you get one up front and then taking those thousands of dollars and submitting them for reimbursement and waiting four to six weeks to get your money back. Now, what no one likes to talk about 
is in the interim, what they don't pay you for is the interest that's being charged to you on your credit cards. So if you charge $2,000 on a credit card for company travel, they'll pay you back approximately $2,000. They're not going to pay you back $2,050 for the $50 interest or whatever interest charge. They don't pay you interest. So you're losing money. You're, you're paying to work for them, basically. And you're investing your own private funds and getting zero return on investment other than the job itself, which they think you should be thankful for, which is another huge sign of a cult. They feel like you should be thankful that you're even there. And that means that they don't have to do anything to fix themselves because they feel like the fact that you're here alone is your payment. That's a cult. All right, let's see here. He closes out with some thoughts on the military, which I'm not gonna get into because um, I know that there's a lot of military families so I'm not going to touch that with a 10 foot pole, but that's on page 15 and 16. But if you've been listening thus far, I'm sure you know how he feels. Okay. So yeah, so he essentially kind of closes out with that. He said in corporate cults, the organization has become work, family and community for the employee. I feel like what has happened is almost every single, and it's hard for me to say this. I try not to be that person who speaks in general based on their own experiences but I've worked a lot of places and I can honestly say that almost all of these companies have taken this particular position. They've become cults. And I think they think they're doing the right thing, but they don't realize how much harm they're actually causing. And I distinctly remember a point, a period in time, probably like late nineties, early two thousands where they had not taken this particular, well, I guess I can't say that because this book was written in 2000, but I can say the companies I worked for were more focused on work. Like this is the job. This is what you do. Period. You come in, you do the job. We, I didn't have to like, we didn't have to be friends. And honestly, I loved those jobs. I really did. You know, they were like, you know, jobs a teenager takes in high school, but still I liked it because it wasn't, it wasn't all of me. You know, it, it was, it was a job. This is the job. This is what you do in the job. Have fun. You know, they didn't say have fun, but you know, basically go for it, kiddo. But we're not going to ask for every square inch of your time. Now, now you guys like, being a good cult member is so important now. It is almost more important than the skill set that you possess. If you show the qualities of being a great cult member, you will have a job for a long time. You're going to sell your soul in the process, but you will be employed. You will be employed and soulless, but you will have a job because this is all that matters to them right now that you can fall in line and join the cult. And it's usually on very, very mundane, not important type of work, <laughs> you know? Like to some degree, I see the need in being able to move. I won't say to some degree, I see the need to being able to move as a unit when something is very, very high stakes, right? When the stakes are high, when life is at stake, you know what I mean? And we don't have time to kind of think separately and, you know, be our own people. We have to move as a unit right now because if we don't, we will literally die. If we don't do the plan and follow the plan to the letter, we will literally die. Those are high stakes. I could see losing your identity for the sake of staying alive. You know what I mean? But hopefully that's a temporary situation that you're not in 40 hours a week, but they, they want to inculcate you for data entry. You know what I mean? For billing. They want to inculcate you for, for jobs where your, your life is not on the line. The group's life is not on the line. Do you see what I mean? And, and, it's you now that I've read this book, it's so obvious to me, the whole family thing. We're family here. You know, oh, we, we, we really care about each other. We take care of each other here. Honey, that is cult, cult, cult. That's cult. And what we fail to remember about families is a lot of families are dysfunctional. <laughs> 
Don't ever forget that a lot of families are actually dysfunctional. So when you say we're like a family here, I need to start following that up with a healthy family or a dysfunctional family. Which kind of family are you? Are you the type of family who likes to keep everything tight-lipped and keep the family secrets close to the chest and no one ever says anything is wrong because we don't want to upset whoever the main cult leader is? You know, are you dysfunctional? Are you violent, abusive? You got problems? You got substance abuse issues? What you got going? Any family mental health issues? What's up? What kind of family are you? Okay. So it's like me reading this book is helping me understand what I've been experiencing. It's almost like if they could, if they could, if it was legal and they could get away with it and they didn't think I would retaliate, they would hit me in my face and be like, why won't you join the cult? Join the cult. Get in line. Why won't you join this cult? Why can't we break you, girl? And the reason is because because I'm going home. That's why. Like, it's very simple. There's no need for the violence. The reason is because me going home is more important than anything y'all got going here. Anything. And like I told you, I will devote myself fully. I won't take more than I'm supposed to. And I will also probably not give more than I'm supposed to unless the stakes are really high. You know what I mean? It's not a situation where it's like, I'm not that person who comes late, leaves early. I come on time and I leave on time because that's what you're paying me for. If you want me to stay later, pay me. Pay me more money. I'll stay later. I'm very, I'm very transactional when it comes to work and they don't like that. They want that extra. You know what I mean? I'm realizing now that what they can't get from me is that extra. So when I've spoken on other videos of how like your, your fellow employees like to come and like basically steal time from you. And I think they're aware of what they're doing, but the thought process is who cares that I just took 30 minutes from you, just stay 30 minutes later and make up those 30 minutes that I took from you. But those 30 minutes are mine. They belong to the life that is mine. And some of you might see that as selfish. And I recognize that it might sound selfish, but I have more of my interior self preserved as a result than you probably do. Anyone who thinks I'm being selfish because it's like, I'm smart enough to recognize when it's required. You know what I mean? Like if an emergency pops up that was out of all of our control, that's going to have us here an hour later because of this emergency, of course, I'm going to stay the hour. I'm not going to be like, well, it's burning down guys. Good luck going home. I'm not that person either. I'm very reasonable, I'm intelligent, and I'm smart enough to know, ooh, that's major. Yeah, we have to stay and put out this fire. But I'm not doing daily fires with you. If we have a fire every day, either I'm in the wrong industry or something is not being planned properly or organized properly. You see what I mean? Or, you know, I'm not a firefighter. <laughs> if you're a firefighter, then, you know, it's different. I'm not doing daily fires with you. We can organize ourselves intelligently enough to where we're not putting out fires every single day. But yeah, I'm going to stay and put out the fire. If it's something that was popped up out of our control and out of our awareness, come on. But I'm also not going to give you every square inch of my life. I'm not. I can't. I don't have that many square inches to give. <laughs> So the few square inches that I have left, I have to preserve them. I have to hold on to them. They're all I have. I cannot give them to you. And when I start to see people trying to encroach upon those square inches, that's usually where we bump heads and part ways. And we are going to continue on with our review of this book, Corporate Cults. So those of you who tuned into the last live stream, we did a solid review of chapter one of Corporate Cults. There's 12 ch uh, chapters in total. As I stated in the last live stream, I'm very pro-business. I'm actually very pro-business. I don't mind capitalism as long as it's not abusive. <laughs> as long as what we're doing to get the money is not stripping people of their dignity, self-esteem, self-respect, their livelihood. I think that we can accomplish our goals without doing those things. And so that's really what I'm all about. 
you know, I would love to see businesses right themselves and start to do the right thing more often and make these kinds of conversations obsolete. But as of right now, we are in the thick of things in regard to these corporations kind of losing their minds, like they've lost their ever loving minds. So we're deep diving into kind of that lunacy, what causes it, the motivations, what we can do and things like that. So let's continue in our book review. So chapter two is called The Cohort Horn. This starts on page 18 and 19. So in this chapter, he really starts to get into the differences between the generations. And if you have the book, I hope you do, but otherwise you'll kind of have to use your imagination. So he starts off the chapter talking about how in the past, it was easier to manage different groups of employees because they all shared the same set of values. So he was saying that the first generation, he calls the depression era generation. Now, something to note about the generations. There are many different um, brackets. So a lot of people put the generations in different brackets. There's a lot of debate on like the years that kind of straddle the fence. People don't know where they want to put people. Sometimes I think that everyone's just anxious to label somebody something. But I do think it is useful because different things shape the different generations. So the first one he talks about is the Depression era generation, which covers the years 1912 to 1921. He said their core value was frugality. Then there was the World War II generation that covers the years... 1922, some say 1925 to 1945. So that's your World War II generation. Their core values were patriotism and collectivity. Then you have the baby boomers who cover the years 1946 to 1964, give or take. Their values were counterculture and individualism. Then you have Generation X, which covers the years 1965 to 1981. For their values, he just put the letter X, in a capital X, meaning nobody knows. And then after that, he had generation Y and under there for their values, he put a question mark. Now keep in mind, this book was written in the year 2000. So he didn't know what was to become of the generation Y. Now, the point he was kind of making as he was illustrating this was it was easier to control people in the past because you knew what everyone stood for. With Generation X, which spanned 1965 to 1981, they kind of didn't have a defining thing that kind of like solidified them. So they became harder to control. And in becoming harder to control, these corporate cults started to form. So that's what we're going to get into. So he refers to that that solidifying event as a life altering event. So he was saying that generation X didn't really have one and we really haven't had one since. Now, some people would argue that 9-11 was a, a defining moment for the generation, you know, so forth and so on. But others argue that like, you know, we haven't seen, my generation hasn't seen people of the same age shipped off to war, you know what I mean? And have a whole bunch of them not come back. We haven't seen that. Like we haven't seen the complete shift of how our society runs as a result of some major defining event. Again, 9-11 could be argued that that was a defining event, but we won't get into that. The point is we can kind of attribute the rise of corporate cults to the lack of definition in the generations. So now he's on page 23. He said, while the previous generations honored conformity, the baby boomers sought individuality. Then he said that the baby boomers had a lot of post-war prosperity. So they were freed for wor from worries about external survival, and they were able to turn inward to focus on making themselves what they wanted to be. This is all important. We're all going somewhere with this. So then he gets into a little bit about how like the boomers and the Xers are tightly knit groups that share very intimate lifestyles because the value bases are so narrow that the individuals can't find acceptance outside of the enclave. So I think I might have read that wrong. Forgive me. I'm getting excited because we're getting there. So 
as he goes on, now I'm on page 27, he said that many Gen Xers put career first. A broad study of the generation indicated an almost universal determination that career should precede marriage, implying that Gen Xers consider the work circle more important than the family circle. So when I kind of reflect on, you know, leaders that I've really had a tough time out of, I'd have to place... The, well, you know what? I can't say that anymore. That's not true because my most recent ones have been younger than me and we'll get into that. But prior to them, it was all Gen Xers, very few boomers. The boomers were their bosses, but my bosses were the Xers and they seemed to totally, totally not care about your personal life. So I have to say that that might actually be true. And then he said the data indicating that they have chosen work over home and community put them in the category of very cultable. OK, so the point and purpose of understanding all of this is understanding that by virtue of the way some people were brought up, by virtue of what occurred in their generation, some generations are more prone to cult like behavior than others is basically what the point of this all is. And I have the funniest visual to show you guys. Maybe I'll just show you next time. But he brings up Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So we've talked about that on this channel. And this is on page 28. And he was basically going through how each generation has walked themselves up the need triangle. So he was saying that the depression generation had physiological needs to worry about. The World War II generation had safety needs to worry about. The baby boomers had esteem and belongingness needs to worry about. And then Generation X had self-actualization needs to worry about. So in other words, each generation improved upon life to such an extent that the next generation only had to worry about the next level up in the hierarchy. Sounds great, right? I wish you guys could see this picture. For those of you who have the book, it's on page 28, but it makes you wonder, well, if Generation X was born into self-actualization, what the hell happens to the millennials and Gen Y and, and the iGen and everybody else? What's left? You see? Now we're getting deep. Now we're kind of detouring a little bit. But basically what I'm saying right now is that if a generation has nothing to like Basically, there's, I can't even say spoil because that would be completely unfair because it's not a spoiling. It's more so we're not worried about physiology, safety. We're kind of working on esteem and belongingness, but we're kind of okay there. You know, self-actualization is possible. So what's left? It's almost like they have nothing to work on. They have no projects. That's a total divergence. We'll get into that another day. But the generations that came after X, according to this picture I'm looking at, they basically have no projects to work on. Everything has been solved, you see? So when you hear the generations complain and say, oh, these kids don't know how to work hard and they don't know what hard work is, right, because every generation, you guys made work easier. You did it on purpose. It's called innovation. It's called progress. It's called technology. So all the hard work you put in made life easier for your kids to the point now where they're so lost, they don't know what to do. They don't have anything to worry about, basically. So then they worry about everything. All right. He then goes on to page 29. These are his words, not mine. He says, baby boomers are easy corporate cult candidates because their needs for belongingness and esteem are met through organizational memberships. So when you start to think about the structure, and I, this probably goes without saying, but this is no offense to anyone, okay? We're just trying to solve for X. All right. Or Y or Z. We're just trying to fix the problems. And the only way you can fix a problem is by thoroughly identifying it. So if we think about who's in charge right now, it is the boomers right now that are in charge. We're getting ready to move into the extras being in charge. And then the millennials will come up behind them. But right now the boomers are in charge. And according to what he's saying, the boomers are easy corporate cult candidates because their needs for belongingness and esteem are met through organizational memberships. And isn't that what you've seen and felt? That's what I've seen and felt. Oh, completely what I've seen and felt. Like it's a complete alliance. It's a complete total alliance and um, allegiance is the word I'm looking for. 
which is beautiful if your organization is treating you right. So I do want to say this. If your organization is good to you and they are fair with you and they treat you right and they treat you with dignity and respect, give them your all. Give in terms of the work. Let's be clear. But you know, don't shortchange someone who's being good to you is what I'm saying. And I've never told you to shortchange. I've always said give exactly what you're supposed to give, no more and no less, unless they're showing you that they are truly devoted and loyal and good people and a good corporation. I read um, a comment when I was watching the last live stream back. I read a comment that said one of the viewers' husbands, his company is still courting him. So in other words, they're always looking out for him. If he needs something, they get it for him. If he needs time off, there's no hassle whatsoever. Even, um, I forgot what the industry was, but she was saying that if there's no work, his boss will pay him anyway because his boss wants him to stay. So in situations like that, truly make sure that you're treating that employer with the utmost respect and giving, giving your absolute best effort because they are rare but they do exist. So you always want to make sure that we are reciprocating. You understand? Anyway, that's just a sidebar. Okay. So, so I thought this was key. So this is on page 30. He said, corporations want people whose actions and reactions are predictable. They want a bunch of depression era workers, but they can't have them because they are dying off. Increasingly, they will have to learn to be competitive with a corporation staffed by Gen Xers and their successors, members of Generation Y. So he acknowledges the Generation Y. Some people do, some people don't. Someone told me the other day that I'm Generation Y, but for the longest, I've known myself to be a millennial. But I am like right at the very beginning of the millennials, but like at the tail end of X, they don't know where to put us anymore. They don't know. <laughs> like Nobody knows at this point. But I'm in the mix for sure. And then my parents are boomers, both of them. So that just kind of gives you a kind of a 20 on me. So that's chapter two. So he's just kind of setting up how the generations kind of play into all of this and where all of this comes from. Um, and I don't know if he's going to get into this, though, but I've been very surprised to see so many millennials adopt a cult like mentality. Didn't see that coming at all. I thought my group was against that. But, oh, man, they're so for it. And I'm, I'm actually kind of shocked to see that. I'm surprised to see my generation act this way because we... We came up right as everything was changing. And it's not that everyone above us didn't. It's that we were still, we were transitioning out of teens into young adulthood, right as technology was transitioning literally from like the dark ages, basically. Like we're talking like CD-ROMs, floppy disks. AOL used to send out the CDs and you could download the latest software and plug in your, we're talking like the dinosaur in terms of technology to kind of where we are today. So we witnessed the transition. Like we, we were right smack dab in the middle of it. So we've seen the old way and we've seen the new way. So I'm very surprised to see so many millennials participating in cult-like behaviors. It's shocking to me because I thought we were more forward thinking than that. But I think by the time I'm finished reading this book, I'll understand why this is happening. Moving on. So that was chapter two, just kind of uh, talking about the generations and things. Now, now the meat and potatoes. Let's go to chapter three, which starts on page 32. So I think this is so important. We're, we're going to pretty much spend the rest of the live stream on this and we'll pick up next time with the rest of the chapter. So chapter three is called the competitive advantage selection model. He starts off right away on page 32 by saying there are task people and there are people people. I think we all kind of know that, you know, okay, there are introverts and extroverts. You know, there's people who like working with people. There's other people who like, you know, kind of working in solitude. I think we kind of knew that, right? But it goes deeper than that. This is pivotal. This is one of the things that had me stuck as I was describing in the last live stream. He goes on to describe two distinct sets of employees or groups of people within an organization. There are collections of specialists 
and there are specialist collections. And we will get into what those are and why they're so important. So the example that he gives for a collection of specialists is like the movie industry today. So the movie industry of the past was more of a specialist collection. The movie industry of today is a collection of specialists in that everyone who's working on a movie doesn't necessarily work for that studio. They come together for a very specific purpose, for a very specific period of time, for a specific project, for a specific price. And when it's over, it's over. And they all go back to where they came from until they're needed again, but they'll probably just go work on another project. Okay. So we got that. So then he says, movies are made by a collection. This is 34. Movies are made by a collection of spe specialists, people who assemble for a short period of time to complete a single project, then disband. The specialists are collected only for the function they perform, not for any long-term contribution their presence will make to the organization. Members of a collection of specialists are honored for what they do, not for who they are. And I'm not sure if I said this in the last live stream, so forgive me if I'm repeating, but in some of the jobs that I've experienced like this, I used to say to myself, sometimes I feel like you guys are just paying me for appearances. You, you, you're just paying me to be here. Like I would really sit there and have that profound moment. Have you ever sat at your desk and just kind of stared at a ceiling tile and had an aha moment? And I, I, I had those and I would be like, I think these guys are just paying me to be here because if that's what it is, let me know. And I can completely shift gears because here's the thing about me. I'm very, very task oriented because I don't understand why, why we're here otherwise. I don't understand why I got up at 7 a.m. and got dressed and did my hair and my makeup and got in traffic and drove over here and came. You know what I mean? Like, why are we here if we're not here to work? Is that weird? Does that make me a strange person? I need to know because if it does, it answers so many questions. So anyway, after I would ask myself that question, I would say to myself, it looks like they just want me here for appearances. So if that's the case, I can really back up off of some of this work and just hang out with y'all all day if that's what you want. But if that's what you want, leave me alone about this other stuff. You got to choose. So what he's basically saying with this collection of specialists versus specialist collection is that one group of people gets paid for appearances. The other group of people gets paid to actually work. And that's not necessarily an insult. What he was basically saying was they are both business models. They are. And I think the biggest takeaway for me is just understanding what business model I'm applying to. Am I applying to a collection of specialists or am I applying to a specialist collection? I think where I have gone wrong in the past is I am a natural, hold on, <laughs> I'm getting confused. I, I'm a person who would naturally be drawn to a collection of specialists, people who are paid for what they do. I've been applying for jobs that are specialist collections, people who are paid for who they are. And I just didn't know. I just didn't realize that's what I was doing. Like that's been my fundamental flaw, error, misstep, mistake that I've made every single time is drifting towards these organizations that are really just looking for the people and not necessarily for their output. And I guess for me, because I feel like I'm a very logical person, it's illogical for you to have a company that really doesn't do anything. <laughs> what do you do? What do you make? What are you selling? Like, what is your product? You know what I mean? You appear to have a product, but when it comes down to it, really, at least when it comes to me, you're not interested in the product. You're interested in the person and I'm interested in the product. So do you see the fundamental disconnect? It's a fundamental disconnect. Man, that was really eye opening for me. So what it tells me is if I intend on remaining in the work world until I can kind of walk away permanently, 
I need to target jobs that are either kind of like contract based positions or jobs that they could care less about your mood. All they really care about is what you do. You know, and the thing about it is I'm actually a very cheerful, happy, pleasant person to be around. I only bring the claws out when I recognize that you're trying to like inculcate me and you're trying to like weirdly control me for no reason. Like when I start to see that narcissist come out, it brings out my defenses. But other than that, if you're just a regular normal person, you would never even know I have that other side because there'd be no re reason to show it. So I'm feeling like what he's saying is in collection of specialist situations, there would rarely be a circumstance that you would need to show it because we're probably on a deadline also. So we have to finish something. We don't have time for all this interpersonal BS. Oh, I also have a little treat for you guys. You have to stick around to the very, very end to get it. Um, it's nothing special. It's just something funny I want to share with you guys that's relevant and related. Um, so I'll give that to you guys at the very end. And then if you come back on a playback, I'll put it in the description box because I love you like that. So anyway, there's one major aha from this book. So if you've been having trouble yourself uh, with narcissists on the job, with corporate cult type situations, you may accidentally be applying to specialist collections and you're actually someone who would belong to a collection of specialists. So kind of furthering that idea in the collection of specialists, he said, payment is made only for task completion and nothing else. I like it. Very transactional. I like it because you just know what it is. Very black and white. I like it. It says the collection of specialists obtain the expertise of the specialists without all the people baggage. Love it. Beautiful. Perfect. So that was page 34. All right. So now I'm on 35. It says the employees of collection of specialist organizations must have the ability to maintain the value of who they are in their family and community because those types of warm fuzzies are not available at the workplace. So someone who would naturally join a more cult-like organization would hate a collection of specialists because they don't get all that, all the bubbles, all the frills and the fuzzies, you know, it's very task driven, you know, so they would be uncomfortable. So that's why I said one is not necessarily worse than the other. I think you just have to know where you are. So this is important. He says the collection of specialists provide a healthy cor corporate atmosphere because the individuals in the organization retain their own self identity as they move from project to project. So in other words, they never ever remove themselves and put on the, the identity of the corporation because that's not what they're there for. They're there to do a very specific thing. There's a very specific role here. So the author's personal opinion on page 36, he says, I think the corporate workplace should be more cold and contractual. And actually, I kind of agree. Like, God, I was such a perfect candidate, man. It makes perfect sense. It makes sense why they chose me. And it also makes sense why I chose them. Because like I told you in the last live stream, I'm bright eyed and bushy tailed. Okay. I like to have fun. I like to laugh. Like I like for people to seem at least like they're enjoying themselves. I'd prefer it to be genuine. I like for people to genuinely enjoy themselves, have a good time. You know, so when I see companies <laughs> now looking back, it's so funny. But when I see them doing like the cheesy little games and the cheesy little onboarding stuff, like it's cheesy, but I also thought like, okay, that's really cute though. Like it's cute, it's cheesy, it's fun, you know, <laughs> kind of situation, but I liked it, you know? <laughs> I'm such a candidate, man. I was anyway, such a freaking candidate because I just like that kind of stuff. It's lame, it's corny, but it's fun. Like yeah, it's onboarding. Onboarding is supposed to be fun and informational. But what I didn't realize is I enjoy those things, but what I enjoy more is getting the work done. That's what I enjoy more. Like if you really want me to have fun, I have to feel like I finished my work. Otherwise I feel like I feel unaccomplished. You see? All right. So now let's talk about the specialist collection. Okay. So what we just got through talking about were the collection of specialists. Oh, I have a better way to say it. I appear to be a perfect candidate for the specialist collection, but I'm actually in reality, 
a candidate of the collection of specialists. Specialist collection, these corporations collect people only for who they are with little regard for what they do. He said, it selects employees based solely on what kind of people they are. This is page 36. And I wrote at the bottom of that, how do you make money? And it's a sincere question. How do you make money? If you're only hiring people because of who they are, how, how do you make money? I'm so confused. He says, uh, this is page 37, these corporations find efficiency in the commitment of their workforce. So here's how I interpreted that. Not only commitment to the company itself, but I also interpreted that as if I have to stay three hours later because I lost three hours earlier in the day behind some nonsense, I'll do it because I'm committed to the organization. So that's one way to interpret that uh, sentence. These corporations find efficiency in the commitment of their workforce. So in other words, whatever it takes to get the job done, we'll do it. But whatever it takes translates into 70 and 80 hour weeks and you're not a doctor. Okay, so then he goes on to say, this is on page 41, beware of specialist collections. It says specialist collections are dangerous. So this would basically be your cult, are dangerous because people who find value in who they are at work are shortchanging themselves. We are more than what we do. We are who we are. That might be a hard concept for a lot of us to wrap our minds around. What do you mean I am who I am? Well, I am a nurse. I am a doctor. I am a pilot. I am a firefighter. I am a whatever. That's what I am. I am a mother. I am a father. I'm a sister, friend. That's what do you mean who I am? And the fact that we find that question difficult to answer is perfect proof that we are totally lost and we have completely, completely lost ourselves in all of these identities and all of these different roles, but especially in work where the first thing you answer is your job description and not like who you are as a person. Like, would any of us really even know how to start answering that question without incorporating our job description? So he poses a very good question on page 41. He says, Okay, actually, I'm going to just read this. It says, the value of who we are is not found in what we do. It's found in who we are, who we are within our family and who we are within our community. Specialist collection employees have been given the message. You are valuable to this company because of who you are. That's why we hired you. I don't deny that that gives the new employee a warm, wonderful feeling, but does that mean that if the person is fired for whatever reason, the converse is true? In a firing situation, is the employee told, you are of no value to this company because of who you are? And what a profound question that is. So when we wrap our entire selves into our jobs and into our companies, if something ever happens to that job, what does that do to you, the person, your self-esteem, your sense of self-worth? I say this all the time, but you were not born an employee. You were born a person, like you were born a human being. You weren't born an employee. So now that you are one, you know what I mean? Like, where do you go? Why do you suddenly disappear because you are now part of this particular organization? And again, so many of us were brought up like this, that it's hard for us to think otherwise. We don't even know what freedom is. We don't even know what it is. Most of us interpret freedom as the moment when we can finally not have to work anymore and just enjoy the fruits of our labor. But that puts you at what, age 65, 70, 75? Wow. So that's end of life close to pretty much, that you finally get to start enjoying it. We don't even know what freedom is. We don't even know what it, what it looks like, feels like, tastes like, smells like. So on page 42, he starts to talk about the psychological contract in corporate cults. And I thought this was really deep. I feel like any student, college student or otherwise, who's getting ready to enter into the workforce needs to read this book if they want to come out relatively unscathed. They might luck up and end up in a company that doesn't do this, but a lot of them will end up in companies like this. So 
I want to make sure I'm just hoping it falls into the right hands and they read it. They probably won't get it though, to be honest with you. Like if I had read a book like this, when it first came out, I would have had no idea what he was really talking about. Like I would have understood it, but not really. Cause I would have been like, Oh, well, no one's going to do that. No one's going to fall for that. Just young and unaware. I would have been like, well, I'm not going to join a cult. So yeah, but that's the whole point. The cult doesn't look like a cult, honey. Remember it's supposed to be fun. <laughs> so you'll want to come back. All right. So on page 42, he starts talking about the psychological contract. And he says, all employees are aware of the legal contract that binds them to their corporation. But another agreement called the psychological contract mentally and emotionally binds employees to the corporation. And then he says, the psychological contract is based on a feeling of equity. It starts out looking very much like the legal contract in which the person states, what contributions he or she will make to the corporation and what inducements are to be received from the corporation in return. So in other words, hey, here's my skill set. Here's what I'd like to charge for that, your salary. Corporation says, hey, that sounds great. We're willing to pay that salary for your skill set. Great. So there's the legal contract. Then he goes on. He says, when inducements in the contract are based on quantitative performance measures, such as widgets made, sales completed, or units repaired, the psychological contract is fine. However, when inducements from the corporation take the form of emotional and affiliation elements, the workplace becomes a corporate cult for the employee. It says emotional and affiliation elements are very difficult to quantify. So this is that famous question. Are you happy? Are you happy? Are you happy here? Are you okay? You know, are you satisfied? All those little things that can't be quantified. I've done many videos in the past about how high performers are going to tank out in narcissistic organizations. And that's mainly because they can't hit your performance. They can't touch it. They can't touch your performance. That would be easy. It would be great if you actually had something in your performance that they could latch onto. But generally they can't. They can't touch your performance because you are a high performer. That's the whole point of being a high performer. So when nothing is left to latch on there, then they go for the psychological. And that's when they start to get into these silly little psychological contracts. So then emotional and affiliation elements are very difficult to quantify. How many widgets made, sales completed, or units repaired earns the perpetuation of an employee's membership in the family. It's unlimited. The employee could labor unceasingly and still not produce enough outcome to earn membership. That's because family membership can't be earned. It's a gift we're given. We are born. Most people would perform great acts of sacrifice for their family and they should. They should not do the same for the corporation because the corporation is not a family. It cannot offer the kinds of long-term sustained emotional and affiliational rewards the family can. So I think what that first paragraph was trying to say was that no matter what you do, you're in your family. And I'm aware that a lot of families aren't necessarily healthy, but that's not necessarily the point that we're making. The point we're making is no matter what, let's assume you have a healthy family or healthy enough. No matter what, through thick and thin, that is your family. Generally, no matter what you do, unless it's really heinous, you know, your family is there for you. They love you. They support you. They'll help you. They'll shelter you, feed you, clothe you, love you. They're there for you. If you have children, they show up to the hospital. They babysit. You know what I mean? They do holidays with you. That's your family. Assuming a healthy, stable enough family. Whereas the corporation, your membership in the family is highly dependent on your output. So when he says the corporation is not a family, it cannot offer the kinds of long-term sustained emotional and affiliational rewards the family can. So let's look at it in another way. If the family behaved like the corporation, when little Johnny accidentally hits his baseball through the neighbor's window, little Johnny gets kicked out of the family. When little Susie snaps at mom because she's 16 and attitudinal, you know what I mean? 
little Susie will get a lecturing. She might get a punishment, get her phone taken away, you know, whatever. But little Susie is still in the family. Do you understand? Like there's very little a family member can do to actually gain themselves total eviction from the family. And trust me, especially on this channel, I know that some family members could get evicted, need to be evicted. We're talking about in general, we're assuming health and stability. Your company is not that and could never be that. Okay. And again, some people are super lucky and do have that tight bond with their company. But again, it's really not supposed to be that way. Like some of you might have coworkers who like, if you got a flat tire in the middle of the night and you called that coworker, they would come running to help you. I mean, that's beautiful. I think that's brilliant. You know, that's great. I think that's awesome. But the truth of the matter is <laughs> you're supposed to have a friend outside of work, outside of anything associated with your job. You're supposed to have a friend you can call who can come help you or a member of your family that could come scoop you up. You know, and if you live in a different city from your family, so be it. The hope would be that your life is not so consumed by work that you no longer have those external circles. That's the point. The point is most of us have lost touch completely with those external circles. We don't have them anymore. Our friends change with every job change. So every time you change a job, you're, you have a new set of friends. And that should be a clear sign to you that these workplaces are not your family. You might have one tag along friend that even though you don't work at the company anymore, y'all are still great friends. You're real friends. You see each other, you hang out, you talk, you support each other. You got each other's back. Great. When that happens, brilliant, beautiful. But in general, these companies, the people in them are not your family because if you ever left a job before, how many of you have had the experience of never ever seeing or hearing from those people again? You never see them or hear, hear from them again. And you were so close. Remember? Remember all those team building activities? Remember? Remember all the lunch breaks? Remember? Remember all the happy hours? Remember? Remember all the showers, baby showers, wedding showers? Remember? Do you remember all that? You remember all the birthday cake that came through the door? Do you remember all the offsites, all that stuff? And then if you ever leave, you never see or hear from these people again. That's why you can't invest your all. You can't because you're really only doing it for the moment. Whereas you are always, you as a person and an individual are always, your company is for the moment, unless it's your company, of course. Okay, so I thought that this was important. Page 43. He says, when the psychological contract gets out of balance, the employee can do one of four things to return it to equilibrium as shown in figure 3.4. He says, the contract must be brought back into balance. Long-term out of balance psychological contracts produce the kind of extreme outbursts that have become known as going postal. Long-term out of balance psychological contracts produce the kind of extreme outbursts that have become known as going po postal. So now to just kind of segue into narcissism really quick. So isn't that one of the hallmark features of narcissism, that deep imbalance, that deep lack of reciprocation? So you, if you've ever snapped on a narcissist before or clicked out on a narcissist before, know that that came from somewhere. It came from that long-term out of balance psychological contract. It's been out of balance too long. The human mind, I feel, has a natural instinct for balance, very natural instinct. It knows when something is out of balance. So it has to get it back. And he's saying here that when people snap and go postal, it's because it's it's been out of balance for so long, this, this psychological contract. So I thought that was interesting. This is page 44. It says, when the employee admits that the organization's needs are more important than his own needs, the employee is well along the road to cultedness. So that was kind of... Um, he was kind of going into detail up above that about how people make excuses for like the situations like, well, yeah, I haven't had a raise in five years, but you know, they're going through difficult times. And in other words, 
they're putting the organization ahead of their own needs. And some of you might just feel like it feels it feels strange to you because this is not what we were taught. We were taught to put our organization ahead of our own needs. But if you really think about it, that's kind of a military mindset. And a lot of what we do today was born out of military mindsets and a very specific time frame. And we just never shook it off. We never shook it off. So it's like when you're in an infantry or a unit and you're out there on the battlefield, it's very important to put the goals of the unit ahead of your own personal goals because you doing that might get everybody killed. So it's important to move and think and act as a unit in that circumstance. But in cubicles, in a corporate office, we're not on the battlefield. We're not. It doesn't require that level. So all this energy that's put into controlling people could be put into products, could be put into innovation, could be put into progress, but instead it's devoted to the psychological warfare that makes no sense and profits nobody. Then he talks about, he says, okay, he said the fourth way um, to solve the psychological contract imbalance is to end the contract by leaving the corporate cult. He said, this is very difficult for culted employees to do because basically even in, even visualizing leaving disempowers them, but it empowers the unculted employee. <laughs> so you, you know you're in a corporate cult. If the thought of quitting, even if they deserve it, the thought of quitting devastates your very soul. Even if they deserve it, even if they've mistreated you, your coworkers, they haven't been fair with you. The thought of quitting devastates your very soul. You know you're not part of a corporate cult if the thought of quitting fills you with great joy. If the thought of quitting you visualize multiple times over and over and over again in your head. If you have a quit letter drafted up in Microsoft Word and saved on your computer, ready to fire off, all you have to do is change the date you are not a culted employee. If visualizing walk out, walking out of the door on the last day of your determination just makes you beam from ear to ear, you're not culted. So the point he's trying to make is that for employees that are deeply inculcated, even thinking about leaving destroys them. Isn't that something? I think that's fascinating. I can tell you now, when I've thought about leaving companies, oh man, like, oh, it's like a daytime meditation slash visualization. And it's, it's wonderful. Like it makes me so happy. <laughs> that future state makes me so happy. I never even considered that there were people out there who visualizing quitting their job destroys their, their very internal soul. They can't handle it. That's how deep in they are because their job is who they are. And he says that he reiterates that page 45, they have given up their individual identities and taken on the identity of the organization. Okay, so fast forward a little bit. So now we're on page 50. So I think this is great advice that companies hiring managers should really consider taking to heart. He's basically saying organizations should simply decide whether the business is task or people oriented because you'll, you'll solve a lot of problems that way you know, and don't shame one or the other, you know, but make it very clear. We're a very people oriented organization. A couple of months ago on the community tab, I made a post. It was a screenshot of a job posting. And it basically said the requirements are you have to have fun. Uh, we do weekly. I think it said like weekly happy hours. You know, it basically listed out all the things that they do that you would be expected to do. And I can't tell you how thankful I was for that type of listing because I know I'm not that person. <laughs> so thank you for helping me make that decision up front so we don't go through this long process and end up not liking each other when really it has nothing to do with skill and everything to do with who we are. I would belong to a collection of specialists, but you guys are a specialist collection. So I think where companies can take some more ownership is in identifying who they are. We're very people oriented. We're more concerned about you as a person than the work that you do. You know, we can we can fix the work, but we have to make sure that we as people work first. That kind of that whole type of situation 
state that on the front end so people know. Okay, so this is page 56. And then I wrote up under this sentence, ouch. It says, those with higher intellects that produce higher rewards will self-select to the collection of specialists, while those with intellects that produce lower economic rewards will self-select to the special specialist collection. And up under that, I wrote, ouch, ouch. That was a very, very friendly way of saying that. And this is his words, not mine. It's, it appears that he's saying higher intellects will naturally go to collection of specialists while lower intellects will naturally go to specialist collections. So I wrote out, you know, because it's like, dang, you know, in the past, I've always hopped on board with the specialist collection, but it doesn't take me long to realize that I'm in the wrong place. And I always thought it was me and it is me. It is me because I, I don't belong to specialist collections. I belong to collections of specialists, very task driven, task oriented people. We can party when the work is done, but until then, like we don't, we're not interested <laughs> in anything else because we have so much to do. Just very work driven people. But my personality naturally places me in the specialist collection and that's kind of problematic. So I have to figure out how to fix that because sometimes it's, it's not, it's not, it's never intentional. I just think, okay, well, I had a strong resume and a good interview and they liked me and I got the job. That's just how it goes. But what I'm realizing now is they really liked me. It had nothing to do with the resume. They liked me. And that sounds great, right? Yeah. Until you realize that you're the type of person who wants to be liked for the work that they do, not for who they are. And that's kind of deep. I think that's kind of profound. Like, yeah, it's, it's wonderful to be chosen for who they perceive you to be and who they believe that you are and who you probably are. You know what I mean? But some of us prefer to be respected for the work that we do, not who we are as people. Like if we're in the background and you never see us, that's perfectly fine because it's the work that we want respect for, not the actual personality. Okay. Okay. So he makes a future prediction. He said, he said, uh, thus we can expect service industries to contain many more specialist collections that become corporate cults. Conversely, there will be many collection of specialist types in production industries. So that was an aha moment for me. And I wrote under there, I need to go into production. Production of what? I'm not sure. <laughs> you know, production of a product of service production of this permission to exist, you know, should I throw myself into this full time because it has all the elements of a collection of specialists, even though it's just one person right now or just production of something else. But I need to go into producing like something. There's an end product. There's stages to it. We have to get it done. We really don't have time to lollygag and we can celebrate when we've achieved our goal kind of situation. I need to go into production. Whereas other people need to go into service and that's okay. You know what I mean? Some places are supposed to be fun and, and lighthearted. So then <laughs> I'm going to read this. This is on page 57. It says, what, what is an associate? It says, everybody is an associate these days. Walmart got the idea that its employees would be empowered by the new title. And now the bag boy at the grocery store, the paper boy and secretaries are all associates. Is there cultedness in this or is it just empowerment? To be an associate in the traditional sense means that the person has some kind of financial stake in the business, but the spread of the term has changed its meaning. The new crop of associates have a greater identification with the company, but they have not gained any financial rewards to accompany the new title. And here's what I highlighted. The beauty of the deal for the corporation is that it gains more commitment from the employees without giving up anything in return. I want to read that one more time. It says the beauty of the deal for the corporation is that it gains more commitment from the employees without giving up anything in return. Now, if that's not not narcissism 101. I don't know what is. 
How can I extract from them more than I'm actually giving to them? They hire you under one set of circumstances or under one set of pretenses. And by the end of it, you have actually given more than you were compensated for. It's the same concept. And it's also incremental in that way as well. So it, it never really ah, gets thrown at you all at once. It's always kind of little by little more gets added on. Before, and before you know it, your job description looks nothing like what you were actually hired for. And what I learned is that a lot of times that's intentional. A lot of times they mean to hire you for something else, but it might be cheaper to post the role under a different job description. So they hire you under one pretense, but they're getting the type of work that requires a different salary range out of you over time and not having to pay you for it. So it's the exact same thing. It's that, it's that imbalance and that lack of reciprocation. That's what you need to look for. And a good giveaway on any job posting would be, uh, say something like other duties as required. Now it's 2019 and no one's really reasonable anymore. So you could ask about what that means, but you probably won't get the job <laughs> because you asking about what that means is a red flag to them that you're not gonna be very easy to control. So other duties as required should be your red flag that more might get piled onto your plate that you're not being compensated for. So just maybe find a very professional, polite way to ask, oh, could you tell me what some of those duties might be? Or another, way, another thing to say might be, where do you see this role going in one year? Where do you see this role in one year? What, what do you think this role will be doing or accomplishing one year from now? Because what you're trying to get them to tell you is wh what they actually envision for you. And if they don't have a firm vision for you, you might want to look somewhere else. If they don't seem to have a solid plan for you in your role, go somewhere else because that just means that they're going to be making stuff up as they go along. Okay, we're wrapping up chapter three. <laughs> On page 60, he kind of closes out with successful co-optation of the term family is perhaps corporate cult's greatest success. And I couldn't agree more. It has totally become co-opted. And it seems great, man. Like, cause again, like I said in the last live stream, who doesn't want to feel like a family and feel like their coworkers are their friends and their family. And who doesn't want to enjoy work? Everybody wants to enjoy it. But <laughs> when it starts to creep into actually taking over your whole entire life and existence. And when it becomes a situation where you can't be an individual or express yourself or express concerns without fear of removal from the cult, that is not your family. Let's say, let's take the example of a healthy family In a healthy family, people can speak up and not worry that they're going to be disowned from the family. That's a healthy family. Unhealthy families, on the other hand, you already know if you speak up, you're going to get disowned. So that's a great sign and you're not in a healthy place. And a lot of corporations have, you know, they claim to be family, but if they're anything, they've taken on the, on the characteristics of a dysfunctional family. Kitty Cat is active and alert this evening. Hello, Kitty Cat. Say hello to the people. Thank you so much. All right, let's jump right into it, you guys. We are gonna continue on with our review of the book, Corporate Cults. We left off at chapter three. And so now we are going to go ahead and pick up at chapter four and let's go ahead and dive right into it. So we've had some pretty in-depth discussion so far and we're actually gonna continue that trend with this book. First, I wanna do some context setting and disclaimers for anyone who this may be your first time coming to the live stream, your first time hearing about all of this. Basically, we're analyzing this book because we recognize there's a major issue in the working world. We want to fix it so we can make it better, largely because we need money. And that is the very short version of the general disclaimer that I give, because it's not just about bashing the corporation. You all know I believe in industry, I believe in business, and I do believe in capitalism to a degree. Obviously not to the abusive, exploitative degree, but I do believe in capitalism to a, to a degree. So it's not about bashing business, it's about making business better, 
because the reality is everyone is not going to be a business owner. So when I listen to the last live stream I did, um, actually the OK Boomer stream, and I was talking about the different options and pathways that people can take after school. I noticed that I didn't mention becoming an entrepreneur, starting your own business, anything like that. And it wasn't intentional. It just honestly, it slipped my mind. But I think when I was listening back and I realized that it slipped my mind, it slipped my mind because it's not all that realistic. So I try to give realistic solutions. Yes, anyone can start a business. Yes, anyone can become an entrepreneur, but it requires a certain skill set that if you don't have it, you will fail. And I would hate to just tell people, yeah, rush out and do this one thing. It's so easy and it's really not. The truth of the matter is the majority of us will be employees for the duration of our life. My wish for you is that you do develop something on the side that does bring you money and pulls you in like a secondary income, passive income, and that you build that out and that you always have it like in your back pocket. And if you wanna to continue to be an employee with that, so be it. My hope is that you always have a backup plan. But I try to kind of comb through the most common, most realistic scenarios for everyone because I want to set you up for success. I don't want to set you up for failure. But yes, I could see a naysayer being like, oh, well, if you hate it so much, why don't you just start your own business? Because that's not very realistic. And as we discussed in the last live stream, you have to have kind of a launch pad to get that going. So most people coming fresh out of high school aren't gonna have a big enough launch pad to then start their own business unless they've already been exposed to it throughout their youth. So I digress. That's why we're doing this part. This is the context and disclaimer section that I decided to start including because I think it's important. So we are simply trying to make business better. We're trying to bring it up to date and we're trying to infuse humanity back into the working world because the majority of us will be employees. If everybody is a CEO, who's going to work the jobs? Who's going to actually like help run your business if nobody will work for you? Somebody's got to work for you at some point in time to make your business go. So we're trying to set up that exchange in a way that doesn't exploit, degrade, humiliate, and take away the dignity of the employee. That's all. So with that in mind, why don't we go ahead and move in? We're now on chapter four that starts on page 62. And chapter four is called When Work Becomes a Family. So we're doing it a little different this time. This time I pulled the quotes and the page numbers are down there. It's really small, but hopefully you can still see it if you need it. But the page numbers are at the bottom of the page. So I didn't put up every single quote that I highlighted. I just pulled out the ones that I would have spoken about regardless. But there are a few others that I won't display, but I wanted to make sure these got seen. So here's the first quote that I pulled from this book. It's on page 62, chapter four. It says, American corporations have taken over the meaning-making process for individuals that was once supplied by family and community. So the portion of this that I really wanna talk about is that meaning-making portion. I really had to think about this for a long time and it really, it opened my eyes to the fact that this has very much happened to me, um, especially going into the workforce when I was younger. Like I wanted my job to be the meaning in my life. Like I wanted to have that meaning. Like I wanted to want to go to work. And I still do, of course. But what I'm saying is like I had wrapped my identity in the meaning of what I was doing. And, and I drew all of my identity from what I was doing for work or what I would be doing in the future. So even if it was something that wasn't the end, the end goal, in my mind, I'm like, this is perfect because this is going to lead to the next step. And then I'll do that for a little while. And then that'll lead to the next step. And it, it really did. But again, it was another one of those accidental things. It really wasn't on. It was like halfway planned, halfway accidental. At any rate, at every stage in the process, I'm trying to gain meaning from the work itself to the point where as I kind of progress through my career, 
my personal life just completely evaporated because my entire focus was on work and making work happen. So I would choose to do or not do something based on how it would impact work, which a lot of people would say, well, that's the responsible thing to do. But if I'm choosing not to go out on a Friday or Saturday because I need to be home doing laundry, so my laundry will be done for work on Monday, that's where we start to kind of cut in and have a problem. Or I need to stay home and finish my work so I can continue on at work on Monday. Because if I don't do this work at home on Saturday, I'll be behind Monday. And the reason I'm behind is because of all of this corporate cult nonsense that goes on in the workplace. So it, it, that's when it starts to cut. That's why I'm so passionate about not wasting time at work because that's what work time is for. It's there to get the work done. So when Friday or whenever your last day is comes, you can stop. You can actually stop and go home and you don't have to think about it. You don't have to worry about it until the next working day, whatever that working day is for you. So when work starts to creep into your your social life, your, your personal life. One time I was joking, I think with one of my bosses and she was like, I hope you do something fun this weekend. And I was like, what is fun? I was like, fun. I've heard of this thing called fun. I've heard of it before. Fun, F-U-N, right? That's how you spell it, right? Yeah. What is that? What does that look like? Could you describe it to me? Because I have no idea what you're talking about. What is it? Fun. Fun, fun. You know what's fun these days? Getting a nap. Ah, fun, fun. You know what's fun? Getting a day off. Hmm, fun, fun. And I meant it. Like it was a joke, but I was so sincere because literally my mind was almost robotic towards work. Just work, 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 work. Every, every minute of every day, just about was geared towards work to the point of like the timing of like when I wash my hair, like everything was coordinated around work. And again, someone hearing this would say, well, that's the responsible thing to do. You're supposed to plan your life around work. And the whole point of this live stream and the whole point of this book is no, you're not. Your life is still important. It always will be. Your life was important before that job. Your life will be important after that job and your life is important during that job. Your life is still important. But what happens is these corporations have a, have a very funny and very subtle way of taking over like your life's purpose and the whole meaning of your life. And I wanted to say this too, I should have done this in the context and disclaimer section, but there are some companies out there doing amazing things making differences, changing lives, saving lives, building products that really help people and help the world and push us forward as a society. And shout out to those companies. If you love your work, this is not really directed towards you. This, this series would be more so just for your awareness to make sure you don't ever turn your workplace into a cult. So if you love your work and your coworkers sincerely love their work, that's great. That's what we all want. That's the goal. That's actually the goal. But this is also to raise your awareness around still, have you sacrificed too much of yourself for the job, even though you love it kind of situation? Just don't get lost, basically. Remember to be who you are still. So. If you have a great working situation, healthy working situation, we are happy for you and we're trying to get where you are. Goals. Those are our goals. OK, but make sure you're not accidentally creating a cult for someone else. How do you know it's not just you and three other people who love it and everyone else is miserable? You see what I mean? So you want to make sure that you're not fostering this type of environment where you do work and where you love it. All right, let's move on. So here's our next quote from page 62. It says, the notion that organizations can hijack an existential vacuum in their employees' lives and harness it for corporate gain is a false seduction of the employee. So he mentioned a couple chapters back how a lot of people who have voids 
in their life, in their soul, whatever, they have these voids inside of them. These types of organizations can fill them quickly. These are also the same type of people who tend to get involved with narcissists. So that's why this book kind of goes perfectly in line with the channel. Because if we're being honest with ourselves, we do have to ask, how is it we keep getting entangled with these people? And we've explored many different possibilities, realities, whatever. But one of those possibilities is that there's a vacuum, there's a hole, there's a void in your life or in your soul or your spirit. And if it's not filled with something else, an entity like this can come in and fill it for you. And he calls it an existential vacuum, <laughs> meaning, I mean, that's about as high as it gets. So if you're having an existential crisis, if you have an existential vacuum, it's very easy to be taken in by something like this, by something that's bigger than you, seems to have this grand purpose, all these resources. You, people always wonder, how do these people f get involved with cults? How? Like, how do you not see it? How do you not understand that this is a cult? Because something was missing. There was a major hole in their life. I think I mentioned this on the first live stream. Pretty sure it was the first live stream that I did about this. I said, it's not that I don't have holes, is that I don't not need them to be filled by this. <laughs> the fix is not you. The fix is something else. You see what I mean? Now you can fill the financial hole as a company. You can assist with that. And you could do more for me filling that financial hole than you could ever do trying to be my everything. Don't try to be my everything as my employer. Be my employer, fill my financial problem and you'll see like you'll see that you filled something and then maybe that'll make you feel like you've actually done something for me or to me but that's really the only hole that you can fill that in healthcare and other than that you know you can't be my everything because you're not we were never meant to be that important to each other we were never meant to mean that much to each other that's what friends and family and relationships are for outside of work they are supposed to fill those gaps, not your company. And when the company tries, they tend to fail miserably. So that's kind of the point of this particular quote. Okay. All right, let's move on. So this is also on page 62. It says slaying dragons and working with beautiful people are exciting, but employees also want to be home. And this one made me laugh. And it also just had me shaking my head in agreement. Like, yes, yes, yes. Like having someone understand where you're coming from is one of the most amazing feelings in the world. And that's what I get when I read this book. I'm like, yes, I, I mean, you all are wonderful people, but I would like to go home at some point today. Like <laughs> we've been here since 8 a.m. You know, we've had lunch together. We've sat next to each other all day. We breathed in each other's air and each other's essences. You know what I mean? Uh, we, we bumped into each other at the coffee machine. You know, like it's time. Now it's time, okay? It's 5.30 now. Like we're well beyond our shift. It's time. You know, like no one wants to be the first one to get up. You know what I mean? Like, we got to let this go. We got to stop. So if you're a leader or a manager listening to this, make sure that you're not creating the type of environment where people are afraid to go home, even though their day is over, even though their work is done, their day is over. There are no emergencies, but they're afraid to leave because they're afraid they're going to be looked at as a slacker, even though they've been here literally all day. Y'all have got to stop. You got to create healthier environments for your employees. You guys are extremely competitive, right? You want to be number one, right? The only way to be number one is to make sure that your component parts and the things that fuel your organization are healthy and functional and happy. That's the only way. This other alternate way that you guys have been running for decades, it doesn't work. And that is indicative or indicated by the collapse and crumbling of companies that have been around forever. 
like companies that never should have gone out of business have started to fold. And it's because you you can only do so much to people for so long and you wear them out. And then the, the irony of that is <laughs> they wear out their long-term employees and then they rarely bring in and foster the fresh blood so they can wear that out too. Like, I don't understand you narcissists, I don't. Like you're not very strategic because like you're not you're very nice either. But I would think that even though you're not very nice people, you would still be strategic enough to be like, well, we are really wearing out our long-term employees. We might need to bring in a fresh batch, but if we do to them what we did to our long-term employees, they'll leave really fast. So we need to figure out how to treat them in a way that will make them want to stay so at least we can wear them out long-term like we did this crop. They don't even think like that. They think I'm going to do the same thing to the new crop that I did to the old crop. And the new new crop is like, screw you. I can drive Uber for four weeks and find another job. And because of that right there, these long-term companies are crumbling. They are folding because they are determined to run that old program. They are determined to keep doing it the way that they've been doing it, even though it's proven itself not to work. So I just don't get it. But page 62, slaying dragons and working with beautiful people are exciting and they are, but employees also want to be home. They really do want to be home. Let's move on. Page 63, after multiple moves, so he's talking about the employee that moves often for their job. It says, after multiple moves, the corporation becomes the only family that vagabond employees know on a long-term basis. And really think about that, you know, because now personally, I'm I'm quite for moving for a job if your community or city does not have a very good employment market. If you're able to move for a job and it's not going to severely and dramatically affect your life, you know what I mean? Like it's not going to ruin you, basically. And it would put you in a better position, better city, better schools better residents, things like that, I highly encourage it. The catch of that or the twist of that is this quote right here, which is after multiple moves, the corporation becomes the only family the vagabond employees know on a long-term basis. And it makes me think too, when I've worked for some really big corporations and met some people like that, it was always like the first or second thing they told me about themselves, which I mean, if you're meeting a new coworker for the first time, there's really not much else to talk about, but reflecting on it, I think it's very interesting that they'd be like, oh yeah, my name is Tom and you know, this is my third city with fill in the blank. I'm like, wow, you've moved three times. And usually they like kind of look down at the ground and put their hands on their hips, but they're trying to keep that positive attitude. And they're like, yep, yep. Uh, my boys had to find a new soccer team here in town. So we spent the weekend doing that. and. Uh, you know, we're all kind of in a hotel right now, but we're uh, getting ready to close in the house and everything is kind of in shipping and kind of uh, half of my stuff is halfway across the country. The other half is halfway here. So it's been a crazy, uh, crazy week. And I'm like, wow. And you've been here every single day while this is all going on. He's like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yep. I've been here. And, you know, they're saying it all through a smile. And as a younger employee in the company, I remember thinking, wow, they're really moving up, like they're they're doing big things, like the company has moved them three times. After being with the company for a while, what I learned was really happening was, a lot of times the jobs in their particular city would get dissolved. And basically they were told, either you take this job in this new city, or you know, thank you so much for being a valued employee, here's your severance package. So some people, for whatever reason, one reason or another, can't afford to stop working. So they have to uproot their whole entire family and move across the country just to keep their job. So as that all relates to this quote, those same people were usually very tightly knit with uh, other employees in the organization. And it's for this very reason. Like when you keep uprooting someone from, for, from their community, eventually their job becomes their only community. And that's very dangerous because as we were just saying, at any moment they can just decide, hey, we don't actually need you anymore. 
I mean, we kind of do, but you would have to move 600 miles away from here. Are you cool with that? Great. We'll help you with moving. Now I do my hats off to the companies that will actually assist with relocation assistance, but a lot of them will not help. They'll basically say, you have a job waiting on you in this other city, but you have to get yourself there and see you Monday. Or, you know, obviously it wouldn't be that quick of a turnaround, but you know, basically you move yourself here, you uproot yourself, and then we'll see you at work at, you know, the next designated start day, very cold, you know? So do, I do shout out to the companies that assist with moving, but how fair is that to somebody who maybe has already given you 10 years of their life? That's why you can't invest your everything into these companies because they're really not investing their everything into you. It's like it's like they have one foot out the door, but you have both of your feet in the door. Why would you ever do that? Like you should always have one foot out the door as well. We, we both are just standing here with one foot in, one foot out. But they want you to put both feet in while they leave one foot out. And there is your imbalance. I would almost go on record as saying almost that if a corporation really puts both feet in regarding you, you should put both feet in regarding them. Now that doesn't mean sell your soul, sacrifice your life. None of that, none of that. But that means that these people are showing you that they are committed, that they really mean it. They're, they're devoted. Like they don't engage in petty games, petty drama, they make intelligent decisions. They hire intelligent leaders if they even need them. They've examined their positions and said, hey, these roles right here don't even need bosses. You know, so why hire people to be over them? For what reason? They don't need bosses. So they've really taken the time to strategize their company, their product, service, and their workforce. Just little things like that that add up to a really high quality company that is fully committed to you. You get your proper raises when they're due. You get bonuses if bonuses are available. They're not trying to drain every drop of blood out of you and then give you the little bit that's left to survive on. They're not trying to do that. But all too often, that is not the case. If you find a situation like that, commit and be very, very good to them if they're very, very good to you. But there always exists that possibility, always, that they could pull the plug on the whole thing. And that's why you give 99% maybe, but not 100, because at any moment they could just change their mind and do things different and it's no longer like that. And that's how it's kind of different from healthy families where nothing can break a healthy family. Nothing can tear apart a healthy family, nothing. You know what I mean? So they, they try to pretend like they're this healthy family, but they're actually a severely dysfunctional one. And we'll get into all that. It says employees who are frustrated over not having a life outside work aren't very effective. So this is page 63. And actually, I'd like to read this whole paragraph to make it make sense. It says research seems to suggest that the extreme commitment level of corporate cult employees is not always best for the corporation. In one study, workers who spent less time at the office because they took advantage of family-friendly policies like maternity and paternity leave and job sharing were among the best performers and the least likely to have disciplinary problems. Employees who are frustrated over not having a life outside work aren't very effective. So in other words, all this commitment and loyalty and dedication tends to result in lower performance because at some point, even the most like drunk corporate cult member, and I mean drunk on Kool-Aid corporate cult member, starts to feel that like, God, I don't have a life at all. This is all that I do. You know, I'm always here. Let's move on. So this is page 63. Corporate cults are like dysfunctional families in which there are no boundaries between the individual member and the family. And we just got through having a very deep discussion about family boundaries like a live stream or two ago. I think it's the last one I did. But yeah, the cults are going to be like your dysfunctional family. So the way that I used to describe it to people, I used to say it's like living in a giant house with no walls. The only walls are on the bathroom 
not even the bathroom. The only walls are on the toilets. The only walls are on the toilets and that's it really. But there's no walls in the kitchen. There's no walls in the living room. There's no walls in the dining room. There's certainly no walls for your bedroom. Uh, there's no walls anywhere in this giant house full of, of people. So, you know, I think the beginning of this, if we were going to kind of trace back, like how did it start to get so bad in, in corporations is when they started to eliminate offices and come out with this open floor plan situation. And really, honestly, people never really had offices other than managers and leaders and like supervisors and stuff. And some of them still do. But then, you know, they went into cube land, cubicle, cubicle city. <laughs> And now I can honestly say it is better to have a cubicle than no cubicle. It's better to have some type of cubby hole than no cubby hole. I'll tell you that much because at least you still have your space. Like there is still some space carved out for you. But a lot of offices have taken on the format of like just long desks with dividers. And then some offices have no dividers at all, at all. So literally you're just sitting facing your coworker every day. So picture like a, maybe a four foot long by two feet wide table where your computer is on it, your monitor is on it, your keyboard, your mouse. And then right next to you is the exact same thing. And then right across from you is the exact same thing. So do you remember when you were in school and they used to say, okay, everybody turn your desks towards each other in groups of four and you're going to work on this project together. Yeah. That has now carried over into corporate America and they love it and they think it's cute and it's very photographable and it's very Instagrammable and it's super modern and very millennial. So this will all be part of my millennial discussion whenever I do that, you know, but it's highly, highly, highly ineffective. It's ineffective and it's invasive for many reasons. And I'm not going to list out all the different reasons why, but you know, the tearing down of walls within the organization, which they love, it's very corporate speak. You know, there's no walls between us. There's no walls to stop collaboration. There's no walls to stop the creative flow of ideas. But then you also have like a messaging messaging system, instant messenger. So that's kind of like the electronic version of no walls. So anyway, the problem with these open environments, for those of you who've never worked in one or who work in a different type of job that doesn't require you to be in an office all day, the issue is you don't get to decide what your brain is doing at any given moment. So if your coworker comes in and they want to be funny and ironic out loud to everybody all at once, guess what? Your brain is doing that now. Your brain is now attending to that for however long it lasts. And then you get to go back to work. Or if somebody decides that they want to speak to you in this very moment, no matter what you're doing, no matter what you're working on, no matter what deadlines you have coming up, that's what your brain is now doing. Now your brain is talking to this person. When you hadn't planned on that, but now you're having that conversation that's going to last for, how, for however long it lasts. Now you're trying to get back to work. Uh-oh, impromptu meeting. So now an impromptu meeting has been called. Everyone stands up and goes and walks into a corner, which is weird. We might as well just all stand up at our desks. But here we go, off to the corner. So it's just a nonstop flow of activity that never really allows you to get deep into your work. So what a lot of people end up doing is going to like empty conference rooms. Some people will go out to their car. Recently, I heard people will go to their stairwell and do work, which I'm like, oh, I can't believe I never thought of that. That is genius. Just go to your stairwell because nobody likes to take the stairs. Perfect. Oh, and you know what? Someone wanted me to talk about this a couple of live streams ago. I forgot what the name was they were using for them. But they're basically pods and like, so now, now open offices are purchasing, just picture like giant eggs or picture like a giant phone booth looking thing where you can kind of like pull the door shut. 
to have a private conversation. So it's kind of like, what are we doing here, guys? Like, can't you see everyone is struggling to get something that's very essential? We're not asking for, you know, floating desks. We're just asking for the opportunity to get in our mind and, and be human and think and kind of hash things out mentally and go deep into thought regarding this problem or issue or project to the point where people are hiding in stairwells just to get work done. Like, come on guys. Like we've got to know that that's not okay. You know what I mean? Like, why are we so intent on interfering with our employees productivity? Why? Like <laughs> they just need to build like massive peewees playhouses all over the place and just pay people to come to them and just play in this in the playhouse all day. I think that would actually fulfill whatever need it is these people are trying to fulfill by having people come to work and not getting anything done. How much money are you wasting? You've got to be wasting an inordinate amount of money, like a crazy amount of money doing this. Part of the lack and loss of boundaries has a lot to do with the lack of loss of personal and private space. So, and I also kind of interpret that as like no boundaries. So in other words, like no secrets between us. So you tell me everything. So those of you who've had to work these kinds of jobs may know about the infamous one-on-one -on -one presentation or not presentation, one-on-one -on -one meeting. And I can't stand them for a variety of reasons. I could do a whole video on them, but I would say this about them. I feel like this is part of what they're trying to do. They're trying to make sure there's no boundaries between yourself and the corporation. So a weekly check-in into your mind that truly serves no purpose other than just extracting information about you from you. And I say that because usually work is kept up to date in some other way. Email, uh, Slack, you know, people will just walk up to your desk. So you update them then. So there's no reason to like set aside time to just chat because that's usually what it is. It's just a chat. You know, and over time, you will find yourself getting too comfortable and sharing too much because it's a meeting. It's a 30 minute meeting every week on the dot. And eventually there's nothing else to talk about the project. You know, there's nothing else to talk about in regard to like personal development on the job. So eventually all that becomes left is just like personal private stuff. And if you're not wary and cautious you will become too comfortable and you'll find yourself being too honest. And that's where you rope and where you hang yourself. I wish at least in the jobs that I had had, I had had the option to opt out of the one-on-one. -on -one. Like, Hey, do you need to meet this week? No. Okay, great. I'll check in with you next week. Awesome. Thank you. All right. So now we are on page 63 and 64. So this uh, quote carries over between the two pages and it says, the dynamics of those relationships lack the natural barriers that people need in order to protect themselves. So then what I wrote in my book was, please don't protect yourself from me. And that's the overall vibe that I've gotten. Anytime I've tried to kind of like say, okay, that's too far for me. Like right there is going to be like my limit. That's my line right there. And this is where I start protecting myself. It's like anytime I've taken measures to protect myself, it's been met with such hostility. I can't even describe it to you. It's like, how dare you protect yourself from me? Please don't protect yourself from me. Even though I'm dangerous, please don't protect yourself from me. So I love the way this quote summarized it. The dynamics of those relationships lack the natural barriers that people need in order to protect themselves. Okay. One, one way I think of this also is when you're in these types of environments, there's a constant analysis going on about you constantly. They're analyzing your hair, your face, your outfit, your mood, your walk, your, your purse. Oh, that's a different purse from yesterday. Like you're under constant scrutiny 24 seven. It's very, it's very invasive. And I don't know if that's just my inner introvert, you know, extroverts may love that, but it's, you're constantly being analyzed every day by people who really don't actually care about you truly, like how your healthy family does. I have to make that distinction because everyone doesn't come from a healthy family. So it's hard for me to just say family because family means a lot of different things to people. So I'll say healthy family. 
when you're looking after a child or anyone really, but I say child or elderly person because they're kind of, they're not quite as able to help themselves often as people who are in the middle of their lives, but you're kind of scrutinizing them constantly, not, not to be mean, you're scrutin scrutinizing them for everything. Are they healthy? Is anything wrong? Do they need anything? Like you're constantly watching them, especially when like they're little, little babies. You don't want them to hurt themselves. Are they hungry? You know, what do they need right now? You know, so you're, you're constantly watching them is my point. Same with the very, very elderly. You don't want them to, you know, get some sudden gust of motivation and go try to do something they're not supposed to because they, they're not able. So you're under that that watchful eye in, in the workplace, in the office. Like the example I gave a couple of live streams ago about being gone from your desk for, for like longer than like 30 seconds and it like triggers warning bells for them. Why? We're adults. We're adults, we're salaried. Hourly makes sense to me to some degree, to some degree, but hourly makes sense because you're paying that person by the hour. So you kind of want to make sure that your money's not being wasted but at the same time, if they're producing results on time, either you don't need them for as long as you think you do, or maybe they need to go home early, or maybe you need to kind of look at the scope and parameters of your project and see, okay, this person has gone for their desk for, for an hour and a half, but somehow they're getting the work done. So maybe I don't need to hold them here for eight hours. Maybe I only need them for four hours out of the day. It's like there's this giant fear to restructure life and restructure work. Let's move on. So this is gonna be on page 64. It says the word dysfunctional describes a situation in which less powerful members of a family or other group suffer invisible emotional damage at the hands of more powerful members. So I thought this was a good quote to bring out because it's a reminder of the power dynamics that are at play in corporations. People will say things like, oh, well, you don't have to work there. And of course, these are, you're going to be your narcissist. These are going to be your problem people, the people who are causing the problem, the people we're talking about. But often people have retorts that are so simple and they're very poorly thought out. So I like to try to address them because I know they're coming. Oh, well, you could just go get a different job where they don't do that. Well, the problem is there's a power imbalance. So it's, and that's kind of why I put so much responsibility on the corporation because there is a deep power imbalance. This employee is nothing against the corporation, their funds and funding, their lawyers, attorneys, spin doctors. You are nothing against something that big. So you're already so much larger than me. Why do you feel the need to, to flex your power down to the smallest possible detail? you already won. Like you're, you've already won. So like, anyway, the point of this quote is to just pull out the fact that what makes it so dysfunctional is that power imbalance. The employee is pretty helpless to tell you no for the most part. And when they do tell you no, or when they do push back, you being the loving family member that you are, you threaten their very livelihood and lives when they have the, the nerve to talk back to you. So let's talk about this really quick. This quote is on page 64 and it says, in functional families, members are valued for being themselves, not for following the rules. I thought that was pretty, pretty profound. Think about it like this. If this is kind of hard to understand, for those of you who have pets, part of the reason you love your pets so much is because they are themselves pretty much no matter what. Yes, we can train our pets, especially dogs can be trained. Cats can be trained also. They're just a little bit more difficult to train, but they can be trained. But by and large, we love them because they are 100% themselves, no matter what is happening. And we love them for that. We wouldn't ever want that to change. Whenever we see our pets not being themselves, we get worried. We get concerned, like, what's wrong with you? Are you okay? Do we need to go to the vet? Like, what's up? We, we get deeply concerned when our pets are not behaving like themselves because we love them for who they are. Every inch, all the weirdness, all the quirkiness, all of it. 
everything. They make us laugh. They make us cry. Everything. We love them for every piece of it. We wouldn't want to change one inch of it. But somehow when it comes to human beings, we don't afford human beings that exact same thing. We don't. When it comes to humans, we demand humans pretty much strip themselves of the very same thing we love our pets for and fall in line to what we believe they should be. And this especially happens in the corporate arena. You are not loved for that quirkiness that makes you you. That quirkiness will get you marched out of the door. You are not loved for having a different mind. That different mind will get you marched out of the door. You're not loved for having a different opinion. That different opinion will get you marched out of the door. So they like to sell themselves as we are a family. We are a family, but functional families, healthy families actually value their family members for being themselves. So it's something to think about. All right, let's move on. So this is going to be also on page 64. So I thought this was interesting because this kind of talks again, once again, about how people end up in these situations. How do people end up joining cults and what have you? This is how. So it says in dysfunctionally controlled family, members feel that their privacy and independence are violated. Those family traits take away the person from a child and cause her or him to be more vulnerable to the same techniques in a corporate cult as an adult. And I inserted in there permission to exist. When you take away the person, you're taking away their permission to exist. So those family traits take away the person from a child, take away, let me read it different. Those family traits take away the permission to exist from a child and cause her or him to be more vulnerable to the same techniques in a corporate cult as an adult. So this is the danger. So when we treat children like they're not whole people, totally individual and separate from you, and you teach them that who they are as a person and everything that makes them them is not acceptable and they need to be your way, you're opening them up and setting them up for abusive relationships in the future is what you're doing. Let's move on. Now we're on page 65. He was talking about how, how work fulfills like emotional needs. So he said, let's assume that this average person who needs 10 hugs a day exists. If they get 10 at work, how many do they need at home? But it made me really think about like all the different families that have fallen apart because one spouse or the other worked too much. And it's almost like, you know, outside looking in. And if you hadn't read something like this or heard something like this before, you would say, how could a person let such a beautiful family like that fall apart? He had such a loving wife. She had such a loving husband. How could he or she allow uh, their family to fall apart? They had such beautiful children, such a beautiful home. They had it all. How could they let this happen? Well, if they're the average person and the average person needs 10 hugs a day and they get all 10 hugs at work, they don't need any more from home, like they're good. So like by the time they get home, they feel satisfied as a person. They feel whole and complete by the time that they get home. So there's no need to rush home when you feel full. There's no need to rush home if you've already had dinner at work. And I mean that literally and figuratively. And what happens is that compounds over time, that stacks up over time. And eventually home has been completely deprived of your presence, but work is thriving. Work is great. This is why a lot of spouse, uh, a lot of couples will divorce and one spouse or the other ends up marrying someone from their job. It's not so much that that person was better. It's just that that's where they were. If that other spouse ever went to stay home with the kids, male or female, went to stay home with the children, the same thing would happen again if the working spouse was the center of the issue. It'll happen again, like it'll repeat itself. The only way it won't repeat itself is if the new spouse continues to work with the ex spouse. They have to keep working together because as soon as one falls away from that equation, 
work is still number one. Do you understand? So work will always be first. So even the new spouse will find themselves as spouse number two when they decide to stay home with the kids and their family falls apart because work was always the one. But he starts to talk about love versus devotion. So he says the person loved their family, but they were devoted to work. And then my head went, they loved their family, but they were devoted to work. So that's what spouse number one discovered, that husband or wife is totally devoted to work. They're not devoted to this family. So then they divorce, uh, the spouse marries someone from work, then the spouse uh, number two stays home and they end up getting divorced because what soon is discovered is that the devotion was to work. The love was for family, the devotion was to work. And what you devote yourself to is what will live. You can love something all day, but if you don't devote yourself to it, it will not grow. And that's what ends up happening um, when people end up in these corporate cults. All right, let's move on. So this is also page 65. He says, we should have the greatest number of distant relationships at work. And hearing that off the top of your head, you would be like, God, that sounds kind of awful. But if you think about it, these people are fleeting for the most part. Some of you will end up in jobs where you're there 10, 15, 20 years. Good for you. That's great job stability. But where were those people before those 20 years? Where will those people be after those 20 years? So truly, they are fleeting relationships. It shouldn't be as personal as it is. It shouldn't be as close as it is. I saw a comment on a previous live stream that said, funny how they want us to spend all this time at work. Then you get in trouble when you start fraternizing with each other, like, you know, dating and all that. And it's a, it's a true point. Like it's a, it's a, it's a sincere comment. Like, how can you tell people not to date each other when they're here with each other more than they are with their family? Like we're humans, like humans eventually kind of start checking each other out. And like they kind of start liking each other and taking to each other and developing crushes on each other. It happens. And then you would say, well, it's supposed to be a place of work. It's supposed to be professional. And I would say, exactly. Exactly. It's supposed to be a place of work and it's supposed to be professional, meaning there's supposed to be a certain coldness to work. And I don't mean cold, like callous and uncaring. I mean, cold, like, yeah, that's Bill from accounting. And that's pretty much all you know. And that's pretty much it. Like you shouldn't know Bill's favorite color. Why would you know that? And again, it seems and sounds cold. You all can correct me, um, my other generations that came before me, but I feel like this is what work used to be. I feel like it used to be this way. Like it used to be people got up, they went to work. Yeah, they knew their coworkers names. They might know like if their coworker had kids, like, oh yeah, she's got a son and daughter, but that they didn't know their son or daughter's GPA. And I could be wrong. I don't know, I wasn't there. But in my mind, that's what it used to be. Like there was a certain separation. That separation no longer exists between peers and coworkers. And that's probably why it's always so messy and people are always getting themselves into trouble. So I thought this was a cute little quote, page 66. It says, ants live to work and work to live. People do too when work becomes family in a corporate cult. So again, just like I was describing like what had happened to me in the past, it was just like one thing was fueling the other. My life was just fueling work that was fueling my life that was fueling work. When really it should be work is fueling work and life, my life is kind of fueling my life. They shouldn't be blended, in other words. All right. This is also on page 66. Now, I thought this was very important. Very, very important. It says, families are lifespan groups, meaning that they are maintained throughout the life of the individual. So this kind of goes with exactly what we were talking about earlier. Your healthy family is supposed to be there for you for life and vice versa. You can't break it. Like there's nothing anyone could say or do to break up this family unit. Like we are, we are a united front and I love you 
from now until forever. And there's nothing that you could do to change the love that I have for you. And so when a corporate is calling, when a corporation is calling themselves a family, they're essentially saying they are all of those things to you. I'm devoted to you for life. I will never leave your side. I will never abandon you. I'm there for you. I'll support you during your good times and I'll support your, you during your bad times. If you need a helping hand, I'll lend it to you. I love you. I'm committed to you. This is it for me. Like I'm committed to you for life. And that is my word. Can you imagine if a corporate said that to you? Like, be serious. Like, you know full well that that's not what it is. It's like, I am committed to you for as long as I feel like being committed to you. I'm not going to be with you for life. As a matter of fact, let's draw up some terms and conditions to outline our relationship to make sure that we know who's who and what's what and the extent of my involvement in your life and vice versa. You know, if you ever leave me, I'm cutting you off forever. And if someone else calls me asking me about you, I'm going to badmouth you to make sure that you don't end up with them because that's the least I could do. If you don't want me, I'll make sure you don't have anyone else either. I could go on and on. You cannot hold yourself out to be family and then behave like the enemy. So it makes people very uncomfortable not knowing which one you really are. Are you my friend or are you my foe? But this is important to remember. Families are lifespan groups. That's a lifetime thing for those healthy families. That's lifetime. Your corporation can't promise you lifetime. And actually, is it on this page? It might be coming up, but he basically says on one of the pages coming up, that one of the reasons, even if they're good people, is that they can't guarantee you employment. And they can't. So you can't promise me a lifetime because you don't even know if you'll be in business for a lifetime. You don't. You don't know if the market will change. Suppliers will change. You don't know what will happen. So you can't promise me family because you can't promise me lifetime. Period. Until you can promise me lifetime, you can't promise me family. So don't call you yourself my family. Maybe call yourself my friend. That might, that might be a little bit more correct than referring to yourself as my corporate family. You're my corporate friends. Friendships come and go all the time. Page 67. <laughs> it says corporate cults are dangerous because employees are given the false assurance by their corporation that they will always be taken care of. So again, let's use the NFL as a perfect example. So let's just suspend everything that's going on with them drama wise, right? We, let's just look at the, let's just put that to the side. Let's just look at the setup of it, right? You know, I know they hold themselves out as a family, the NFL family, all that, right? But if a player gets hurt, I mean, that's pretty much it. Like, it's kind of like, oh, thanks for joining the family, but ooh, that looks like it really hurt, bud. You think you're going to be able to play next year? No? Ever again? No? Mm. Well, ah, good luck attending to that long-term injury. And from what I understand, and any sports fans in the room, please correct me, but from what I understand, once they no longer play for a team, like they don't have health insurance through them anymore, please correct me if I'm wrong on that. And obviously, well, correct me on this too, but they no longer get paid, right? Like they don't get paid after. Like once your contract ends or you get hurt, I know that they'll pay them through the season or through the contract, but once the contract ends, there's no like stipend after that, right? That It's over, right? So anyway, my point is family doesn't cut you off because you're no longer useful. Family will find a way to work around where you are in life because they love you. Family doesn't cut you off because you're no longer useful. Let's move on. This is going to be, so I jumped forward a few pages. And this is going to go ahead and be on page 73. So he's talking about, I'm actually going to read the first half of this to make this make sense. It says, daycare facilities, laundry, banking, and athletic facilities. When considered alone, these are not bad things. They are all provided with the employee in mind. 
The purpose is to make the employee's life easier. They no longer need to stop by the daycare center, laundry, bank, or athletic club. With the convenience store on the USAA compound, employees don't even have to stop at the grocery store. So he's talking about the insurance company USAA. And then he says, these are all good things for the employee, but they are also good for the corporate cult because they effectively separate the employee from the community. When the employee's work becomes their community, they can't leave the organization because they would lose their community. This was another deprogramming moment for me because I don't have children, but let's just pretend that I did. If you told me there was a daycare facility, a laundromat, a bank, a little gym, a little, con it's really the convenience store that would get a girl like me. If you want to get a girl like me, put like a little convenience store or like a little, one of the like nicer gas stations, one of the more upscale ones, throw one of those on, on site and I'll never leave ever because I could just go get lost in there but you give a girl like me that kind of stuff, I'm never gonna leave your compound. And that's why I'm like, and that's why you get sucked into cults, girl, you see? You see how it happens? And to me, before prior to reading this book and really giving it some deep thought, my thought would be, God, that sounds amazing. Because typically during the day, I'm running so many different errands, like on my lunch break, I can make a lot happen in one hour. So I'm always running errands. So if I can knock out more than half of my errands right there on the compound, well, that sounds perfect to me. That sounds really ideal. What, what I didn't realize and what other people don't realize about that is that means you're never leaving the compound. You're not venturing out into greater society. You're not going to your local gas station, going to your local, I mean, you might have a laundry at home, washer dryer, but you get what I mean. You're not going to your local laundromat, your local daycare. You're not fanning out and spreading out into the community anymore. You are completely insulated by your job. They're your work, your food, your errands, your banking, your laundry, your daycare, your gym. They're literally every part of your life. So how could you have a life outside of that? when your whole life, community, friends, and family are bundled and wrapped up into one organization. So then here's the question, what happens if you ever lose that job? Then what happens to you? Who do you become then? Sure, you'll go find another bank and daycare and gym. You'll go find those things. But what I'm saying is all at once, you would lose it all at once versus maybe Eh, I've been going to that daycare for about a year. I don't like it. I'm going to switch daycares. You just lose everything all at once and everyone connected to it all at once. Do you see what I mean? So that is the danger in becoming too enmeshed with the corporations. And I'm sure they think they're doing a good thing. And to be honest, they are. Like my favorite job had a massive cafeteria and oh, my, there are days I'm like, how can I sneak back in there and get into that cafeteria? They would just throw on like a disguise of some sort and, you know, maybe they won't recognize me, probably end up in jail, but, oh, the cafeteria was amazing. So it's like, it's not that they're doing a bad thing. It's, it's weird. But like I said, on, on one of the other live streams, cults are supposed to be fun. <laughs> if they weren't fun, you wouldn't go. So it's kind of a catch 22 because it's like, if they didn't offer anything, people might be like, God, my company kind of sucks. Unless, of course, they took that same money and just rolled it into a paycheck. And I'm sure nobody would care. But then they do offer those things. And it's like, wow, this is really awesome. My whole entire life is here now. So it's kind of like, what is the balance? So that's something that I don't really have a good answer to yet. What is the balance for that? How can you be good to your employees and also not accidentally create a corporate cult by mistake, not meaning to? So that's that's a good question that we should just hang out there and just, I guess, work through until we feel like we have a good answer. Or maybe he'll answer it. I haven't finished the book yet, so maybe he answers it later. All right, let's keep going. This is on page 73. And he says that the few cult members who do escape typically must endure many hours of deprogramming to readjust back to society. So if you have ever had the courage to quit 
one of these corporate cults. Or if you were lucky enough to get fired from a corporate cult, you probably had to spend a couple of weeks, if not maybe months, depending on how long you were there, kind of unraveling your mind, basically pulling all the pieces apart, trying to put it back in order, trying to make sense of it all, trying to resolve old issues that may never be resolved because you can't talk to the person who caused them. It's like you have post-traumatic stress disorder, basically. And you're trying to come back to reality and get a new grip on reality because you had lost your grip. You were literally losing it. You were losing your mind. Here's a symptom or a sign that you might be part of a corporate cult and that if you ever quit, you'll have to deprogram. If you have literally worn your friends and family out talking about your job, like if they can't take it anymore, and I don't mean on a narcissistic, dominating the conversation, you know, monologue, one track. That's not what I mean. What I mean is in the course of normal conversation, you get started up and you start venting. And literally every time they talk to you and your job comes up, you start venting about it. And eventually like your friends or whoever family might be like, you just need to quit. You have to quit that job. You have to, like you've literally, you, you stressed them out at this point. You're so stressed that you've stressed your friends and family out and they don't even work there. So that's a good sign that you're going to be a candidate for deprogramming and you should deprogram because if you don't deprogram and you just go into another job, you stand a very high chance of ending up in the exact same situation because you didn't sort out everything that happened to you before and take an inventory of what you did wrong and what you did right and what you can do different next time. Because keep in mind, there's always some responsibility to be shared and there's always some responsibility to go around. So part of the responsibility I take for my previous roles is not knowing that I was a more task driven person versus a people person. I didn't know that. I thought I was a people person because I'm very nice to people. I'm very friendly. I'm very sociable. But what I've learned about myself is I also really don't like play when it comes to work. I don't play like I'm not here to play like I'm here to work and that's it. And that's kind of where the line gets drawn for me. So I take responsibility for accepting roles that were more people oriented roles versus task oriented roles. So going forward in the future where I can make a better choice is by trying to identify and determine if not by the job description alone, the interview should tell me whether or not these people are more interested in me as a person or more interested in my actual performance. And if it's, if it's me as a person, I'm going to have to pass on the job because that's not who I am. So that's what I mean by you have to figure out who you are, so you can make a better selection in the future. Will I make a perfect choice? Who knows? Hopefully, but at least I'll know I didn't make the same choice that I've been making before. So that's why you need that time to analyze it and think it through so you can come to those same types of conclusions, all right? Otherwise, you're just gonna be talking to yourself, maybe for the rest of your life. Let's keep moving on. <laughs> okay, I thought this was interesting. So it says, if you're, this is page 74, if you're purposely napping at work, consider the possibility that you are working too much. So let's talk about this. So they've come out recently with these uh, nap pods that offices can purchase and put in the office. And of course, people definitely um, some opportunities to say, okay, Boomer, as you read like people's comments regarding these nap pods like on LinkedIn and stuff, because typically the comment that would generate that response would be something like, well, no wonder that they're not getting any work done at work. All they want to do is sleep. Okay, Boomer. Um, well, if they're sleeping at work, how will they ever get any work done? Okay, Boomer. Oh, well, your house is for sleeping. You don't, you're not supposed to come to work to sleep. Okay, Boomer, now we're getting somewhere. Now, now we're starting to get into those critical thinking areas. And I'm just messing with the Boomers. I'm just bringing it up. Just calm down, de-ruffle your feathers. I'm just teasing because that comes from young people too. I'm just teasing. But anyway, so these nap pods at work 
are there so people who are sleepy during the day can take a quick nap. Science and studies have shown that people who take a brief nap during the middle of the day are 10 times more productive than people who try to drink an energy drink or people who drink a coffee or something like that to override the exhaustion that hits around 12 or one. Science has proven that if you take a quick nap, the benefits from that actually far outweigh, you know, any caffeine you could ever inject into your veins. So um, in addition to that, there are other cultures in the world that intentionally take naps in the middle of the day. And I believe they're called siestas. I could be wrong. In addition to that, some of the most famous people and the most brilliant people on planet Earth scheduled a nap for themselves every single day. And I can't remember their names off the cuff, but they used to have, I think the quote was like, this person used, I think it was in one of the authors, used to wake up from um, sleep, stay awake till about 12 or one, and then they would have what they called their second sleep for the day. And then after they had risen from their second sleep, then they were good to go. So I bring all that up to say that people sleeping in the middle of the day is not abnormal. It would probably actually be very healthy for us. But that is not the point of this quote or what I was even going to talk about. That was just me being triggered and responding to OK Boomer. But if you're purposely napping at work, consider the possibility that you're working too much. So for the companies that are trying to be forward thinking and innovative and say, hey, if you need to take a nap, we have nap pods. Go upstairs, take a nap. What that's basically saying, whether we realize it or not, is if you're sleepy, sleep here and then come back and go back to work. Not if you're sleepy, go home. Power naps, thank you. Power naps are what they're called. So they're not telling us, hey, if you're tired, get on out of here, go home. That's not what they're telling us. They're telling us, if you're sleepy, you can sleep here. <laughs> go upstairs and take your little nap and then come right back down here and get right back to work. And that's the issue. So if you're purposely napping at work, you're probably working too much also. So you guys really have to think Monday through Friday, eight to five, nine to five, whatever, plus commute, plus get ready time. Your sleep is probably being impacted unless you go to bed every day at the same time and you wake up at the same time every night. That's probably the only way your sleep is not being affected, but chances are you're trying to cram your life into those few hours every night and your sleep is probably being disrupted. So if you're sleepy at work, it's probably because you are working a little bit too much. One of the solutions that we're going to talk about in the solutions live stream is the four hour work week that's being um, talked about now. Now it's been around for a while, the concept, there's even a book, not four hour, four day, the four day work week. There is a book called four hour work week, but what I'm talking about is four day work week and give us three day weekends. And of course people are twisting and all uncomfortable over the concept of one extra day for people to just be with their family, you know, handle their business, run errands, appointments. You know what I mean? Like, haven't we reached a place now where technology for better or for worse, has given us some more free time back. That's why so many people go to work and pretend to work all day because they really don't need to be there eight hours. They really need to be there like three. And then the other five, they should be allowed to go do whatever they want. And the thing is, you know, from a business standpoint, people would say, well, if I only need them for three hours a day, well, I'm going to cut their pay. Well, I mean, that kind of makes sense to me, but at the same time, you giving them their time back probably trades off. So you giving them more time in their life back, that's less gas, less clothes, less food, like for lunch. So there's a trade off there. So you might have to pay them less in salary. I'm sure they would take it. Some people can't afford to lose one dime and that's fair. But others, I'm sure they would take it. It's like, OK, you want to pay me a thousand dollars less, but I can work or excuse me, I get one extra day off every week. I'll take it. You see what I mean? So. Just a thought, something to think about. Kitty cat. 
Do you think mommy's working too much? No? <laughs> okay. All right. It says, uh, oh, I thought this was interesting. This is page 74. In co corporate cults, employees are taught at work how to function at home. So think about all the employee resource programs that are talking about work-life balance and how to eat better and how to get more exercise. And actually some companies monitor, let me, let me rephrase. So we know all the uh, programs that basically tell you how to live your life and they're very well-intentioned and well-meaning. And some of them, you can actually sign up to have them monitor, you know, like your Fitbit or your Apple watch or your smartwatch that monitors like your heart rate and your sleeping patterns. And you can upload that into the system and then they can print you out like a customized, you know, biometric type guidance plan for you to live your best life. <laughs> like, it's too much, y'all. Too much. It's too much. Like it's great. Like it's, it's awesome that they care, but understand that they care because when you're sick, you can't work. And I'm sure they care too. Like I'm sure they do care about you to some degree, some of them. But really, like one of the main reasons they're concerned about employee obesity is because obesity leads to other illnesses that ultimately impact your ability to work. So it's not that they care how many steps you're getting every day. It's that they've done the math and mathematically they know that if they don't get you moving, you eventually will be someone who's still working for them, but on like short term disability or long term disability because of your health condition. But the irony in that is that you're probably in that state of health because of them. And I would never put 100% responsibility on a company for how we take care of our, ourselves, but we have to be real. The stress of some jobs, um, the mental stress of dealing with a narcissistic boss, the fact that some corporations really don't like it when you leave your desk, they take issue with that. You know, where did you go? Why were you gone for so long? And you're not an hourly employee and nothing is due. You see what I mean? So, and so dealing with that conflict mentally. So there's so much that, you know, a person is dealing with in these types of environments. It's no wonder that their health is failing them. So then they, they supplement that with all these little programs anyway. <laughs> so this was funny to me. This is on page 76. It says, you will be funny and you will conform to the culture of this organization, you were allowed to be yourself as long as yourself fits within the narrowly defined culture of the organization. Exactly. As long as yourself mirrors what everyone else is doing, you are fine. But, <laughs> and you will be funny every day and happy and happy to be here and grateful and thankful every day, unwavering unwavering dedication and loyalty is what you will present. And you will conform to the culture of this organization. So I thought that was funny. And it reminds me, I feel like, I feel like I did a video similar to this. I don't know, but it, this, this comment felt familiar and I just thought it was funny, but yeah, you will do all of these things and you'll do it with a smile on your face. And don't you ever show signs of wear and tear that are a result of how we've treated you because then we'll put you out with the trash because we're such a loving family. So this is page 78. I thought this, this may have been a good quote for the generational conversation we had a couple live streams ago is that it used to be that people regarded their private lives as treasures. This was one of the quotes that made me kind of stop and think for a few days after that people used to kind of keep their private lives private. And now there's almost an expectation that you will share everything. I feel like I'm part of the generation that kind of started the social media craze. And now I feel like I step back from it and I'm like, wow, people just, people will tell everybody everything, like everything. They tell them everything now. Like I, it's, it's shocking to me. Like it started simply with, you know, we, we never realized that it would go so far from food because the issue used to be, oh, people are sharing what they're eating every day. And people used to complain about that. I wish that's all, all we were at now. People just sharing what they eat. That would be great. 
but people tell every little detail. They show every little detail. It's like wide open. So this quote made me think of that. It used to be that people regarded their private lives as treasures. So in the context of the corporate cult, the more private you are, um, the less trusted you are. So you're not seen as open. You're not seen as a team member, even though you've done nothing but be like a team player. If you're not telling them all of your business, then you're seen as like guarded. You know what I mean? Which is why I told y'all, I think a couple live streams ago, I'm just going to get go get me a stock photo of a guy that looks pretty cute, stock photo of a child, and just keep them in my phone. <laughs> Um, and when they start up with all those questions, I'm like, oh yeah, this is my boyfriend. We've been dating for like three years. Ah, I don't know if we'll get married or not, but maybe, who knows? I don't know. Oh wait, then I shouldn't have the kid photo because then they'll be like, oh, she had a baby without being married. So if I really want like a really good job, I have to go buy myself a fake ring. So like a fake wedding ring. Now I can get the stock photo of the guy and the baby, then I'll be able to secure my high level corporate position. Cause then now I'm fully appropriate for the role, you know, married woman with a family that's appropriate. Ah, because if you just tell them, Oh, I really don't talk about my dating life at work. You're seen as like weird. All right. This is page 79. Organizations can't give to people without first taking. So this made me think about, we keep talking about proposals. We talked about it in the OK Boomer stream and we talked about it in one of the corporate cult streams where I basically say that if a company wants you to stay with them, that they really honestly need to propose to you. And the reason is because it's their idea. The whole business, the organization, the company is their idea. They're reaching out to you because they need your help. Without your help or someone like you, the organization will not push forward, right? It can't grow. All you need is a job. All you need is money, really. Be real. All you really need is the money. There's only a few jobs out there that the job itself is payment in and of itself. Only a few jobs like that. For the most part, all you need is the money. So considering that they can go get money from anybody you need to make it very convincing for them to come get money from you and to keep wanting to get money from you because in them doing that, they help your company grow and they help you serve your customers. You see, the more people who are willing to come get money from you is the more people that can make your company grow. And then if you're lucky enough to actually get talented people in there, you know what I mean? Like there's no there's no stopping your organization when you have smart people, dedicated people, you know, who you are good to and they are good to you. But these companies, like this quote says, they it's almost like they can't give without taking something from you first. And from the very beginning, the relationship is imbalanced and it typically remains imbalanced for the duration of your time there. So I felt good reading this. because I was like, yes. Yes, somebody's on my side, you know, regarding organizations realizing who they are. You're more powerful. You have more resources. You're the one with this vision, this plan and this goal. So why don't you try to attract people to you and get them to stay with you by virtue of treating them better than anyone else can treat them? What does that sound like? That actually sounds like marriage. How do you start a marriage? By proposing. What's the point of marriage? What's one of the points of marriage? To prevent that person from getting the marital benefits from anyone else. <laughs> you want them to get marital benefits from you, right? So then do a proper proposal and you might get what you're looking for. So I stand by my assertion. All right, this one kind of stung. This is on page 84. This says, only demoralized, emotionally weak people will stay in that kind of cult where they are controlled by the leader. Eventually the organization will die for lack of talent and diversity of input. So we've already covered that in depth regarding diversity. So obviously race, gender, orientation, all of that, obviously all of those things, but diversity is also different ideas, different perspectives. 
you might have a different opinion because you grew up in a different state. So let's say your company is talking about expanding to a different state and you grew up there. You might have a whole different opinion on that project. Not that you would have any control over it happening or not. It's not about that. It's more about insight. You know, hey, I grew up in that state. You may not want to put it there because blank, 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 blank. Oh, wow. Really? Let us look into that. They look into that and discover that you were right. So that's what is meant by diversity of input and perspectives. Everyone grew up different. Everyone has a different life experience. You need to hear from as many different people as you can in order to be the strongest that you can be, because otherwise you'll have blind spots. So that's my thought on that. I pulled this part though for this top line, demoralized, emotionally weak people will stay in that kind of cult. So if you're still in a cult, you know, look within and ask like, what is taking place in my life that makes this okay for me? That I would take this kind of abuse and this kind of treatment and I know it's wrong and I stay anyway. Why can't I go? Like, why can't I break free from this? Some of you will find your way to a cult and then you find your way out and then you feel bad afterward. So hopefully this video has made you feel better about leaving those types of situations because now you see that maybe you got pulled in because you were demoralized and weak at the time. And then as you got your confidence back and your self-respect back, you left a bad situation. So congratulations and good on you. Don't feel bad about that, okay? So just kind of keep that in mind, like, you know, even if you had like maybe friendships that broke up in the workplace, when you quit, they stayed. You're probably the stronger of the two or three or whatever. You're probably the strongest one out of that whole group because you had enough courage and dignity and self-respect to say, I don't deserve to be treated this way. I, I deserve to be treated better because I treat people better. So there's that. My thoughts on that. Okay. So this is going to be the last one, there is a dangerous blurring of the line between work and family. This is a conflict the family eventually will lose because it doesn't have the resources the corporation owns. And that is page 86. So I thought that was a very unique way of looking at the problem. The family loses because it doesn't have the resources of the corporation. So one way you could look at this is, you know, my husband or wife, left me because the new boyfriend or girlfriend is rich. Do you see what I mean? So that's essentially what this quote is saying. Who can compete with multimillionaires? You see what I mean? And people in power and people who can elevate your life and put you on airplanes and fly you all over the country and give you a corporate card and a corporate car and you know send you to fancy dinners and put you up in nice hotels you know, and that's just your wife or that's just your husband back home, you know, in your humble two bedroom, two bathroom home, you know, that you worked really hard for, but I'm going to put you up in a five star hotel for a month because I need you to do this thing for me. And eventually the lure of that rich boyfriend, rich girlfriend, that sugar daddy, sugar mama type situation, the lure of that pulls people away from their family. So this may answer a question for you, for a lot of people, like, why did my family break up or split apart? This is what happened. Your mom or dad was pulled away by the lure of their rich boyfriend or rich girlfriend, which was their job, which was the corporation. We'll say hello. Say hey. Okay, you got a good hello there, everybody. All right, so we will go right ahead and get started with our content. We are going to go ahead and pick up with chapter five of the book, Corporate Cults. We've been reviewing it for a while now, and we still have a little ways to go. We still got a little over half of the book left, so we'll definitely be doing this into the new year, but that was kind of the plan to just kind of take it slow, move through it real gentle-like until we reach the end and then we'll wrap it all up with a bunch of solutions and figure out how we can basically fix our working environment. We're gonna continue our review of this book, Corporate Cult. Hopefully some of you have gotten your hands on it and had a chance to read it yourself. Hopefully we're all caught up to each other right now. 
and we are going to pick up with chapter five. So I want to put this out as both a warning and kind of a, well, I guess a warning that we have to fix ourselves. We have to fix our current structure or the future may not be quite as bright as we would like for it to be. So I stumbled across this article the other day and I automatically thought of you guys and I automatically thought of the series that we're doing on corporate cults. And it says the office worker of the future supposedly looks like this. Emma is a red eyed prediction of what our bodies could look like in bad jobs. There's Emma to the left. Emma is your work colleague of the future. Are you sitting at your desk? Emma wants you to get up right now. Emma is your work colleague of the future, a life-size prediction of what office workers' bodies will look like in 20 years, thanks to the long-term negative physical and mental impact of increased screen time, longer hours, and too much sitting. I thought this was actually a really great warning for us. First of all, take a look at Emma. She doesn't look good. Emma looks like she is what we would call in the South, shot out. Okay. Emma looks like, like any day now could be it. And she's probably only about 32. Okay. So, but I, what I wanted to show you guys was this. So remember when we talk so much about open offices and that you're literally facing your coworkers, I wasn't kidding you guys look around, look behind her. Now she's been here 30 years. This is probably your resident narc at this point. Okay. And she walks around and bothers everybody. But look at this face. Look, look at their desks. Face to face, face to face, face to face, side by side, face to face, side by side. I want you all to ask yourself, those of you, I would say, who are 40 plus, could you envision working in this type of environment? What that's possibly like? Some of you probably do. But some of you may have just made the cutoff to where you didn't have to experience this. But imagine going to work every day and attempting to work in this type of environment. This girl has on headphones, which generally does not work because people will still just come right up to you and tap you on the shoulder. But I just wanted you all to know that PT is not making this stuff up. Like it's a big, wide open daycare. And what I find kind of ironic about this, you know, the whole concept of it, what they're basically saying about where we're going in the future is Generally, these are the same companies who, if they see you pop up from your desk over here and you're gone for 20 minutes because you, I don't know, went to take a walk around the block so you can get some fresh air and some sunshine, you will be questioned. You will be interrogated probably by Emma. Hey, where did you go? Why were you gone so long? <laughs> oh, I, I looked over and I noticed that you weren't at your desk. You know, <laughs> Just, you know, just let the team know when you're going to be stepping away. That's all. Just let us know where you went. And, you know, just let us know about when you think you'll be back. That kind of situation. This in a world where we're hyper connected. The girl who popped up from her desk for 20 minutes to take a walk around the block so she doesn't end up like Emma probably has all kinds of instant messaging type software on her phone from her company so that they can not only call her. They can text her, but they can also instant message each other through the company software. So it's kind of like it's this odd. We're so futuristic that we're hyper connected in all these other ways. But yet we still need to see you and we still need you physically right here with us every single day. It's, it's weird. It, it's a very odd um, dichotomy, I guess you could say, to have. You're super connected. So literally you could be on the other side of the world and interact with your coworkers, but God forbid you pop up for 20 minutes to take a walk in the nice fresh sunshine and air and come back and no one knows where you went. It will really play tricks on your mind. It'll mess with your head, but let this be a warning to you all that you will end up like Emma if you keep it up. It says Emma has sallow skin from too many years of artificial light and stress related eczema on her arms, poor air quality, has caused swollen sinuses with more nose and ear hairs and red eyes. Sitting at her workstation setup has given her a permanent, permanently bent back. Was she doing work while curled into a pretzel for 20 years? Free this woman and give her a vacation. Look at poor Emma. Look at Emma. You know this is your resident narcissist. You know that. They won't fire her. 
that you know this is your resident narc and she wants you to sit at your desk for nine hours a day, just like her and give it up just like her. They were wrong for this. They didn't have to do this. <laughs> they didn't have to do this. This was, this was, this was wrong. Look at this, look at the level of detail. And then basically the, just a little bit of background on this whole project. Emma is part of a 2019 report commissioned by office equipment company Fellows Brands. So of course they have a vested interest in scaring you, of course, but it's not too far off guys. It really isn't. We won't get that deep into it, but uh, who partnered with behavioral futurist William Hyam, Hyam and other experts to determine the health effects humans will see if we don't make changes in the workplace Hayim, who wrote the report that helped to inform what Emma could look like, called her a worst case scenario. Emma is what could happen to somebody in the worst case if they do everything badly, he told HuffPost. Hayim said Emma has made people imagine the health risks more clearly. When you start saying you could look like this, this could be you, I think people are more able to identify with the issue. So it goes on a little bit more. We're not gonna read the whole thing. If you're interested in reading the whole thing, the link is in the description box, but I thought this would be a great way to start off this episode of Corporate Cults Review because it's not just about, oh, millennial entitlement and blah, blah, blah. It's never been about that. It's about very real things, and this is one of them. This is what can happen when you don't put yourself first in the sense that you don't honor your own health in favor of the corporation. You don't honor your own body in favor of the corporation. You don't honor your own mental and emotional and spiritual well-being in favor of the corporation. And this is generally how people end up looking after they've done that for so many years. I think I said, what did I say? Washed and dried? I forgot what I said to describe it, but essentially this is it. And it calls, comes in all shapes, sizes, and colors, okay? So she's the prototype. So this is your forewarning. So we are picking up on chapter five, okay? And this is gonna start on page 90. Chapter five is called Organizational Culture, the way we do things around here. This is page 90. It says, in organizations, culture means preparing the organizational environment for development of a prescribed way of thinking and acting. The thumbnail definition of corporate culture is the way we do things around here. So this made me think about how so many organizations right now legally are hiring for something called culture fit. Those of you who may or may not have been on interviews recently have probably heard or heard this term tossed around, culture fit, culture fit. You know, we hire for culture, we hire for culture fit. So I've been in the spirit of making predictions lately. So I'd like to go ahead and make another one. I'm gonna predict, it'll probably have to take place within the next 10 years or so, but I do think it will happen where it will become illegal to hire based on a culture fit. Because if you think about it, what you're basically saying is, or what you could be saying to a person is, you have the skills, you have the ability, you have the will, you have the talent, but you, you don't, fit in with us. You can't sit here. So it's kind of like, first of all, how do you gauge culture? How do you measure culture? And how do you know, how can you know, or how could you know whether or not someone really fits in with you? You cannot know a person on first meeting or second meeting. You can't even really know a person after a week. It takes some time generally to get to know a person and that person might fit into your culture, but it could take some time as they warm up, you guys warm up, whatever. But to knock someone off or cancel them out of a candidacy for a job because they don't fit your culture, I believe that's going to become illegal at some point. And if I get enough free time on my hands, I think I'll draft up that, is it called a bill? Does it start with a bill or does it start with something else? But I think I'll write it up and submit it to my local government, I guess you could say, the people, senators. But I think that that should be illegal. It makes sense to me to say, you don't have the skill set that we need to do this job. You know, you don't have the experience that we need for someone in this particular level of role. That makes sense to me. 
But to tell someone essentially, oh, you have everything we want and need in terms of the job, but it's you, you don't fit in with our culture. You can't sit here. You can't sit with us. That's going to become illegal. I'm telling you, because it's almost like, my culture, my culture might be different from your culture, but that doesn't make me any less unable to be employed by you in this capacity. So are you discriminating based on someone's unique culture? Because I thought that that was illegal already, but the way that we're using culture in this context, culture fit is how it is right here on the screen, the way that we do things around here. So anyway, that's my big prediction for within the next 10 years or so, that's going to become illegal. You can't do that because someone doesn't fit in with your culture. And typically that culture is ping pong, beer pong, barefoot in the office, which is fine. Like if that's you, that's great. But you should not turn away a highly qualified individual because they don't want to play beer pong with you and walk around barefoot. You see what I mean? You could be uh, missing out on some really, really good talent. So on that thread, it says organizations have visible elements like people and buildings and output that can be seen, but they are run by culture, which can't be seen. So it escapes me like the phrase or the term. I forgot how it goes or even what it says, but it's something in the spirit of there's how it is and then there's like how it really is. For example, if you're applying to a company that a friend of yours works at, you know, you might tell them about your interview, assuming they're a close friend that you can trust. And then you say to them, OK, what's it really like there when people are asking what's it really like? This is basically what they're asking you. What is the culture that can't be seen? What is the invisible hand that drives everything behind the scenes? What's beneath the surface? You know, we get the, the dog and pony show that they're going to put on to try to attract you in. But what's it really like under the surface of everything? Is how they're presenting themselves really true? Or is that all a front for the nightmare that awaits anybody who, who dares to join this organization? So this is what they are really asking. OK, so let's move on. So this is on pages 92 and 93. It says individuals have choices in unculted organizations and don't have choices in culted organizations. So this to me, well, obviously, if it's a corporate cult, it's head up and run by narcissists. But this to me would be kind of like a pull out point in any type of narcissistic relationship. In a narcissistic relationship, you do not have choices. In healthy, non-narcissistic relationships, you do. Because you're given the freedom to choose in the sense that you're a human being and you have that right. They're not going to force themselves on you. They're going to allow you to make the choice. So that is the difference in any narcissistic or non-narcissistic relationship. And it's no different when it comes to these corporations. So you have choices in an unculted org and no choices in a culted org. That's pages 92 and 93. So let's move on. So this is also on page 93. Individuals have choices in unculted organizations and don't have choices in culted organizations. Members of culted organizations may have choices, but organizational coercion keeps them from being exercised. Culted employees have turned over the right to make those decisions to the organization. So essentially what this is are those orgs that are like, we have an open door policy. We welcome your suggestions. We welcome your feedback. <laughs> Give us your ideas. Feel free to express yourself here. You can be yourself here. You can build your brand here. You better not believe that. I mean, it could be true, but chances are it isn't. Like it says here, they may have those choices, but the organizational coercion keeps them from being exercised. So in other words, like the option is laid out in front of you, but oh, if you take it, if you take it, you might as well start looking for another job, basically. So this is also on page 93. 
This is another one of those ouch moments. We've had a couple of ouch moments, at least I have, throughout the reading of this book. This would be one of them. It says members self-select to corporate cults because they like the process of the organization. It is the continuity of behavior that provides predictability and stability for the corporate cult member. So for me, when I read that, I was like, dang, that was you. You, you love the stability. You're so attracted to the stability so attracted. And I don't think that that's necessarily a bad thing to be attracted to, to the stability. The issue is it makes you ripe and perfect to be a corporate cult member. It makes you a prime candidate because you love that stability. You love the predictability. You love knowing kind of sort of what's going to happen next, the stability of that paycheck, the stability of your benefits. It makes you feel very, very cozy and comfortable and safe and secure. And again, there's not necessarily anything wrong with that. It just makes you a prime candidate to be a corporate cult member. And you know what? I wanted to speak on, let me go back really quick. I wanted to speak on the first one we, we did in regard to the prescribed way of thinking and acting. I want to make a point and make it clear here that it's not necessarily a bad thing when that prescribed way of thinking and acting is like, how can I say this? Like part of the brand or like part of what you're offering. So for example, if your brand is known for great customer service, like customers just do not have a bad experience with your brand, that's probably as a result of some kind of prescribed way of thinking and acting. Like this is how we treat customers. This is how we respond to problems. This is how we fix it. This is how we conduct ourselves. You see what I mean? So having rules and having like a set structure is not necessarily a bad thing. I think the way that we're talking about it here is in the context of like, you're not even allowed to think like your own thoughts, like thoughts that belong to you. You're not really allowed to have like a life outside of the organization. Like everything you do, all of your thoughts, all of your behaviors are linked back to the organization. I think that it's important to kind of draw that line so if you found yourself in this situation more than once, chances are you're kind of sort of like this. You, you like the stability, you like the routine, you like the predictability of it. And again, no judgment because that was definitely me. And I can't lie and say that I don't like stability, like who doesn't? But I just have to be aware that that stability can rock you into a state of a lack of awareness. So this is on page 93. Okay, so he was describing how each type of organization thinks. So he said, the important question is not, did you get the job done? But did you get the job done in the prescribed manner based on corporate cult rules? So in your unculted organization, all they're really gonna ask you is, did you get the job done? In your cult, corporate cult, it's, did you do it how we wanted you to do it in the prescribed manner based on corporate cult rules? So it got me to thinking when I saw this one, it got me to thinking to myself. And here's the thought that I had to myself. That thought was, why do they feel their businesses won't run without cult like devotion and indoctrination? That is the question. Why do they feel their businesses won't run without cult-like devotion and indoctrination? Why? What makes you think that if you stopped approaching it this way, if you stop doing it this way, what makes you think you will no longer be able to get your business to work? Why do you feel like your business will fail unless you control people like down to the way that they think? That's my question. And it's an open question. It's an open-ended question. It's a rhetorical question somewhat, but it's also not a rhetorical question. Why do they feel like their businesses won't run without cult-like cult -like devotion and indoctrination? It's just something to think about. It's almost like they know instinctually that they, here I am answering the question. It's supposed to be an open question, PTE, and here you are answering it. This is my stab. This is my guess. My guess is they know that this little house of cards will fall apart 
the minute they stop micromanaging it and controlling it because it's not based in anything real or functional or logical or anything that would work all by itself. So it's kind of been artificial to begin with. So to keep something artificial going, you have to like kind of force people out of critical thinking and into thinking like how you want them to think. Because otherwise, if they start using that brain of theirs, they'll figure out that this whole thing is a sham. It's a very big sham, but it's a sham nonetheless. So that would be my guess. But it still leads to that question that I asked a couple streams back, which was, how do y'all make money though? Still, how do you make money even though it's a sham operation? That's something I just don't know. But these are the thoughts that I was thinking as I was reading this book. Moving on, so this gets into our uh, boomer and generational discussion, millennials, and shout out to the Gen Xers, poor Xers. I was reading some comments on the playback and they're like, nobody ever talks about us, but it's cool. <laughs> hey, everybody. <laughs> so shout out to the Xers. We didn't forget about you guys. Y'all just caught in the crosshairs between two generations that really have a lot of animosity towards each other. So yeah, but shout out to Gen X, hold it down in between. So this is gonna be on page 94 and this made me think of our generational discussion. So as employees are trying to replicate the formula they have seen applied to their recent predecessors, a few years of hard work leads to riches. If I subvert my own interest to the organization for an intense short period, that will serve my own interests, which are to be rich. So I couldn't agree with this top half of this more. Employees are trying to replicate the formula they have seen applied to their recent predecessors. A few years of hard work leads to riches. That's what the kids saw. The kids saw their parents or grandparents go work hard for a few years, five to 10 years, get promoted, move on up. You know, the kids saw growth and development. So the kids thought if I come in and do the same thing, the same thing will happen to me. And what the kids found out was that they are essentially being chased out of the workforce right now. They're being chased out for wanting the exact same thing their predecessors wanted and did. So, but the point, that wasn't even the point he was trying to make. The point he was trying to make was that line there. If I subvert my own interests to the organization for an intense short period, that will serve my own interests, which are to be rich. So in other words, people are showing up. They know kind of that they're giving too much, but they do it as a sacrifice because they think their sacrifice will pay off. And as a lot of them find out, as we'll see in the next slide here, that the sad part of the story is that for a charmed few, the formula works as it does for a charmed few early entrants in multi-level schemes. The latecomers end up stuck in the corporate cult as long-term servants to the organization. And that's on page 94. So it's kind of like, what he's basically saying is people go in bright-eyed and bushy-tailed and if they go in too late, in other words, if they don't get into the organization in the early days when it's kind of forming, you enter in with all these promises of riches, but it's very similar to a pyramid scheme in that you'll never make the kind of money that you would have made had you been there at the very beginning. Not to be confused with founders and CEOs. If I come in and devote my life to you, Will that pay off for me in the end? Will there be some payoff for that, for this total devotion, this full devotion? Will there be some payoff for me missing things with my friends, missing things with my family? Will there be some payoff for that? Will there be some payoff for me ending up looking like Emma? Will there be some payoff for that? I think that's all people are really asking. Like, I think what a lot of corporations don't realize is that for better or worse, people are really, really, really willing to give their all for them. Like people will lay it down for their company. And even though that's not how it should be, that's just how people are. Like people are all, I think people are more codependent than not, honestly. Like I honestly think there's more codependent people in society than narcissists. I think narcissists just have a greater impact. So it seems like there's more of them. That's not necessarily true. It's just that 
they have a greater impact on the little bit of corner, the little bit of real estate that they have, they can impact it tremendously. So, but I think by and large, people are more codependent than not. And that's not necessarily a good thing, but the assumption that a lot of these companies make going in is, you know, they, they won't work hard for me unless I force them or unless I slave drive them. And that's not true. People will give their all for little piddly jobs, piddly jobs. I know you guys have seen stuff on the internet where people are like chasing armed robbers out of the store or trying to tackle like shoplifters in the parking lot. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Like that's called giving your all. I am not tackling you. Bye bye. Like, hey, he went that way. <laughs> They'd be like, and you didn't chase him down. Absolutely not. Don't end up a long term servant to the organization. Is there going to be some payoff to this level of commitment and devotion and sacrifice that you're giving? Is there? And then never forget that even if you are working for a really great company, organization, stand up organization, unless it's yours. They could close it at any time. They could bankrupt at any time. They could make one bad business decision that could put them out of business. That has nothing to do with how they treated you, your fellow employees, their customers. They could just make one bad business decision and that's it. So it's like, how much are you willing to sacrifice on something that really is essentially a gamble? Just something to think about. Still on page 94, it says subservience is important to the functioning of the military because command is essential to success in battle. So I mentioned this a couple of streams ago. I was like, it makes sense to me that you would have to kind of be 100% on board on the battlefield. The battlefield is not the place to express your creativity or your individuality. It's not the place for you to decide suddenly you want to go do something different from everybody else. You know what I mean? Like it makes sense to me that you have to move as a unit when you are in combat and in battle. That makes perfect sense to me. It even makes sense to me in other areas and other types of industries and whatever that requires people to work together. There are certain industries you need to move as a unit. If you have two surgeons working on a patient trying to save a life and they've agreed to a plan, at, at the very least, they need to be able to communicate with each other if someone wants to change the plan. But who wants their surgeons going off on two different directions than what they decided on for that particular case? Nobody. Like, I need you to be on one accord, okay? So it makes sense to be on one accord in certain situations. But a lot of jobs these days do not require that. And a lot of jo jobs are highly, highly specialized, meaning, yes, they do collaborate and they cross over with other departments, industries, whatever. But by and large, it's very individual work. So it's kind of like they're trying to force people to move as military units who are like individual designers or roles that don't require that level is what I'm saying. So anyway, I thought this comment kind of brought that out again. Like subservience is important to the function of the military because command is essential to success in battle and we are not at war. Or are we? Let's move on. This is going to be on page 95. So I pulled this out of the context of how he used it. He was using it entirely differently. So I'll explain it how I meant it and then I'll tell you how he meant it. So it says, what I do can easily be changed because who I am is the same. So the way he meant it was in the military, their goal is carbon copies of the same person, basically. So when they're putting them through boot camp and training and all of that, they're trying to essentially produce the same soldier over and over and over again. So when they pull that soldier out of, out of a specific function, they can easily put soldier into a different function because essentially it's the same person. So I know what to expect of you. I know what you will do. I know what you won't do. I don't have to learn you all over again because I already know who you are because you all do the same thing. So that's how he meant it. But how I meant it, when I read it, I was like, 
the reason it's the cults never pull you in completely because I've fallen into some corporate cults, but they never pull me in all the way because I always hold on to myself. So I can work different types of jobs because who I am is essentially the same. I'm the same person working in different functions. The functions aren't working me. So the reverse of that are people who are only capable of being what they are and that's it. So once you take them away from what they do, I mean, is what, what uh, that's what I meant, what they do. They're only capable of being what they do. So once you pull them away from what they do, that's it. Like that person is finished. Like they've completely collapsed as an individual because you've taken them away from what they do. They never held on to themselves. They probably gave themselves away in their entirety to their corporation. So once that corporation got separated from them, like we talked about a couple of live streams ago, their whole community is gone. Community, identity, everything is gone at this point. So I felt I thought it was interesting that I was even able to do that. So he meant it in a different context, but I pulled it out and meant it entirely differently. And I think they both work. All right. So this is going on to page 96. It says the first is to consider how difficult it is to gain entry into the organization. And the second is to consider how tightly the organization guards information. So he was talking about kind of like, how you can identify a corporate cult, basically. When you're sitting in that interview, he was basically saying, if I remember reading this correctly, he was basically saying that like, if, if the interview was like super rigid and multiple layers, multiple levels, you got to meet with multiple people, you got to do all these circus tricks and theatrics. I think I'm embellishing at this point, but basically if the interview is super, super structured and rigid, difficult to get into the company. And then at the same time, that company is very guarded with their information. Chances are you're applying to and interviewing for a corporate cult. Chances are. Okay, so this is on page 97. It says, yes, because the narrow personality band will produce a dominant logic. So this slide is followed up by this one. So corporate cults have a homogeneity of personalities, but a rainbow of race, ethnicity, gender, and religious differences. So I thought this was interesting. Interesting, because when we think of corporate cults, we probably think that we can imagine in our mind what they look like. But what he was basically saying here is that you have some corporate cults that are very diverse. Like when you look out across their employee base, just a wide range of differences amongst the employees, visible and maybe not so visible differences. But what he's saying is, going back to the other slide, the narrow personality band produces a dominant logic. So even though they all look different and it looks like, yay, look at us, look how we're handling diversity. We're doing a good job with diversity. They might all be psychotic, narrow-minded, one personality banded corporate cult members. They could be, could be. I don't want y'all to make that assumption with every <laughs> company you see like that, like, oh, look how diverse they are. Definitely a cult. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm just saying, don't be fooled. Don't think that a corporate cult is all going to look the same. Like, oh, they all look alike in there. So that I know that they're a cult. Now that said, there's a strong chance of that, you know, because the point is you want to, you don't want to necessarily have a dominant logic, especially if the dominant logic is broken. If the dominant logic is broken, that's not a good thing. And then to further that point, if there's a dominant logic in a place, how do you think they handle people who have a different opinion or who see things differently or who have a different perspective or a different understanding? How do you think they handle those people? Do you think they welcome them with open arms? Probably not. So just because you might have that mixture, be on the lookout for that dominant logic and that one personality. So basically, here's another way you could say it. No matter who you interact with at the company, you feel like you're interacting with the exact same person over and over and over again. So you meet people at multiple different levels. You meet all different races, ethnicities, genders, religious differences. 
you meet all the differences, but you feel like you're talking to the same person every single time, that's a strong sign you're in a corporate cult. Like one, you can have one conversation with one, you've had it with them all. Seriously, that's a strong sign you're in a corporate cult. All right. So, and then here we go along that line on page 99 it says culted organizations cut off the head of the innovator in an attempt to keep the organization under strict control. So there's the answer to that question. <laughs> what do you think happens to people with different opinions? They cut off their head, off with their head. So I thought this was good. It said, this is on page 101. It says uncultured organizations apply consequentialist thinking, which is behavior that focuses on the outcome. So in other words, this is going to be your organization that says, here's what we need. Here's the deadline. Here's your resources to accomplish it. Do it however you want to get it done. Just get it done. And then they back off and they let you work. And, that, and that's all there really is to it. All they care about is the end result. So when they when the deadline comes, did you meet the deadline or didn't you? And if you didn't, why not? Then they might start to go backwards and start to talk about methodology, how you did it, why you did it that way, whatever. Then they might start to backtrack. But other than that, if you meet the deadline and it's exactly what they asked for, they don't bother you. And everything, it's like that every single time. Here's what we need. Here's, here's when we need it by. Here's the resources you have access to. If you need something else, let us know. And see you at the deadline day. Goodbye. Pure autonomy versus the culted organization that is super concerned about all the steps you're taking that lead up to the outcome. So they almost could not care less about the end result they're more concerned about controlling every aspect of the process, but they don't really care about the outcome. So this brings up questions I've brought up before, like, why are we here? Am I just here for appearances? Because if so, tell me that so I can completely shift gears and switch gears into something else. What are we doing? Like, are we just here to play all day? Like what? What is our objective here? What are we working towards here? Nothing. The answer is really nothing. It's <laughs> in a culted organization. It's not the destination. It's the drive. It's just being together in the car, looking at the mountains and stuff go by. That's it. That's what it's about. It's not even really about where you're going. It's about being together in the car watching the mountains pass by. And that's really, really great when you're with family. All right, let's move on. She could not maintain her own integrity and self-respect while working in a narcissistic organizational culture. She maintained her self-worth by separating who she is from what she does. Who she is is more important and she preserved that by quitting. So he was talking about a very specific example, but I just thought that would be a really great, you know, those desk, they're like desk decorations and like they're big blocks and they have like glass over them and like words underneath them. I thought this would be really great to put on your desk, like in the corner. She could not maintain her own integrity and self-respect while working in a narcissistic organizational culture. See how that goes over. See how, see how long before you get pulled in for a private meeting for having this sitting on your desk. But I thought it was interesting that he mentioned narcissism and this book was written in the year 2000. So maybe we're late, but it's been on people's minds apparently since at least 2000. And what do I always say that I felt like it kind of surfaced up and bubbled up right around 2000, 2001. So I thought that was very interesting to see that term in there. Um, but yeah, you can't, you can't maintain your integrity or your self-respect when you're either dating narcissists, living with them, married to them, working for them. It's very hard to maintain those things and be involved with these people because they, they work at it daily to strip it away from you. So it's a daily act for them. And typically the only way we can make it stop is by <laughs> quitting, leaving, going no contact. I recognize that's not always a possibility immediately, but generally that is the solution. 
because they are just so determined. They're bound and determined. So when you're dealing with some who, someone who's bound and determined, very persistent, won't quit, like it's very hard to keep your energy up against that. So yeah, she preserved all of those things by quitting. Good girl. Make sure that above all else, you are always preserving your dignity. Preserve your dignity, preserve your self-worth, preserve your self-respect. These companies, many of them, have become so detached from their own humanity that they don't know how to be human towards you anymore. They don't because they've lost touch with theirs. All right, everybody. Hello, hello, and welcome to the first live stream of 2020. Happy New Year to everybody. Happy 2020. Welcome to the 20s. I think that's exciting. <laughs> Our co-host is here right on cue to wish everybody a happy new year. Happy first live stream. Say hello to everyone. Kitty cat. Hello. Say happy new year. Hello. Good girl. Oh, you're such a good girl. Such a good girl. All right, let me get set up on my side here. All right, everybody, let's get started. We're actually picking back up with our corporate cults review. We have made it through chapters one through five. We are now gonna tackle chapter six, which is where we are in the book. This is the cover. So the purpose of this series, Corporate Cults Review, is to redefine and reshape working and corporate culture to be a place where people can earn an honest living free of harassment and mental duress. And that's really all that it is. If we try to pretend like there aren't really, really deep issues going on in corporate, we would be lying right now. We really would. There's a culture of fear. There's a culture of silence. You know, there's a lot of different things going on in, in the workplace right now that we need to fix because we have the capability of fixing them. We can fix them is the main reason that we need to. So in 2020, we are gonna do better and we're gonna get better. So let's go right into a little bit more of the purpose of this live stream. I like to give you guys real life examples to show you why we're addressing this issue and why it's such a problem. The issue is if we're not careful encroachment has already taken place and will continue to take place until you no longer really know who you are anymore. And these corporations can't, they can't seem to help themselves in terms of encroaching on their employees. And I saw this article about two or three weeks ago and I couldn't wait to bring it to you guys and I planned on bringing it to you in this stream. But there is a company that has designed a toilet that makes it uncomfortable to take bathroom breaks longer than five minutes. And we are going to look at this article. Let's take a look at this and then we'll get into our actual review of the book itself. The article, this toilet patent makes workers uncomfortable taking long bathroom breaks. It's purposely uncomfortable for long-term sitting. Does this UK company's patent cross a line? Let's take a look. It's a very short article. It says bosses already monitor employees' emails, Slack messages, and keystrokes to increase productivity at work. Now a British company, Standard Toilet, has developed a toilet that discourages long bathroom breaks. The company has filed a patent for a fixture designed to increase employee productivity by making it uncomfortable for anyone to dwell on the toilet seat. Current toilet seats provide a horizontal seating surface, Standard Toilet's website states. This enables a user to sit relatively comfortably on the toilet. And apparently that's a problem. Sloping forward at an angle of 13 degrees, Standard Toilet's product is designed to make it uncomfortable to spend longer than about five minutes on it without experiencing leg strain, Mahabir Gill, founder of Standard Toilet, told Wired UK in an article published Monday. <laughs> 13 degrees is not too inconvenient, but you'd soon want to get off the seat quite quickly, Gill told the magazine. 
The magazine reported that Gill is in talks with several local councils and service stations to use his product. By using our uniquely designed WC, the time spent on the WC is considerably reduced, easing queuing congestion and benefiting businesses, Standard Toilets website claims. Raymond Martin is the managing director of the British Toilet Association Group that endorsed the patent on Standard Toilet's website. Citing overcrowding of public restrooms, Martin said, we're endorsing a new design which may help people use the toilets better because it keeps everybody moving. Jennifer Kaufman Bueller, assistant professor of design history at Purdue University in Indiana, said the toilet makes assumptions about the kind of person who will be using it. It kind of imagines that the process of urinating and defecating are these mechanical aspects of our bodies that always operate the way they are supposed to. That we all have bowels that move efficiently, that we all pee at the same level, Kaufman Bueller said. Bodies aren't standard. In an email, Standard Toilet told HuffPost that the product is not designed to replace toilets for people with disabilities. Assuming that the product was in compliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act and other countries' regulations for accessibility, there could still be issues if this toilet were to go mainstream, a workplace disability expert said. Nadine Vogel is the CEO of Springboard Consulting, a business that works with companies on how to serve workers with disabilities. Is it necessarily usable for all by a universal design standpoint, Vogel said, is the question standard toilets should be asking themselves to be more inclusive to employees with disabilities. What is accessible is not always usable, Vogel said. Vogel outlines scenarios of workers who may or may not have a documented disability, but need longer bathroom breaks. It could be a diabetic worker who needs to take a glucose test while sitting comfortably on a toilet seat, she said. Or it could be someone needing that break for their mental health. The fact that the concern is extended employee breaks, well, what about people that have some kind of mental health situation that actually need that kind of longer break, Vogel said. Harvey Mol Molotok, a professor of sociology at NYU and co-editor of Toilet, Public Restrooms and the Politics of Sharing, said his immediate reaction to the patent was that it was a spoof. <laughs> I confirmed through the United Kingdom's Intellectual Properties Office that Gill's toilet with an inclined seating surface patent is real and that the patent filing was published August 14th. In general, Molotov said this toilet monitoring is part of the history of anxiety that people are misusing toilet facilities for things not intended and indeed doing things that are sinful, drugs, loafing, Kaufman, Kaufman Bueller said this product assumes how an employee's time should be managed. I do think it's very a very capitalist mentality that people's physical bodies and its problems and limitations are inconveniences to modern capitalism that wants you to be productive whatever the cost. Employees already feel pressure to take shorter bathroom breaks. 74% of Amazon warehouse workers avoid using the toilet out of fear of being warned about missing their target numbers, according to a survey of more than 100 employees by worker rights platform Organize. Office design can add another physical layer to this pressure to be an efficient worker, since direct surveillance would be indecent invasion of the most private of our acts. Employers control workers' toilet habits through equipment, Molotov said. Instead of a real cop, the cop is built into the machinery itself, he added. Okay, y'all, <laughs> this is what I'm talking about. This is the exact reason we need to have this conversation. Because somebody somewhere sat and went, how can we... What did they say? They phrased it perfectly. How can we invade the most private of our employees' acts? I know we'll design a toilet that sits at an incline. So they're making assumptions about you and your body and your body's needs. 
They're making assumptions about what's actually happening in the toilet. There's lots of things going on in there. Everyone is not sitting in there using their cell phone. And I'm gonna put a thumbtack there and say, if they are, then what type of environment have you designed on the outside to where grown adult men and women feel like they can't use their cell phone that they pay for in your presence? These are adult human beings and they're trying to control adult men and women in any way that they possibly can. I just think that this is sick. I think this is kind of psychotic. So anyway, the level of assumption that's built into this is insane. This is why people want to work from home so bad, because you harass people at the most minute and personal and intimate level. You harass them. This is harassment. You cannot do this to your employees. If I worked for a company like this, I would revolt. This is why we're doing this series, because we're not actually making progress in this area. We are backtracking. And I think it's so interesting that we're making so much progress in technology, but we are backtracking in areas of like how to treat human beings. This is like humanity 101. We're going backwards and I don't understand why. And that's what's frightening to me, that people are not improving in this area. They're getting worse. So when I hear people talking about all the, oh, the snowflakes, oh, the social justice warriors, like really, you wouldn't want somebody standing up for people? Can they take it too far sometimes? Absolutely. But trust me, you want people in your society who are going to make noise when something is not right. Because as soon as those people go to sleep, we are all screwed. So right on, social justice warriors, keep making noise. We need somebody to say, whoa, we're getting out of balance here. This is not balance. The fact that it doesn't come natural to everybody is frightening to me. The fact that common human decency and how to treat another person does not come naturally to everyone, that you actually need a group of people to say, whoa, 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 this isn't right. That's what's frightening to me and that's what should scare everybody. Because the fact that we actually have to argue and legislate with people to treat other human beings properly, that should be scary to you. We shouldn't need laws for that, <laughs> but we do. So we are finally into our content Chapter six of corporate cults devoted to the wrong thing. To me so far, this has been one of the most powerful chapters. I think they're all pretty powerful, but this has been one of the most powerful ones in my opinion. So this is gonna be on page 108. And it says, employees often misplace devotion by committing those things to organizations that should be given to family and community and I put in there and self. So the author does not include the self in here very often, but I do. And I'm going to explain why in a second. But what he's basically saying here is that people who end up becoming corporate cult members misplace their devotion. They devote everything that's supposed to go into their family and their community and themselves to the organization. So that by the time they end up leaving that organization, there's literally nothing left of themselves. They are shells of their former selves because they gave everything that they were to the organization. And you have to understand why that's such a bad decision. It's such a bad decision because it's the organization itself is quite tenuous, tenuous, meaning shaky, unstable, uncertain. You're putting your whole trust, love, devotion, future into the hands of people who one day might decide to take the whole thing under. One day they might decide to sell it. One day they might hire somebody who makes a series of bad decisions that lead to you no longer having that career or that job due to no fault of your own. So to put so much trust and so much faith in something so tenuous is not wise. Corporate cults think that they own you, whereas the truth is they are borrowing you. All corporations, all workplaces, all companies are borrowing you. They do not own you. 
They are borrowing you for a certain period of time. And when that period of time has passed, you are no longer theirs. They do not own you. You understand? But what they want is ownership. They want full ownership over their employees. And that's where a lot of people run into issues. So I want to I want to show you why I put self in there. OK, so let's look at this. This comment came from the hoarders video. I liked this person's comment because she put a different spin on it. It says, I believe a lot of hoarding exists through the fact that people tend to live their lives mainly outside of their homes. Television and social media show people shopping, going on trips, visiting theme parks, and even ordering online. But few people turn away from social media and outside money spending events to come home and actually live in their homes and cook dinner. And I was like, dang, like I've been thinking of this comment ever since I read it, because this is kind of what I've been trying to say, which is we've been trained to completely ignore ourselves, completely ignore ourselves. So when I say when I put self and self in here, I think it's important to do that because the author is saying family and community, which are both important. But don't forget who makes up the family and who makes up the community. You do. An individual does. So if you don't take care of yourself, what good are you to your family? And if you don't take care of yourself, what good are you to your community? So when this viewer makes this comment, a lot of hoarding exists from the fact that people tend to live their lives mainly outside of their homes. I could not agree more because we spend 40 plus hours at the workplace, most of us, with the exception of those of us who are fortunate to work from home, but you're still devoting probably 40 plus hours or more, even working from home. Then those of you with children and families, you have their different events and things to go to, which you might enjoy, which is fine. We're not saying that you're not supposed to enjoy it. You might enjoy it. Then you have, your showers, your bridal showers, birthday showers, wedding showers, shower showers. Then you have all your holidays and then you have all the anniversaries and birthdays and things sprinkled in between. You live your entire life outside of your actual house, which some people would say, well, that's what life is about. You're supposed to get out and go grab life by the horns. But the thing, I think the one point I've been trying to get across since I started this channel is that your life is important too, though. <laughs> Underlying all of that is your life. Your life is supporting all of those things. So if your life is in disorder and is chaotic, because you're doing all of these other things, you're not really providing a service. You're not. You're not giving your best self because your best self is in complete disarray, is what I'm saying. So, and part of that comes from these workplaces that completely absorb you into them. So I thought this comment was great. I thought it was a perfect illustration. So let's move on. The next quote, page 109, it says, he loved his wife, but he was devoted to work. When I read that, even though I've never been married, that really sat somewhere with me. That hit me hard, I'm like, dang. Dang, they love their spouse, but they were devoted to work. What we really want is the devotion in our relationship. Those of you who have had relationships that fell apart, imagine the difference devotion would have made in your relationship. Imagine how much differently it would have turned out if devotion had been applied in the right direction. But oftentimes devotion, love and devotion are two different things. Mm hmm. So I just looked at the comments. It says many coworkers don't want to go home. It's very strange, isn't it? There is no home at home. That's why there is no home home. I've had the opportunity to be in a lot of different homes, like visiting or whatever, for different reasons. And it's amazing to me how it does not matter how expensive the house is. Love is either in it or it's not. And ooh, I can't explain it to y'all. I can't. It's an energy thing. I've walked into homes, expensive homes, and I've been like, the energy in here is completely flat and dead, completely flat and dead. 
And I've walked into homes that some people would say are, you know, run down or whatever. And they are just, it's overflowing with like warmth and love and like interesting things. And like, it's like all the things in the house have life to them. I don't even know how I started talking about that. Oh, some people don't want to go home. Yeah, because home is dead. So on page 112, he talks about how devotion goes beyond reason. And there's a quote on this page. I was going to write it, put it up. But YouTube is so sensitive about this topic lately. But basically, I'll try to code it. It says small people who are mistreated by their parents remain devoted to them just as employees who are mentally and emotionally strafed by Bill Gates remain loyal. So he was kind of talking about Microsoft a little bit, but he was basically saying that devotion goes beyond reason. It makes no sense. In other words, when you're truly devoted to something, people outside looking in won't understand why necessarily you're so devoted. They won't get it. So it's kind of the same thing when people get inculcated into corporate cults, Outside looking in, nobody would understand why this person keeps going back. And friends and family might say, just quit, just quit, just quit that job. But they can't because they are devoted. All right. So here's a thought that I had as I was reading this, what you are devoted to grow. So when you really stop and think about that, like we could, we could kind of think up a bunch of different examples, right? So we'll, since we've been talking about hoarders, let's use their, them for example. They are, a lot of them are devoted to shopping. A lot of them are devoted to acquiring new things. A lot of them are devoted to not doing it because they expect someone else to do it. So I've seen a lot of spouses arguing like, oh, I would clean up, but it's his mess. Or I would clean up, but it's her mess. So they're devoted to the standoff. And as a result, their hoard grows. They're devoted to shopping, their hoard, and not throwing things away, their hoard grows. But they're devoted to that. Okay, let's look at it a different way. People who are devoted to, say, working out, if they're truly devoted to it, they should see some results over time. And those results will show. Like you can look at them and go, wow, he or she clearly works out all the time. And the opposite is true. Here's another perfect example. Those of us who are devoted to passing time on Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, all the different social medias, even YouTube, <laughs> even YouTube, when we become devoted to that, so much time passes us by. And then we might find ourselves going, where's all our time going? You devoted your time to passive things and therefore your passive hourly count grew. A lot of the cell phones now have um, screen time on them to tell you, hey, you've had 12 hours of screen time today. You need to chill. You need to go do something else. <laughs> go walk outside and get some sunshine or something. But what we devote ourselves to grows. It blossoms. So it's the same thing. When you have a person who completely devotes themselves to work, their work life might grow, but their personal life is shrinking. And then it could be argued vice versa. Well, if a person 100% devotes themselves to themselves, their personal life will be great, but their work life might shrink. That could be argued. It could be argued. However, I think if you devote more to yourself, your work life will improve because you'll have more of yourself to offer. You'll have more square inches to give. When you don't have very many square inches left, you don't have very many left to give. So I feel like devotion to self and community and family powers you up to have more to offer everybody else, including your job. But just think about that, though. Whatever you devote yourself to grows. So let's get back into the content. It says when her 45 minute commute is figured in, she spends 11 hours away from home and gets paid for seven and a half. OK, and then you compound that we're already devoting so much. We're already giving so much that we're not being compensated for. We really are like silent investors in these companies that don't get any return on investment other than the paycheck and the health insurance and stuff. And some of you might say, well, that is the ROI. But if you really sat and did the mathematics behind how much you invest to make your day-to-day -day work life happen, you are getting a negative ROI. You are. Some of you may have quit a job, left a job in the past and found that you actually had more money when you weren't working than when you were. Has that ever happened to anybody? 
And it's the most bizarre thing. Now, obviously, hopefully you have a little bit of money stashed away, but you quit a job and you somehow have more money, like cash, than when you were working every single day. If you sat down and did the math, you would discover why. You're saving in gasoline, you're saving in oil changes, you're saving in miscellaneous purchases like coffee, gum, chips out of the snack machine. You're saving on your lunches probably because either you're eating at home or you're buying something else or whatever. You have your free time back. So you're able to do things that actually are beneficial to you and your life for once versus your corporation. So somehow you start to discover you have more money. Now, obviously that will run out eventually if you keep spending at the same level and you don't have anything replacing it. But what I'm saying is you will find more of your miscellaneous income. You'll have more and you won't really fully understand why. This is why you're cutting out that extra time and energy that you're not being compensated for. So this is on page 113. He gave the story of an insurance company that put a technology in place that was designed to let, basically it was designed to make it to where business would not be interrupted no matter what was going on weather-wise or whatever. And that when a weather event hit, the company still made its employees come in to the office, even though they had the capabilities to send the calls elsewhere. So in other words, they could take these calls that are normally coming into one state and send them to another state because that one state is being impacted by ice in this particular story. So he said, it seems ironic that an insurance company would risk the health and lives of its workers simply to maintain company rules. And that's, <laughs> that's how you know you're working for a true fool where you would put all these people's health and lives and property at risk just to maintain company rules, but you actually have the technology in place to make it better. That's what technology is for. Technology is supposed to be used to make things better, but you won't use it because you're so committed to these arbitrary rules that make no sense in the moment. They can't think. I told you guys the last live stream, they're not as smart as you think they are. I know it's easy to believe that because you see the, everything that they're able to accomplish. You see the amount of money that they make and you think, wow, anyone who could make that much money and accomplish that much surely is intelligent. I'm telling you guys, I'm telling y'all, it's not a true statement. It's not. A lot of it is a matter of dumb luck, but a lot of it is a matter of narcissism because they'll just do things that other people would be like, Guys, let's not do that because either it's wrong or let's stop or let's try a different way. The different way will take a little longer, but it'll be better. Not a narcissist. Narcissists just go charging forward. And they actually, believe it or not, do experience a lot of success in that. It's just that their success is short-lived because their plans are ill thought out. They never think. So yeah, they get success, but they typically can't hold on to it because they didn't have anything foundationally underneath that success to prop it up. So then this comment made me think of what we were talking about earlier. So it seems ironic that an insurance company would risk the health and lives of its workers simply to maintain company rules. It made me think of this. You would risk people's health and their lives just to make sure they only take a five minute bathroom break. That makes no sense. You wouldn't impose that on your child. You wouldn't impose that on your spouse if you love your spouse, if you actually love your spouse. You wouldn't impose that on them. It's ridiculous. These corporations have to grow up. So I actually edited this comment. It's on page 113 and 114. It says the technology is used to control employees instead of empower them. So I think this would be one of the major takeaways from this, especially those of you who might actually be in leadership and management positions or business owners, CEOs, what you need to do or find a way to do is release the control and find a way to empower your employees. So some might say, what does empower actually mean? I don't know how to empower somebody. 
When you empower people, you're giving someone the authority or the power to do something, which I know frightens some of you. So let's move on to the next definition, which is making someone stronger and more confident, especially in controlling their life and claiming their rights. When I think of a corporation, when I think of running a business, it all depends on what the business is. But to the best of my ability, I'm going to empower my employees like, hey, here's what we're doing. Here's the whole purpose that we're even in existence. Here's your function in all of that. Here are the unique due dates surrounding your particular function. Here are all the tools that I know to give you. If there's something else that you need, please tell me and I'll get it for you. I'm going to give you everything I can think to give you. You tell me what I'm missing. I provide that to you. And then I'm pretty much hands off from there. I have empowered you. I've made you strong. I've made you confident. You can control your life and you can claim your, your rights. I'm not going to infringe on your rights. I don't expect to hear from you until if, if you have a question, you need something or until the due date, period. I've empowered you. Goodbye. I'm not going to monitor your bathroom breaks. Don't you have something else to do? So on a similar thread, it says devotion does not occur overnight. It grows. So my quote was what you devote yourself to grows. Whatever you devote yourself to grows. He's saying that devotion itself grows. And the growing process is called escalating commitment to a cause. So escalating commitment to a cause. The desire to avoid making bad decisions gets people caught in a trap called escalation of commitment. This actually made me think of gamblers because what he was basically saying on this particular part was people who get caught up in this escalation of commitment, they make a bad decision and then the devotion comes into play and that they're devoted or committed to making sure that they didn't make a bad decision. So in other words, it's just like the gambler who's already lost so much money at the table. Their commitment escalates because now they have to recoup those funds so they believe in their minds or so they know that they did not make a bad decision. That 20000 they just lost, ooh, I'm going to keep playing because when I keep playing, I'll recoup the 20 grand and show everybody that I did not make a bad decision. When in reality, all they're doing is just losing more and more and more money. And they might regain like a thousand at some point, but they're in the hole and eventually they'll run out of cash. It's the exact same thing in these situations. You get into a, a job, usually within the first couple of days or weeks, you see that something is wrong. Sometimes on the first day, you're like, oh, I think I made a bad, a bad choice but you don't wanna believe that you made a bad decision. So you actually escalate your commitment to try to fix it, to try to correct it. So I'll give you a perfect example. I can't tell you how many jobs I've started or walked into that were completely disorganized, chaotic, and a mess. Knowing what I know now, the proper thing for me to do would be to, after a couple of hours and see <laughs> what's going on, unless I've been hired to actually fix the mess, I should gather my things, go to the hiring manager and say, thank you so much for this opportunity. I really appreciate it. I don't think it's going to work out for me, but I do wish you the best of luck and the greatest of success in the future. But yeah, this is not going to work out for me. I'm sorry. And leave because basically what happens is it's, the, it's exactly what he's describing. I get in there and I'm like, I've been hired for this one thing, but the only way I can do this one thing is for me to fix this first. Escalation of commitment comes in in my attempt to fix what already should have been functional before I got there. So now I'm working weekends. Now I'm staying late, simply trying to organize the mess that was handed to me so I can do my job versus being hired to do my job and and that thing that's a mess over here is actually already pretty much organized and functional. They might want you to add to it. They might want you to kind of maintain it, but it's pretty much already up and running. You're just plugging into the system versus basically building the system <laughs> from scratch. You have all the parts, but the parts are scattered everywhere. 
This is page 118. It says organizations exist in conceptual legal form, not in construct or real form. So what he was basically saying here is, and it's kind of a hard concept to grasp, but not really, is that organizations are not real. They're really not. And he was saying that the building that they're in is a building. He was like their name, the brand, those are names and brands. The organization is a concept. It's not something that is real. It's unwise to devote yourself to something that is actually not real to begin with. It's a concept that exists on, on paper. Yeah, they have buildings and products and services, but they're still not real. And he really breaks it down further. But just know that the organization itself is a concept. So how can you hopelessly devote yourself to a concept, something that's not even tangible and real? And he kind of, I've heard that it here, it says only individuals making individual decisions give organizations movement and life. So he's basically saying the organization is not real. The people are. The people are what make up the organization. It says people have more value than the contracts they make. So what he's basically saying is that the organization is a web of contracts. I'm contracted to you as an employee for this salary and this time, this amount of time per week. We contract out the food vendors. We contract out the cleaning staff. We contract out the marketing company that prints all of our materials. So basically the organization is a series of contracts. And he's saying that people have more value than the contracts that they make with each other. So we have to always make sure that we're holding on to the human element of all of this, because at the end of the day, the organization itself is not real. And this is why corporate cultism is like worshiping a false God. Page 119. This is why when they get like this, it's like you're worshiping that golden calf, a false God. God, because it really is false. It's not really real. And a lot of people don't discover that until late in life on their deathbed. Like, wow, I gave all of my effort and energy to something that actually really wasn't real to begin with. I'm real. My, my coworkers are real. Perhaps the product or service that we're putting out is real, but the whole thing itself is a concept. Page 120 signs of overly devoted employees. So if this is you, I want you guys to really take a, a nice deep look within and, and, and be honest with yourself and say, is this me? But they are always fine. Hey, how you doing? I'm fine. <laughs> How's everything going? That's fine. They don't take vacations. They often work late. They don't have friends outside of the workplace. They get very emotional and sensitive about their work. And they take work home on a regular basis. This is a sign that you might be overly devoted to your job. Maybe. Okay. Maybe not. Like again, and I always have to say this, if you love it, if it gives you life, if you're making a difference, if you're making good money, if you're helping people, I would still argue that you need to remember yourself. But I'd have to wonder what is worth never taking a break, never going home on time, not having any friends outside of it, being super emotional about it and taking work home on a regular basis, other than something that is yours. Like if it's your business that you built up from scratch, maybe I could see that, but mm, we have to remember that when we were born, we were born as sentient beings and who we were had nothing to do with any of this. Who we were had nothing to do with our work for years, for at least 16 years. Well, if you count school, five. But for five years, who we were had nothing to do with what we produced. It was just good enough for us to be who we were. Do you see what I mean? So that's the part I never want you to forget, because once you start to forget that, that's when it becomes very easy to take advantage of you, mistreat you, adopt you into a corporate cult, suck the life out of you because you don't believe in your life anymore. You don't think it's worth it. You don't even think it's worthy of protection. 
So when you don't think your life is worthy of protection, it becomes open season to all of these different types of predators out here. So really look within and ask yourself if this is what's happening with you. Okay. It says devotion to people and causes, and I put in and self, can produce long-term satisfaction. Devotion to organizations provides very short-term satisfaction, resulting in severe disappointment. And I think this really comes out with the people who get blindsided, who like give their all. And they're the rare people who actually get rewarded for that. So they give their all, they get a promotion. Give more, get a promotion. Give some more life, lifeblood, they get a promotion. Get the life sucked out of them, they get a promotion, right? And then that same person will get blindsided by that company and just completely either laid off, kicked to the curb. You know, maybe they feel like they, they're past their prime. The company discards them because remember, the company is not really real. The organization is not real. So it has no feelings. So it discards them and they're like, how could they do this to me? After everything I gave them, I miss my kids' birthday parties. I miss my kids' soccer games. I miss my kids, you fill in the blank. You know, my wife or husband is holding on because I'm never home and they want to leave me. I gave my everything to this company and they just threw me to the wayside. That's why you can't devote yourself to them. You can't do it. And I know that seems unnatural because that is 100% not how we were trained. And we were actually all pretty, pretty brainwashed fairly well, actually. The brainwashing is just now starting to come undone. And so we believe that that's what we're supposed to do. And then we tend to do it to each other, not me. But I've seen it happen to what I would consider to be otherwise good people, people who have some sense. But as they get pulled into the cult, more and more, they give up their own voice and they won't speak out for what's wrong. They see it, but they won't say anything because they're either afraid, they want to protect their job. And then the most interesting thing is usually like a year later, they get let go too. Because they don't honor your loyalty and your devotion. They only want your devotion. They don't give devotion. Do you understand? They want devotion from you. They do not provide devotion, just like a true narcissist. They want your full devotion. They are not going to return that devotion to you. Very few companies do. It is a rare occurrence. If you happen to work at one of those companies that actually returns the devotion to you, treat them well, give them your all, well, <laughs> give them your best effort, work effort. And be fair, honest, and have fair, honest dealings with them as long as you possibly can, because that is super rare. But most of them aren't like that. They're not. It says, are they really fine or are they artificially devoted to the organization because they've seen what happens to people who aren't fine? So this is page 122. And he kind of told the story of this farmer. Long story short, the farmer went to court because of an accident. The opposing attorney was like, we heard that you said that you were fine after the accident. The farmer goes into this long story about how, about how basically he's seen other people who were not fine after accidents. So by comparison, he was fine. A little bit of an odd misplaced story, but it, it makes sense when you read it. But what he's basically saying is when you see people who aren't fine, oh, you better say that you are. Or if you if <laughs> another way to put it is if you saw other people's issues, you would you'd be okay with yours. So when people say that they're fine in organizations like these, are they really fine or are they afraid because they've seen what happened to other people who spoke up? And chances are it is the latter. So let's look at this next one. It's a long quote, so I decided to break it up by just highlighting the pieces. So it says, members of corporate cults are always fine no matter what the circumstances. When you're in a situation, be it a business, corporate cult, family cult, relational cult, you had better always be fine, no matter what the circumstances. Why is that? Because they've learned to put the organization first and their personal life second. You can substitute organization for narcissist. They've learned to put the narcissist first and their personal lives second. They are always fine because they have seen what happens to people who aren't fine. Those who aren't fine leave the corporation 
or leave the narcissist either by choice or by force. You understand? So you have to always be happy with your narc. Positive attitude. You have to always be cheerful and smiling and singing praises. You can never speak a word contrary. Never. Anything contrary to this fake, doped up, Kool-Aid smile, artificial reality that they've created will either get you kicked out or you'll leave yourself after they react to that. So it continues on. <laughs> Corporate cults do not tolerate people who aren't fine. If people are not fine, this indicates that there is something wrong with the corporation. Corporate cults cannot admit that things are wrong because that would decrease the value of the corporation for those who are devoted to its existence for their emotional security. So really, you could sub this whole thing and say, narcissists do not tolerate people who aren't fine. If people are not fine, this indicates that there is something wrong with the narcissist. Narcissists cannot admit that things are wrong because that would decrease the value of the narcissist for those who are devoted to their existence for their emotional security. You see how it's all the same? It's all the same. It's literally all the same thing. So to close this right before we go into our live stream, I couldn't help but think of this meme specifically. <laughs> because this is what they want, okay? They want hopeless devotion. They want you to say that this is fine. No matter what is going on around you, even though the building is burning down around you, it's fine. No, it's fine. It's fine. We'll make it through. It's fine. Yeah, it's no big deal. Like, it's fine. <laughs> Don't mind the smoke inhalation. It's fine. We'll be fine. <laughs> Don't mind the neglect that led up to this. You know, it's not time for blaming. Who started it doesn't matter. It's fine. We'll be fine. We're going to go ahead and jump right in and get started. I'm excited because this chapter was really, really, really good. So I feel like every time I read a chapter it, of this particular book, it encompasses everything that I've been trying to tell you guys for a really long time. But this chapter really, really did it. Like this chapter is the thesis. Everything I've been saying was in this book. And I find it so strange because this book was written in 2000. And I just started talking about it in 2016. Obviously, others have been talking about it, researching it for decades. But as far as it becoming a public conversation, this really started recently. So to see so much of what we've been saying in this book is not only confirmation, but it's also very concerning because that means that people were noticing this. I was about to say 18 years ago. It is not 18 years ago. It's 20 years ago now. So people were seeing this 20 years ago. So that's cause for concern. Personally, I think it's starting to reach its peak and not in a good way. I mean, I think it's starting to reach its max levels, meaning we're probably getting ready to see the worst of the worst out of narcissists. So we're going to dive right into our content. Corporate cults, you need to get this book. If you don't have it yet, I think it would really, really be worth your money, uh, regardless of how much you actually pay for it. So for those who are unfamiliar with why we're doing this, why we keep doing this, and why we're determined to finish it to the end, the purpose of our series is to redefine and reshape working and corporate culture to be a place where people can earn an honest living free of harassment and mental duress. We are doing this because it's important. We are doing this because everybody is not going to be an entrepreneur. Everyone is not going to open their own business. That would be ideal. That would be novel. That would be great. But the truth is everyone is not going to. And even if you do, chances are you're going to need employees if you want to do anything meaningful because you only have two hands and 24 hours in a day. And while you can maximize that and you can get a lot out of those 24 hours, you can get so much more done with more people. So at the end of the day, as far as it seems currently, we are going to always have employers and employees that could change in the future. Who knows what might change? But as far as right now, we are always going to have this. So while we do, it should be a place that is not where you go to be mistreated. Like if you go somewhere to be mistreated, it should be voluntary. We won't get into what that could be or possibly look like. 
But if you want to be mistreated, it should be voluntary, not involuntary, especially considering we all need money and those of us who are willing to work for it should not be punished for that. So that's kind of the purpose of this whole entire thing. Did a, I'm going to do a lot of reading from this chapter because it was just too much to put on slides. It was way too much. So let's begin, okay? This was a viewer submission. So if you're not sure what you're looking at here on your screen, you're looking at a seamless soundproof office phone booth, rethinking the modern workplace through affordable, sustainable, and flexible solutions that make more room for people at work. So let's take a look at what we have here. In the back, we have a grown adult male. That man has a family. Yep, I see a wedding ring. That man has a family. He has kids. He has a house with a yard and two dogs. Look how you guys have this man sitting in this office. Look at that. The picture is slightly deceptive. And if you maybe are a glasses wearer, you may not be able to tell that that is it, that's it. It doesn't extend forward in front of him. So if you can see his laptop, if you see that gray wall behind his laptop, that's it, that is where it stops, okay? So let's talk about the absurdity and the ridiculousness of this all. Meanwhile, sis here is walking in front, strolling. She's having a great day, great conversation. It's absurd. And he's probably some software engineer. He's got some type of job that requires a little bit more than that, guys, okay? So it becomes, the question becomes, you pull people into an enclosed office and make them sit in an open atmosphere only to enclose them again because their basic human needs never went away. They never stopped needing a place to have a private phone call. They never stop needing a place to work on something individually and privately without distraction. They never stop needing that place. Never. And now for $3,495 US dollars, you too can have a seamless soundproof office phone booth. Okay. No, that's not his workspace. It's temporary. So the idea is, so he has another desk in this office. He has another desk. But the idea is when he needs to get away and get some heads down focused work, this is where he goes. <laughs> On this thread, I found a quote in this chapter that fit perfectly with this picture. And I was so happy that I found it in time and not after the fact. But the quote is now off to the right. If you just look off to the right of your screen, <laughs> it says personal space is an important concept in developing individual identity. Corporate cult leaders know instinctively that depriving members of this personal space is an important first step in the culting process. And that's on page 138 of the chapter we're getting ready to go over. So yeah, I'm a germaphobe, real bad, really bad. But I feel like any CEO worth their weight would be a germaphobe also because they would be able to process the cost of sick employees. You already want them here every day. You're shoving them in teeny tiny little office booths to do their work, to get away from everybody. So you know there's so much cross-contamination. I would hire a team to clean all day. And I don't mean walking around taking out trash bags. I mean clean all day. They're wiping down handles, door handles, desks, countertops. So yes, personal space is an important concept in developing individual identity. Corporate cult leaders know instinctively that depriving members of this personal space is an important first step in the culting process. Cue the open office. Chapter seven, charismatic leadership. Let's jump right in. This one is good, y'all. This is very, very good. So right away, straight away on page 124, says the volunteer nature of the emotional corporate cults of the new century demands a very different leadership style. Members join the organization freely and are given a great deal of freedom within the broad confines of the corporation. So what that is basically saying is that initially when you first get there, you think, oh my God, I've hit the jackpot. Ooh, this is it. Like I have so much autonomy. There's a buzzword for you. I have so much autonomy. I have so much freedom. You know, my boss is so cool. My coworkers are so cool. 
yeah, if you find yourself saying that, like on the first day, you might want to run. You might want to rethink your decision. Everyone's so cool. How do you know that? You just met them. But everyone's so cool. Okay. That might be part of that false freedom that is characteristic of culted organizations. But we won't, we won't jump to conclusions just yet. Let's dive a little deeper and see what else we have. So furthering that thought on page 124, they don't feel culted, but they are because they are following a charismatic leader who appeals to their emotions. So in regard to those leaders appealing to emotions, it says that they often appeal to positive emotions, but not always. They may also appear to appeal to fear, uncertainty, and insecurity, to name just a few that are not positive. So in other words, yeah, they're going to appeal to your desire to have fun and be happy and everything's great, but they also, the flip side of the coin is that they might appeal to fear, uncertainty, and insecurity, just to name a few. And that's that weird flip. That's that weird, oh my God, what happened? Everything was going so well, what happened? We talked about this before in other videos. That's what's happening. They're appealing now to your other emotions. Initially, they were appealing to your, your need for acceptance and belonging and community and friends and family. And then once you get in there, they start appealing to fear and self-doubt and insecurity and instability. They start appealing to those things. And that's how they keep you netted because a lot of people will then attempt to recapture those initial positive feelings that this person had about them. Like, oh, I, I'm going to prove them wrong. I'm going to prove them wrong. I don't know why they started thinking that, but I'm going to prove them wrong. Love bomb and discard. Exactly. Long leash, tight noose. Exactly. Hey, maybe even an electric fence <laughs> where you think you're free, but there's definitely an electric fence there. Comment says it's like promoting psychopathy and ASPD. You have no idea. Oh, we're getting ready to get into it, y'all. I hope some of you have this book. First, I want to make sure everyone knows what the definition of charismatic means or is. Adjective, exercising a compelling charm, which inspires devotion in others. Similar, charming, fascinating, full of personality, strong in character. So that is what charismatic means, full of charisma, okay? People are drawn to them, charismatic leaders. Now let's dive headfirst into this. This part was so long that I couldn't, I couldn't do slides for it. I couldn't. So he goes into the 10 standard, this is standard level stuff. This is basic. Standard group mind control techniques. He says leaders of traditional cults use a standard group of mind control techniques to ensure group conformity and control. Here is your list of 10. What I'm going to do is read down the list of 10 and then the highlights I made on each, I'll just read through it. So that way we don't have like a hundred slides. Okay. Okay. Standard mind control, submission to leadership, polarized worldview, feeling over thought, manipulation of feelings, denigration of critical thinking, fulfillment can only be realized in the group, the ends justify the means, group over individual, severe sanctions for defection or criticism of the cult, Severing ties with family, friends, goals, and interests. Let's just pause. I'm going to let y'all look at that for a second. So you would read this and be like, oh my God, are we, is this some terrorist organization from overseas? Nope. This is going on in your local corporations, in your statewide and national corporations. This is going on all over the place. This is happening to your friends and family, a lot of whom can't even speak about it because some of them have what we would view as such good jobs that we would never imagine they would have anything to complain about. So my encouragement to you tonight, those of you who are listening, if you have friends or family who come to you with issues and they have quote unquote great jobs, 
And it doesn't matter the dollar amount, but the dollar amount seems to affect us. So if they have six figure jobs, you know, super long titles, all these credentials, and they come to you with an issue and you brush it off. You say to them, don't complain. People would kill to have your job. Anyone would love to have your job. And what they might be trying to tell you is that they're going through this right here and they don't know how to speak out about it. And then I, I'm going to do a video on this someday. And that video is called Simplistic Advice. The whole title is Narcs Give Simplistic Advice because they do. Because a lot of people will give the simplistic advice of, oh, just work a little harder or, oh, just talk to them. Right. Oh, I wouldn't pay it any attention. I would just put my head down and do my work. Okay. You think it's that easy, don't you? You think these people actually allow you to keep to yourself. That's what you're not getting. And honestly, that's not, that's what I wasn't getting in my early career is that me keeping to myself is not viewed as a positive thing. You are to be with the group at all times. Your thoughts are with the group. Your actions are with the group. Your heart, your mind, and your soul are with the group at all times. What is this individual thing? What are you talking about? Let's go down this list. Submission to leadership. So I think that's pretty uh, straightforward. I didn't highlight anything there. So let's skip to the polarized worldview. I pretty much highlighted this whole entire thing. So I'm going to read it. I put extremists. And again, language is important. People will read that word and think I'm talking about the terrorist organizations, you know, that are constantly fighting or being fought against in countries all over the world. That's not what I'm talking about. When I say extremists, I mean extremes, one extreme or the other. 180, you're on one end of the side or the other. You know, it's either up or down, left or right, black and white, extremists, polarized. There's no gray area. There's nothing in between for extremist people. They're very extreme. Okay. So that's what that means. All right. So with that context, let's read this. Polarized worldview. The group is good. Everything else is bad. This is called either or thinking. And it is prevalent in children. By early adulthood, most people gain a better understanding of the shades of gray of life and adopt a dialectic style that allows good and bad elements to be considered at the same time. Some people who are raised in strict environments, religious or otherwise, fail to make this important change and thus are good candidates for corporate cults. Often they are very competitive people whose only means of seeing relationships between organizations is to visualize their own company as good and the competition as bad. Okay. Y'all, I feel like we've stumbled upon a larger issue that hasn't quite been fleshed out yet. Yes, we've defined narcissism and we, we're still picking it apart, but I think we're starting to get a very good handle on what it is. But there's something else going on. And the only thing that I can describe it as is an adult mind that never fully matured. An adult human whose mind never matured ever. And it seems to actually be stuck in like the childish, preteenish type years, but actually a little, a little bit lower. It's in the, it's in the years where kids can't rash, um, they can't reason yet. So it either is or it isn't. I don't know what age that would be. Would that be age two, three? At what age do children not have the, they can speak, but they don't have the ability to reason yet. That's what we're dealing with, you guys. It, it's like a separate thing from narcissism almost. It's like a feature of narcissism. This, mind, this adult mind that never grew up. It goes beyond immaturity. Arrested development is a great, that's great. I think that's great. I think you're onto something there. We're getting closer to it right there. It's almost like malignant arrested development, mad. We're going to call it the mad disease. Malignant arrested development is what it is. And this paragraph here really grabbed that. This is called either or thinking, and it is prevalent in children. 
By adults, most people gain a better understanding of the shades of gray of life and adopt a dialectic style that allows good and bad elements to be considered at the same time. It's the inability to hold two things at the same time that is so interesting to me. We're calling it mad, malignant arrested development, okay? So yes, so moving on to number three, feeling overthought. I thought this was interesting because we came to this conclusion earlier as we were going through this. It says people join specialist collections because they want deeper involvement in the organization. So those would be your cults. Rational people join a collection of specialists because they want to concentrate on the task. And the fact that wanting to concentrate on the task at hand is deemed a bad thing by these individuals should tell us everything that we need to know. Because isn't the task what gets us all paid? Isn't what we're doing, isn't the action that we're taking and engaging in, isn't that producing something that produces profit? So the fact that you would be more focused on basically having your own personal adult, adult daycare, really, than actually executing on tasks that bring you more money, that should tell you everything you need to know. That's a fool. That's a true fool, among other things. But I just think that I just find it fascinating that there's even a difference at all. But there is. So number four, manipulation of feelings. That was kind of talking about the transmission of the culture to new recruits, how peer pressure is used, things of that nature. Then the denigration of critical thinking. Let's stop here for a second. Oh, this sentence. I should have made a slide for this one, but I, I just... I didn't. It says this can go as far as characterizing any independent thought as selfish and rational use of intellect as evil. So I saw the words communism and socialism or something pop up. And that's it's he get he gets into that actually a little bit. But I think it's so interesting how for a country that's so anti-communism and anti-socialism, a country that is that way does not realize how deeply they engage in it on a daily basis. Isn't that interesting? This is what it is. And it's like, I guarantee you, there are some super extreme organizations in our country who think that they are anti this and anti that and you know whatever, but they are actually following the playbook. You're actually following the communist playbook. They are what they claim to hate. Isn't that called um, cognitive dissonance or is it something different? When you can't even see like the very thing about you that you claim to hate about someone else, you are and you engage in and you participate in and you prop up and you allow to happen, you facilitate it every day, but you claim to be against this type of stuff. So the rational use of intellect is evil and independent thought is selfish. And doesn't it feel like that's the country we're living in right now? The rational use of intellect is evil and independent thought is selfish. That's where we are. And that's kind of frightening that we boiled it down to this. We have a bunch of mad people, wait, malignant, malignantly arrested development people who believe intellect is evil and independent thought is selfish. What are we supposed to do with that? Projection. I think that was the word I was looking for. Thank you. So, yeah. So let's move on. Six, fulfillment can only be realized in the group. It says corporate cult members are encouraged to stay at home with the corporate family. And reading that sentence gave me chills up my spine because I just, oh, God, I remember like they want you to be around them all the time. I used to joke with my friends who wouldn't work at certain companies. Like, I feel like they just want me to sit on their lap and just rock me. Like, that's what I feel like. I feel like if I just went and just sat on their lap and they just folded their arms around me and we just kind of rock back and forth for about an hour, I feel like they would be really fulfilled as people it would make them really, really happy inside. And I'd have to sit there and act like I liked it too. And the more I enjoyed it, the happier they'd be. That's what it feels like. They just want to sit with you on their lap and just rock you. So where were we? Seven, the ends justify the means. Any action or behavior is justifiable as long as it furthers the group's goals. 
In the movie Primary Colors, a fictionalized Bill Clinton is played by John Travolta. This movie came out in 1998, by the way. In the capstone scene of the closing act, he justifies to a staffer his campaign's multiple gross breaches of ethics by explaining that if he didn't break the rules, the other party would win and that would be a catastrophe. The staffer changes his mind about leaving the campaign. He stays with the corporate cult, which believes it can make its own rules because winning the campaign is a greater good than the rules being broken to accomplish the good. The campaign has to be unethical to build the kind of America it knows will be right for other Americans. It is willing to do wrong for a right cause. This is a totally unsupportable ethical position that is based only on relativism and denies that any absolute truth exists. The corporate cult creates whatever version of truth will produce the end it wants to achieve. So in other words, they just make stuff up. If it'll help them accomplish whatever their mission is, they'll lie, cheat, steal to accomplish those goals because to them, winning is more important than anything else. I feel like we've had this conversation before. We are in deep trouble, you guys. <laughs> and here's the other thing. I meant to say this during the disclaimers. Here's the other reason we're doing this. For those who are listening who might be like, well, I'm self-employed or I'm retired or I have a great job with a great boss. I'm not going through this. So this is not relevant to me. I promise you it is. I promise you it is because it's happening in politics. But more than that, let's push politics to the side for a second. It's also happening to all of your favorite goods, products and services. They are all run by corporations. So have you ever had something that you really enjoyed and then they stop making it? Or even worse, they change it, like they change an ingredient and makes it awful and you don't want it anymore? That happened because of somebody's potentially idiotic decision. You know, taste is an opinion. But my point is, if they make a decision that's so awful that half they lose half of their customer base, that was a bad decision. You know, and that could be disputed or analyzed with data. That was a bad decision. You lost 75% of your customer base when you changed that ingredient. It's happening to your favorite goods, products, and services. Some of your favorite TV shows. Have you ever had a TV show that started off really great, then ended up really, really crappy? Like the end was just absolutely awful. I guarantee you it's because it fell apart in the writer's room because the writer's room probably is filled to the brim with narcissists. And when they first start the show, they're able to attract real talent because real talent likes to work on things, new things, new projects. And then especially if you start to see success, the talent wants to say and contribute to that success. But once you let the narcissist start to run this little program that we're looking at here on the screen, once you let them start to run the program, you drive out your best talent. They'll flee. And then if they're friends with other talented people, they'll tell their friends and their friends won't take your jobs. And all that leaves these people are the scraps. So they take the scraps, they pay them less than the talented writers. And before you know it, your favorite show has tanked. Tanked. It's gone. And you're like, how could a show like this end up like this? This is how. Because talented people with self-respect are not going to tolerate this type of treatment or behavior. They leave. And the only people who are left are the people who will bow and nod to leadership and agree to stupid plot lines, ridiculous character development, people who won't challenge the, the writers at all. Because the thing about it is you can have a great idea and you can carry it pretty far. Other people add like seasoning. But yeah. That's what happens to your favorite TV shows. This right here. Narcissists infiltrate and they ruin everything. Let's move on. Group over individual. The group's concerns supersede an individual's goals, needs, aspirations, and concerns. 
You move as one unit. You are no longer an individual. So again, remember when we talked a couple live streams ago about how it seems they want to marry you? These people want to marry you. And that's what marriage is. Marriage is I'm no longer an individual. You're no longer an individual. We are one. We are a unit. We move as a unit. We make decisions as a unit. We're a team now. We are one person now. One person, spiritually, legally, one person. So these companies want to marry you. And that is so inappropriate <laughs> for so many different reasons. You do not owe marriage to your company. You don't because you don't owe your life to them. Somebody will swoop in and say, oh, yes, you do. They pay you. They did not give birth to you. You do not owe your life to them. So they pay you right now. Temporarily, they're contributing to your life, but you do not owe your life to them. They did not rescue your life and they did not give birth to you. These people want to marry you. They want to merge with you and become one with you <laughs> fully. And the thing about it is, if it were a healthy marriage, it could almost, almost be argued that that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's still a bad thing because you're still a human being. You're still an independent, a freestanding person. You are not a company. But if the marriage is healthy, at least your enmeshment is positive and a happy experience, but you're still enmeshed nonetheless. Don't ever get that confused. So let's move on. Number nine, severe sanctions for defection or criticism of the cult. He says, this can even apply to negative or critical thoughts about the group or its leaders. When people leave your organization, do they stay in touch with colleagues from your company? If they do, your corporation is probably not very cultish. If they don't, you may be in a corporate cult. Leaders of corporate cults make sure that all ties with defectors are cut. Leaders of corporate cults make sure that all ties with defectors are cut. How dare you go against us? Like, where do these people get off, man? Who raised you? Who do you think you are? <laughs> and I mean that in the literal sense, like who, what name? I need a name. I think I am blank. So I just want to know who these people think they are. Who do they think they are, actually? Which person is what I'm asking? Which person, which entity occupies you? Who, whom do you think you actually are? So anyway, yeah, all ties with defectors are cut. And if you'll ever notice that, if you actually quit a corporate cult, people you thought were like your besties, people you thought you would probably go into the future with in terms of friendship, you never speak to them again. Never. And my recommendation to you, this is going to sound ice cold, but I mean it. My recommendation to you is when they do finally crawl out of the cult and contact you, have minimal, minimal contact, if, if not no contact at all. That's ice cold, right? That's cold. But let me tell you why. There's a couple reasons. One, typically this person is aware of what's happening to you. And they either say nothing or they do nothing. This is assuming they're not a flying monkey reporting back, right? So they say nothing, they do nothing, they don't speak out, nothing for fear of their own job, which is fair. I put fair in quotes. So they see what's happening to their friend. They say nothing, they do nothing. They don't stand up for you. That's one reason you shouldn't ever speak to them again when they come crawling back. Two, the odds of them now having become a flying monkey are extremely high because they stayed in spite of what they saw happening to you. So that also means they don't think it can happen to them. Why not? Why do they think they're immune? That's cause for concern. So if they defect and quit, who's to say they don't still have ties back to this place to just report out on you, on what you're up to these days so they can report back to their overlords? Because sometimes their overlords will let them go but they keep a leash on their neck. I've seen it happen over and over again. I'll see people quit and they're like, I'm done, I'm finished. And they really quit. They put in their resignation, they pack up their desk, they leave for real. Within two months, they're back. And these are people who were generally very tightly in the circle. And they're like, you know, 
sometimes you just can't let go of the family and it's a family here, you know, and I just wanted to explore and, you know, just kind of spread my wings and just see, I'm not crying. <clears throat> I'm not crying. Oh, I just wanted to see what was out there, you know, and what I found is that <sighs> there's no place like home and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm back. I'm here. And I, and at least two cases. And if I really sat and thought about it really hard, but two for a fact I know of, they quit, left for two months, came back, stayed for like a year, then got fired. Fired. So they got the chutzpah up to quit. The narc overlord yanked their leash and pulled them back. They came back, gave their public speech, their shaming ceremony. So you have to go through your public shaming ceremony. Stay for a year. So it looks like it's forever. And then about a year later, they did not quit. They got fired. Do you understand? Once you walk out of that door, you stay gone. Don't you let these people snatch you back in here for fear. Who are they? Who are they? They are not God. They're not God. And I know some of you don't believe in God. What I'm saying is they are not the highest order. They're not. They are not the highest order. Why are you bowing to them? They are not the highest order. They're not. Who are they? This is going to be number 10, severing ties with family, friends, goals, and interests. It says members are separated from their community by the many corporate sponsored functions described in the next chapters. So I think that was all of them. Yes. So this is the short list. So on this thread, and this is actually in regard to number three, feeling over thoughts. So let me just go back to that one really quick. So this is on page 125. He says, by self-selecting to specialist collections, that produce corporate cults, employees are primed to concentrate on the emotional feeling side of the organization. This is on page 134. It says, perhaps organizational humility should be admired more than organizational narcissism. So once again, narcissism is rearing its ugly head, you guys, in this book, in the year that it was written, which was the year 2000. He's bringing it up and out. But yeah, maybe we should start to admire organizational humility over organizational narcissism. It's concerning. It's concerning that we're, we're celebrating narcissism. But I want to close on this thought. Let me put my book down so I can get serious with you guys. I am concerned after reading this book, considering everything we've talked about and read and everything I've learned over the past few years, I am concerned that you guys don't know what freedom really is. I am concerned people don't know what freedom really is. I'm really concerned about that, y'all. In my second to last live stream credit in the Xanatos Gambit, the people who are okay with that system don't understand what freedom really is. They've given us the illusion of freedom in this country, which is amazing. We are under the illusion of freedom in this country, but we are not actually free, you guys. Not, not as free as you think. Not as free as you think. In a free country, we have to submit to leadership. If you challenge leadership, you're cast out. In a free country, we are constantly at the mercy of extremists, be they at one end or the other. That's not really freedom. We're not really free to do what we want and move how we want to. We're really not. Not like how you think to put feelings over thoughts. So in a free country, we are penalized when we choose to, to use our minds and apply thinking and logic. So we really don't have freedom of thought. We really don't. Denigration of critical thinking. So in a free country, you could lose your job simply for asking a question or challenging something which is what you should want. That's how things get stronger. That's how things improve. Narcissists hate for even you to even have a negative inkling towards their idea. Ends justify the means. So in a free country, we've grown okay with people doing whatever they want, illegal, legal, ethical, unethical, as long as they accomplish their goal at the end of the day. And we've grown okay with that. 
group over individual. So there's your freedom right there. Severe sanctions for defection or criticism of the cult. So we don't have sanctions over here, hypothetically. But if you go against this format, if you go against the group, you are going to get cast out. You're going to be in trouble. I thought this was a free country. I can't defect. I can't kind of like go do my own thing in a legal manner. I have to go along with you and all of your thoughts and your wishes, your wants and your desire. I have no permission to exist, huh? None. I have no permission to exist with you. I think we've actually forgotten what freedom really is. Like freedom is being able to tell somebody, hey, I'm not coming to happy hour tonight because I'm tired and I'm going home and I'm going to sleep. Freedom is being able to say, hey, I'm not coming to happy hour tonight. See you tomorrow. That's adulthood. I could swap out the word freedom with the word adulthood. We don't know what adulthood is. I don't think we actually know how to be adults. An adult would tell another adult, I'm not coming to happy hour with you tonight. See you tomorrow. And it's fine. And in a free country, you would be free to do that and not be punished for it the next day and every day going forward in your career. That is adulthood. Adulthood is saying, hey, I need to take this very important call with this very important client and I cannot do it in this office. I'm stepping out. And if it's the end of the day, I'll see you tomorrow. That is adulthood. We need to have a long conversation about that. I, I might have to do that on a separate stream. What, what is real adulthood? What is true adulthood? True adulthood is not having to ask for permission. <laughs> if you think about it, Really, if we wanted to simplify it to its most simple elements, true adulthood is not having to ask for permission. Period. So this is our corporate cults review. A viewer recommended this book to me about a year or so ago. The overall purpose of why we are doing this is we want to redefine and reshape working in corporate culture to be a place where people can earn an honest living free of harassment and mental duress. We don't believe the workplace is somewhere you have to go get hazed into to earn a paycheck. We're people, we're adults, we just wanna show up, we wanna work, we wanna do everything that's asked of us, and we expect fair treatment in return. And really that's all that there is to it. So what's interesting is now with everything going on, the topic of this chapter being separation from the community. It's interesting now that we've been forced out of the community that was created for us, that community being the corporate culture. So I want to start off with a real life example first before we actually get into the content. This article just came out a few days ago called Husband Praises His Wife for Quitting Her Job. Not One Promise Came to Fruition. It's a very short article. When Kimberly Brown realizes she needed to quit her job, she had the most important person in her corner, her husband, Jacob. I 100% supported her decision, Jacob Brown wrote in a LinkedIn post that went viral. Kimberly had spent more than three years at home caring for the couple's four children and working as a wedding and family photographer. But she decided recently to go back to corporate America. It was going to be part-time, three days a week, for five weeks and then full-time remote position and seemed to be a great fit for work-life balance as we were putting our three-year-old son and eight-month-old daughter into daycare for the first time. Things did not go as planned. His post, which has since been removed at the request of the wife's former company, read, Last week, my wife decided to quit her job. Her last day was Friday. I 100% supported her decision. The company she worked for promised her a good culture, a work-life balance, and time to get up to speed with the work. Not one promise came to fruition. Instead of good culture, there was extreme micromanagement and degradation. 
She was on call 24 seven and chastised for picking our children up from daycare after 5 p.m. Instead of ramp up time, she was patronized for not understanding certain terminology within an industry she'd never touched two weeks into the position. This was not what she signed up for, nor was it the company culture she was promised. Cheers to my wife and all others who have had the courage to take a stand. I stand with you. Fail forward. Jacob Brown said he wrote the post because I knew there were others out there experiencing the same type of treatment and wanted them to know that there is a way out. Most of the time, people stay in bad situations because they believe it's normal. It's not. As for Kimberly Brown, she was comfortable with her husband sharing her experience publicly. I know there are other companies out there, including those who I'm proud to have worked for in the past, that support a work-life balance and have great culture. I know I didn't need to settle, and I want others to know that they don't need to either. That's right, supportive workplace is out there. I'll find it, and so will they. The Howell, Michigan couple said the response was incredibly supportive. I hope this will spark courage in someone who may be dealing with a toxic work environment and decide they want better for themselves. I'm also hopeful that companies that read it decide to provide their employees with a culture they can be proud of. What I really wanted to focus on was the extreme micromanagement, the degradation, and the thing that really stuck out to me for this one was the ramp up time. You guys would be surprised how many companies really expect you to walk in the front door knowing everything. Everything. And as it says here, she was patronized for not understanding certain terminology within an industry she'd never touched two weeks into the position. This is not an exaggeration. So that is the article example that I wanted to show you. The angle that the news took with this particular story was that the husband is so great for praising his wife for quitting. And he, and he is, but I was more hung up on the reasons why she quit, which are actually quite common. The micromanagement, the being degraded, the not giving enough time to learn the work, to learn the process, to learn the company. They want you to know in 30 days, I'm telling you guys. So those of you who might be thinking about going back to work, you know, maybe you took time to have kids, you took time off, whatever. I want you to know what you are facing. You are facing some headstrong, psychotic, aggressive young people who have no rooting in like real understanding. All they know is how to copycat each other and how to follow orders. I mentioned this already in a previous live stream that I'm concerned about my generation. They lost all their courage. It's gone. So they get you in there, they hire you, and it's like the only thing they know how to do is grind, grind, grind down, micromanage, grind, micromanage. If they don't have a problem, they'll figure out a problem to have so they have something to manage. So if you're an older person, and really I use the term older loosely, I mean older in the, in the terms of the workforce. You're going to have a tough time unless you come across some really mature individuals to do your work with. But if you're trying to go into these young tech companies, I'm telling you, they've all lost it. They've lost it. But I think the Coronas might be resetting everything, everything. So, right, they don't even know how to follow rules. Like, it's insane. You want other people to follow rules, but you don't even follow the rules. I don't know where all their training went because I know my generation, we were brought up with like Sesame Street. Where is your Sesame Street? It left them completely in favor of this perceived notion of progress, which truly isn't progress at all as we, as we are seeing. Because if we were really progressing as a society and a community, we wouldn't be in almost total collapse right now. We would already have backup plans to the backup plan. Don't get me started, y'all. I'm trying to stay focused. So chapter eight of Corporate Cults is all about separation from the community. It begins on page 140. So why don't we go ahead and get into it? And again, how ironic that they spend so much time pulling us away from our community and now we are being forced back into it by them. Very interesting. So on page 140, it says, when work becomes life, the individual is in a cult. 
How many times have you seen slide across your social media something to the effect of work is life, living to work, people who have completely devoted their lives to their jobs? Now, a lot of people would argue with me and say, but PTE, we have to work. We have to work. We have to make money to live. But they've forgotten that they were the first reason for the job anyway, meaning their life, their existence is why they're even going to that job. Like when they were born, they weren't thinking about work. That's what we've lost. We're losing our humanity day by day and very, very slowly. So we're losing little bits of our humanity every single day. And we don't even realize how much of it we've handed over to our jobs. The title of this book is Corporate Cults, but really we're talking about any job that requires a cult-like level of devotion from you in order to keep receiving your paycheck, meaning it has nothing to do with how well you've done. It has nothing to do with your work product, your performance, your work ethic. It has everything to do with how well you worship the leaders and the overlords. And the better of a job you do of that, the more likely you will have your job long term. <laughs> and what we're here to say is that is not what we want. We're asking for something different, something very different. So moving on, page 140, it says at work daycare, auto repairs, bookstores, exercise facilities, and parties all bring the employee closer to the organization and further from the community. Things like this, when I was younger, used to really appeal to me. I was like, oh my gosh, if I ever have a baby, to be able to bring my baby to work with me, that would be awesome. Then I can just go check on them and if they need something, I'll be right there. I won't be far away. Man, car repair? Are you serious? I can just go get an oil change and then go straight to work? Just drop my car off on site? Wow, bookstore? You got me at bookstore. You know that. You sold me at bookstore. A gym? Wow, so I can just leave my desk, go to the gym, and then go home. Perfect. I don't have to go anywhere else. Parties? Awesome. Great. I can party with my coworkers? Awesome. Like, this is the way my mind functioned. And if you think about it, look at what every single thing is saying. At work daycare, meaning I'm not going to the daycare outside in my neighborhood. On-site auto repair, so I'm not going to my local auto repair. On-site bookstore, so I'm not going to my local bookstore. On-site gym, so I'm not going to my local gym meeting different people. On-site parties, hey, why do you need to party anywhere else when you can party with us every night at happy hour? So now I'm not partying with the community. So that is kind of the overall point, which brings us to our next slide. The unintended effect is that they separate workers from traditional community relationships and replace them with work relationships as the workplace becomes the only community the employee has. And you'll notice a star in the upper left-hand corner. This is kind of the overall main idea point of this entire live stream that the unintended effect of offering all of these different amenities to your employees is that they separate workers from the traditional community relationships and replace those relationships with work relationships as the workplace becomes the only community that the employee has. And that is the problem, guys. Where is your home base? Like, do you have a home base? Not really. Not when it's been broken and then every time you make a major life change, your community changes. So it's kind of like, how can real friendships ever form? How can people really meet other people to date and marry if their community keeps getting severed every time they make a life break? And the reason that it keeps getting severed every time they make a life break is generally because of this right here. Wherever they are, everything that they need is provided to them. So they no longer have to go outward looking for it. Wherever they are, their community is given to them. Sounds great until you realize, uh-oh, I don't actually have a community anymore. What community do I belong to? It's kind of tragic and it's a little sad if you think about it. It's a little bit sad because 
you basically have all these disconnected individuals living near each other who don't know each other. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's a, it, there's a certain coldness. So this is also on page 140. It says American culture no longer fosters a sense of community. Now, isn't that ironic because we're supposed to be the country that's all about family and community, but our actual culture no longer fosters that. We no longer really have that sense of community anymore. Why? Because everyone is going, going, going. Everyone is working so hard that this pause that we're having right now, this break in action might be the first time a lot of people have taken a break in many, many years. It might be, it's a forced break. And I hope that everyone is taking this opportunity to truly reflect on what's important. Now that people are being forced into their homes, forced to stay there, forced to reckon with everything that's in it and everyone that's in it, if there's someone in there, a lot of people are running from their homes. So I was talking to someone the other day regarding all this that's going on with the virus and stuff. And I was like, oh, you know, I was like, well, I'm sure everyone's pretty happy about working from home. And he goes, yeah, not really. I was like, no, you really? Because my, myself and this individual have had lots of conversations about work. And he was like, yeah, I was thinking about it. He was like, I like to separate my work from my house. He was like, I don't like my work to be in my house. I was like, okay, that's fair. I was like, that's a fair argument. So for him, it's really challenging because now the two worlds are blending. And really his perspective is probably healthy, but some of us really can focus in our homes because our homes are a place of focus and we don't mind blending the two. I think it's all about the option, giving people the option to do either or. If you wanna come in the office, let us know, we'll have a space for you. If not, you're free to work from home, but I feel like you can't force one or the other. Anyway, my point is home for a lot of people is a place that they flee. So they anxiously get up and go to work in the morning because they want to get away from their house for different reasons. There's a lot of different reasons people like, like to and want to flee their homes. So, you know, we're not going to make assumptions about that and we're not going to pass judgment. But in that wanting to flee the home, the sense of community is failing. You understand? Yes, it is like an arranged life. From the comment thread, someone just wrote, it's like an arranged life, absolutely 100%. And it should kind of scare you if you really give it some thought, it should scare you a little bit because what it's actually taking away from you is your autonomy, but you don't see it because it's so subtle and it's so gentle and it's so controlled. People question why the millennials aren't having as many children, why the millennials aren't getting married as frequently. And in addition to it being a financial issue, it's also the issue of we can't, we're already married. Most of us are already married to work and our children are, are our coworkers, bosses, managers, leaders, what have you, customers sometimes. We're already married. So how can we get married to another outside entity when we're actually indeed already married, okay? This is page 143. It says so many suburbs lack community that home buyers are willing to pay a premium to have Disney created for them. So in other words, that magical, wonderful feeling that you should feel when you're driving down your street, you should feel warm and oh my gosh, this is my community. This is my neighborhood. I love this place. But People now sleep in their houses and they used to live in their neighborhoods. And I think another way he could have said this was people now sleep in their houses and they live in their workplaces, which is 100% a true statement. They live in their actual workplaces now. That's where their life is. That's where the parties are. That's where the daycare is. That's where their bank is. That's where their dry cleaner is. That's where the food is. That's where your friends are. That's where your gym is. So that's where your life is. Your life is there. It's so insidious. Yes, it's insidious. Yes. 
Yes, the suburbs lack life energy. Yes, they do. It's so cold. So many of them are so cold. And I can't explain it to you, that coldness, but I think you guys know exactly what I'm talking about. It's a certain coldness that you can't put your finger on. And then if you go in some of these houses, it's even colder. It's so sad. But the reason is because people are just using their houses as places to sleep out of the elements, but they are actually living in their workplaces. So it says, as neighborhoods and towns relinquish the job of providing community, the workplace happily takes it over. Here's how. Daycare, exercise facilities, banking, laundry services, uniforms, bookstores, free food, and sleep pods. You'll see two asterisks there by the free food and the sleep pods because I added those in. So one through six are his, seven and eight I added in. Now I do want to comment on this. I don't ever want to come across as sounding like, oh, she's an ungrateful, spoiled brat. Like she doesn't want any of the stuff that we're giving her. Like, you know, we'll screw her. You know, we're working really hard to do nice things for our employees. And I always have to clarify because I'm always being misconstrued. You all have to understand you're talking to the girl whose eyes lit up over this stuff. Like, oh my God, this is heaven on earth. <laughs> so I'm breaking my own programming. Do you understand? And it's not that these things are bad things, especially not the free food. And I put sleep pods on there because here's the point. There were days when I would go to work and I would be so tired that all I would wish for is just a, a, a room that I could close the door and just take a nap for 10 minutes, just 10 to 12 minutes. Let me close my eyes, doze off, do a quick REM cycle and come back and I'm good for the rest of the day. The point is sleep is for home. So we should have an environment if I have that type of job where I can go to my boss or manager and say, hey, I'm struggling. I'm really in bad shape today. I'm just going to head on home. I don't have any more meetings for the day and I'm all caught up on my projects. So I'm just going to head home. I'm going to take a quick nap and I'll be back on in like 30 minutes. And for that to be okay, for me to be able to check in with my body and say, I can't do this. I'm tired. I'm spent, I'm exhausted, I'm beat, I can't do this. I, I need to rest my body. I'm an adult, I'm responsible. I don't have any meetings, nothing is due, everything is caught up. I need to go home and take a little quick nap because who knows, maybe I'm in the process of catching a virus. So what if I get to work and then suddenly I'm like, God, I feel fatigued, why am I so fatigued? And I'm like, hey, I'm gonna head home. I don't know what's wrong, but I'm really tired. And what if me making that decision prevents me from spreading whatever I have to my coworkers because remember, you are the most contagious when you're not showing symptoms. So what if the first symptom is fatigue? And I'm like, oh, I need to go. I should be able to have an environment where I can go and it's fine if I have that type of job, you understand? So that's what I mean by sleep is for home. It's awesome to have sleep pods, especially for people like doctors, nurses, firefighters, people who work overnight shifts, who can't just leave and go home and come back or leave and go home and hop on the internet. I do think this needs to be woven into our working lifestyle some, somehow, but the point is these things are for home. Sleeping is for home. Your meals are for home. <laughs> On-site laundry, on-site banking, on-site exercise, on-site daycare. Don't leave the site. So now I can see where I've gotten myself in trouble in the past a little bit because I would go get the free food at lunchtime and then I would leave. <laughs> I'd go fix myself a plate and then I'd cover it with foil and leave and enjoy my, the rest of my 45 minutes of my lunch break. Sometimes I would just go to my car if I lived close enough, I would just go home and I would eat my food until it finally occurred to me that you're supposed to eat that here. The goal is for you to eat it here with us. You're not supposed to leave. Who said anything about leaving? You're not supposed to walk out of the door with your free food. You're supposed to eat it here. And I'm like, but it's, it's lunchtime. Well, yeah, but I mean, you know, we eat together and 
you know, we talk and catch up and I'm like, so when do you actually take a break? Like, I feel like, like my naivete just rubs against all this cult, cult nature. Cause and that's an honest question. Like, okay. So if we, we've been working all morning together, we're eating lunch together. And then we'll be working all afternoon. When do we actually take a break? The answer to my question is never. We never take a break. <laughs> okay, let's keep going. Again, kind of reiterating the point, napping, birthday parties, gifts, dry cleaning, and dinner. Do these sound like activities best performed at home or at the workplace? And when he put it like this, I was like, dang, now I really see it. Napping, birthday parties, gifts, dry cleaning, dinner. Is this best for home or the workplace? This is home stuff. This is stuff we're supposed to be doing at home, not, not at work. And again, it's great for companies that actually really try to show their employees that they appreciate them, but they're not pushing their employees away enough. And what I mean by that is this is all well and good, but they're not encouraging employees to go out and remember their own life enough. Hey, okay, we do free food Monday through Thursday, Friday. Please leave the office and go out, go out into the community and get food and network and talk to people out of the office. Go home if you want to. Hey, for your birthday party, why don't you invite some of your friends to the office? If, if, if you have to be here, you know what I mean? Hey, to celebrate your birthday, why don't you invite some of your friends here? But this slide made me think of something. So <laughs> napping, birthday parties, gifts, dry cleaning, and dinner. Do these sound like activities best perform at home or at the workplace? It made me think of this. Maybe this is why people keep getting themselves in trouble at work. And what I mean is in trouble in terms of inappropriate relationships with the opposite gender. Maybe because their whole life is at work. They sleep at work, they eat at work, they shop at work. They bank at work. Everything is at work. They party at work. So what is home? If you're getting all your needs fulfilled at work, what is home to you but a place to sleep? So maybe this is why people keep finding themselves in trouble because literally the company has completely absorbed their whole entire life. And again, like I said before, I think a lot of them mean well. I actually don't think a a lot of them have enough strategy to plan out a cultish type indoctrination system. I don't think they're that strategic. I really don't. I think culting happens when you don't have critical thinkers in the mix. I think human beings naturally default to a culted state and naturally desire to be culted when you don't have an abundance of critical thinkers in the room, when you don't have an abundance of people with an inner voice, when you don't have an abundance of people with a clear definition of self, you run the chance of just becoming a cult. I think it just happens when there's emptiness inside for the most part. So anyway, I digress. It is very unhealthy. And the thing about it is you, you don't see it at first because it looks so fun. Like your first day, you're given things. Some people get a jacket, pins, cups, bags. Some companies actually give really nice things. They don't go the cheap route. They actually invest in their employees on the front end. Brand new laptops, brand new equipment. That's nice. Then there's a party every other week for something. There's always food here. Food is always flowing. Cake is always flowing. Oh, wow, they just installed nap pods. I can go take a little nap. Like, it sounds like so much fun, guys. But the problem is you cannot forget yourself. You cannot forget your own life. You can't. And so many of us have forgotten our own lives to the extent that now that we are being forced to stay home, people are going stir crazy and losing their minds. They don't know what to do. And I'm like, clean up. Do your laundry, take a nap, take a nap, clean up, do your laundry, plan, purge something, do some yard work if you have a yard, take advantage of this time. They never give it. 
it had to be forced on them. Take advantage of this time because you'll probably never, ever, ever get it again. But you cannot forget your life because what what are you without your job? So a lot of people right now have jobs in industries that if they're not open, there's no work, literally. So some people are fortunate in that they can take their laptop home and continue on work. Everyone's job doesn't work that way. For example, what are the school bus drivers doing right now? What are the cafeteria staff that work in these schools? What are they doing right now? For all the flights that are being canceled, you know, in all the different countries that are being kind of shut off, what are all the pilots doing right now? So who are you outside of your job? And that is the one thing I can say about myself. I always held on to who I was. And I had a lady tell me on my last one of the jobs that I left, I think she meant it as a compliment. Sometimes I think it was a backhanded compliment, but then other times I'm like, maybe she was just telling you how she really feels. And she said, you know what? You stayed true to yourself the whole entire time. And there was a part of me that took it as a backhanded compliment because I was under a lot of cult pressure at that job. A lot of cult pressure. That's the job where we had to go to the cabin in the woods. For those of you familiar with that story, yeah, one of our team building activities was an overnight stay at a cabin in the woods, in the mountains. And long story short, I bailed out of there, okay? I can't remember what live stream it is or how it's titled, but basically that's the long story short. The team building activity was an overnight stay in a cabin in the woods up in the mountains and I wasn't with it and I left. So that would be an example of me staying true to myself. And she said it and I, you know, I waffled between did she really mean it from her heart or was it backhanded? But either way, I took it as a compliment. I take it as a compliment mainly, even if she means it backhanded or meant it backhanded. She said, you stay true to yourself the whole entire time. And I think I looked at her and I said, thank you. Thank you. That is one of the nicest things anyone has ever said to me. Thank you. And I'm laughing because if she meant it as a backhanded compliment, it's like, this bee is crazy. I just basically tried to insult her and she said, thank you. People who operate rationally in all three circles, work, family, and community, have the opportunity to experience different sides of their being. So this is kind of what I mean by you cannot forget your life. You have different sides to your being. And so many of us have been handed off for so long to other people, we've never really had an opportunity to experience ourselves. So what I mean by that is, you started in the care, custody, and control of your parents or family unit or living situation as a young person. Then when you turned 18, most of you got handed off to a school, a trade school, or the military, one of those three. You got handed off to their care, custody, and control. Then depending on you know how that worked, we'll just assume it all went well. Some of you stayed in the military, so you remain in their care, custody, and control. Some of you went to college, graduated, and then you were handed off from the college to your employer and there you shall remain as you're handed off from employer to employer to employer, so forth and so on. You all understand the point that I'm making. Generally, most of us have been taught to allow ourselves to be handed off to the next person. So then many of you will then go and super complicate your lives by getting married. So now, no matter who you're working for, you're always in the care, custody, and control of that other person. And I mean that for men and women. Because no matter what, every decision you make is tethered to that person. Care, custody, and control. So most of you, a lot of you, never had an opportunity to experience the little bit of life that was yours, strictly yours. Which is why I'm such a firm advocate for people prior to them getting married, having lived alone for a little bit. Live alone for at least a year. You have to. You have to live alone so you can understand what your cleaning standards are, your food standards, your temperature standards, your sleeping standards, your noise standards. You have to figure that stuff out on your own because if you don't, you will figure it out when you marry that person. 
that's when you'll discover it. Like, oh, wow, I actually really like my house kind of cold. I didn't realize that before until now he keeps it on 80 in the summer to save money on the electric bill, even though we have money. It's little things like that. You won't figure out until you live with someone else. So how can you advocate for yourself if you don't even know who yourself is? That's like an attorney sitting down with a client they've never met before, haven't reviewed the case, don't know anything that's going on. And now that attorney has to speak on behalf of that client, not knowing who they are at all. It's the exact same thing. When you attempt to keep blending your life with other people and you've never had a chance to get to know yourself, how can you advocate for yourself? You can't, you don't know yourself. You don't know her. So you have to experience the different sides of your being. So when I was heavy into corporate, I was desperate to get home at all times because that was my oasis. That was the one place that I could truly be myself, kind of move at my own pace, move at my own beat. And I cherished it and I craved it. And what I realized is that I worked with a lot of people who had already given that up long time ago. So they don't have alone time. They don't have quiet time. There's no such thing as downtime for them. So because there's no such thing as downtime for them, there's not going to be any such thing as downtime for me. They'll be damned if I have downtime, if they don't have any. And I told you guys a couple live streams ago, one of my coworkers, we were doing a getting to know you thing. And she just flat out said to me, I'm jealous of you because she was in quite, she was asking me questions. I wasn't volunteering. She was like, are you single? Yes. Do you have kids? No. Wow. So you're just single with no kids, just living life. Well, I mean, if you put it that way, yes. Oh, wow. I'm jealous of you. I'm like, well, damn, you made yourself jealous because I wasn't talking about that. You brought all this up, but it was a peek into the mind of how they think. So I say all that to say for young people who may be listening, Give yourself a chance to be on your own for just a little bit, okay? Just a little bit. Give it like a year or two. No roommates. You have to pay your bills by yourself because that is the only way you will ever come to appreciate money. It's the only way you will ever grow to appreciate money. If you're constantly splitting bills, in the back of your mind, there's always a cushion there. You need to live life with no cushion for a couple years. It'll change your perspective on everything, everything. It will change your perspective on everything when you live life with no cushion. On page 158, it says, in the early stages of culting, it is critical that no one break rank because a small hole in the dike could cause a flood of defections. At later stages in the culting process, individuals can be trusted not to bolt. But in the early stages, bolting is a great concern. They have to make sure that no one defects in the early stages of the process because one defector can lead to multiple defections. <laughs> so they're monitoring constantly for signs of defection. However, once you cross that hurdle, you're not going anywhere. And they can fling the door wide open for you and you won't run. We are continuing on our review of corporate cults. We are now on chapter 10, finally, which is all about independence. And it's very weird because I didn't plan this, but it seems like all the chapters seem to line up in time just right to what something that we're going through in society currently. So I think that's interesting. This show is all about independence. The purpose of us doing all of this is to redefine and reshape working and corporate culture, to be a place where people can earn an honest living, free of harassment and mental duress, and where individuals can be treated as autonomous, freestanding adults with respect to relevant rules, okay? That's kind of our overall purpose, because if you don't ever talk about something, it has the ability to just keep going on and on as is, with no, no changes ever being applied to it. Now, what's interesting is during the course of this entire series, the whole world has kind of changed as a result of, I have to say the situation to keep the algorithm happy. The situation that shut down the whole world uh, back in March up until now still really has really kind of 
gotten people thinking differently about work and what's important and things of that nature. So like I do, or like I have done with the other streams, I wanna set a little bit of real life context and share this article with you really quick before we get into the context, which is, or the content, which is that of chapter 10, Independence. We're gonna look at this article really quick so this article was actually published a while, a couple of weeks ago. It says, imagining a better life after the situation. This crisis is revealing the limits of America's religious devotion to work and showing us that a more fulfilling future is possible. And if you'll remember when this whole thing started, when I first started talking about it, I was like, this is great. People are home with their children and their families and their pets. You know, we have an opportunity here to really grab this moment and say, what have we been doing? Because I was kind of harping about just work-life balance in general, you know, and workplace culture long before the situation hit. So this was finally our opportunity. And I feel like it passed so many people by. So many. As soon as the propaganda started up about, oh, this is not supposed to be it and, you know, let us out, give us free, people forgot this part. Like they totally overlooked that you just had an opportunity to have a slice of your life back and you didn't want it. So what are you telling the universe? Let's read this article. This was written on April 1st, 2020. Last week, I posed an admittedly taboo question to my followers on Twitter. Is anyone enjoying this? Any parents in particular, are there any ways your life is better in this situation? I was surprised by the response from more than 30 workers around the country and across the world. Perhaps enjoy was the wrong word they fairly noted, but they did find something positive in their new reality. I do not enjoy the forest, but I love my little trees. Others use the words lovely and wonderful. They're not commuting. They're spending more time with their kids. They're getting more exercise. And I'm adding this one in there. They're also cooking more. A lot of people have started cooking more for many reasons. One, a lot of restaurants and things for a brief time were either closed or you know, had some really weird restrictions. So food wasn't quite as accessible. A lot of people have started cooking more because they're freaked out and weirded out. And their thought process now is, well, with all this going on, how do I know the people preparing my food down the street and across the bridge are practicing health and safety standards. How do I know people aren't in the kitchen coughing? You see what I mean? And I think I'm good. I think I'll make my own food at home. So there's a variety of reasons. Other people just have now have the time to try new recipes and things. The spread of the novel situation has utterly changed work in America. Most important, the situation has put millions out of a job. Untold millions are taking pay cuts or juggling childcare and homeschooling or enduring immense pressure to continue low wage work in spite of the risks. Delivery drivers, warehouse stockers, pharmacy assistants, supermarket cashiers and others are being worked to the bone to sustain our mass self-isolation. There is no silver lining in the situation for these Americans. But for some Americans, thanks in part to the workers above, conditions are actually better than they were before. There is less pressure and more flexibility. Once the situation subsides and we grieve everyone and everything we have lost, we should not go back to our normal way of working. We need to preserve the best parts of our new work experience and make them accessible to all, especially those who are being hit the hardest by the crisis. One father of three young children who works for a nonprofit in the DC area told me that working from home has allowed for a more equitable split of domestic labor with his wife, who is also working from home. I don't have two and a half hours of daily commute anymore. She doesn't have to cook and entertain the kids at the same time, he said. Since he's always home now, he cooks. They block out time to be with their children or, as they did recently, play guitar in front of the neighbor's houses so their kids could dance and sing along. I'm actually not going to read the rest of this because <laughs> I want to get into our other content. But let's, why don't we read the last couple paragraphs here? 
It will take policy changes, of course, including mandatory paid time off, higher wage floors, universal health care, and greater recognition of the right to organize. But these alone will not be enough to make post-pandemic working life more humane for all. We will also need to change the moral status of work to displace it as our highest duty. That will require a revolution ultimately more radical than anything being proposed in American politics today. But it will necessarily happen more subtly over time for it requires not merely reforming our society, but shifting the big ideas and small habits that shape our roles in it. The revolution may already be under, underway right now, even as we fear for each other's lives. One woman who is newly working from home told me her household is mayhem now, but she still managed to find a moment that would have been impossible a few weeks ago. I just lay on a blanket in the backyard with my three-year-old, naming what shapes we saw in the clouds, she said. It was marvelous. Many people have found and reclaimed the life that they had completely forgotten existed because they had given their whole life over to work. They become slaves to their organization. So that's kind of been the whole entire point of this whole entire series. And in many ways, the point of the channel as well, because it's not so much that work consumed so much of their life as when they try to reclaim their life back it becomes a problem because many workplaces have become cults. So you are not allowed to show individuality or express yourself in a way that identifies you as different from the cult. That is the new problem. I don't think a lot of people have a problem with necessarily working hard if that's what the job calls for if that's just the nature of the work. The problem that we're having is having to now also sign over our soul as part of the working contract. That's what we're trying to eradicate. And especially during these times now, we're having all these discussions about inequality and things like that. This is part of how you eradicate that. You strip this layer of cultedness from the work experience and it becomes far more objective versus subjective, meaning we're evaluating you off of your performance on the things that we hired you for and nothing else. So it says her ability to quit her job indicated a great deal of independence from organizational life, page 177. So I'm starting off with that quote because I thought it says her, but it could be his, his or her ability to quit their job indicates a great deal of independence from organizational life. Now, those of you who have been with me for a long time know that I will quit a job. It's nothing. I've quit very good jobs because to me, once I see that I'm not respected in spite of showing respect, that I'm not heard or heard out, once they start to engage in the macro and micro aggressions, and I do everything in the professional adult way to resolve it, and I see that it can't be resolved, oh, I'll quit because I'm not tolerating that long term. You're not going to abuse me. You're not going to bully me. You're not. Now, I will move through all the proper channels first, but once I see that it's a lose-lose situation for me, I'm out. I'll quit a job. I've quit very good jobs. And it speaks a lot to I believe my independence as a person, but it has a lot to do with self-respect and dignity also. But the point that he's making with this quote is there are people out there who cannot quit their job. There are people out there who've been on the same job that they had since they got hired back when they were like 18. And here's the thing, there's not necessarily anything wrong with that. If that person is getting trained, if they're getting respected, if they're paid fairly, if they're progressing through the organization in a logical manner that makes sense and kind of moves with time, then they just might've gotten lucky. They got on with a good company young and they stayed until they retired. That's very rare these days, understand that. But there are people who are simply with the first company that hired them because they are terrified to leave, terrified. And that's kind of what this whole chapter is about. So let's keep going. 
Page 177 says employees of corporate cults expect to receive money, vacation, status, friends, encouragement, medical benefits, and professional esteem from the corporation. So in many ways, what they are expecting to receive is everything from the job, everything that we're really supposed to be getting from life. Do you understand? So basically, here's another way to look at it. If this job weren't offering these things, would you still be able to give yourself those things? Or are you still giving yourself those things in spite of the job or not? Whether or not the job is present is the question. Do you have a side hustle? Do you have a plan B? Do you have a savings account or something? Is this your only source of income? If so, that's really foolish, really foolish. As you can see, if the past couple of months have taught us nothing, it has taught us that you really shouldn't place your 100% trust in your company, no matter how good they are, because there are companies that are closed right now because they had to close by law. So some of them are hanging on by a thin thread. Others are going out of business because if there's no money coming in, you can't run your business. So that should teach everybody the lesson that I should not rely on this one thing solely, no matter how good it's going. And as a matter of fact, the better it's going, the more money I want you to save. <laughs> the better it's going, the more I want you to start investing in your side business. Because the better it's going, the higher the likelihood that you believe that this is it and you're gonna put your all your eggs in this one basket. So I'm here to say the better your job is going, the more I want you to invest in your emergency fund. Vacation, are you getting all your vacations from your job or are you able to give vacations to yourself? Do you have status outside of work? Do you have friends outside of work? Do you get encouragement from any other place other than your workplace? Medical benefits right now in America is kind of a given. They're attached to our employers. We're trying to detach medical benefits from our employers for this very reason. Think about all the people who had health insurance until their business was forced to close. And then the business is like, hey guys, you didn't do anything wrong. I'm so sorry, but we can't afford to just keep paying you and paying your health insurance. We don't have any money coming in. So they either got cut, let go or whatever. So now there's a lot of people sitting around with no health insurance because it was attached to their job. It's silly. It's a silly system. So let's keep going. Corporate cults like the dependence because it binds the employee closer to the organization for financial and emotional support. So what this was talking about in this particular section was the people who can be culted are very, very dependent on their organizations and corporate cults know this. So what this made me think of are the more vulnerable populations of people, the people who are coming from poverty. They're vulnerable, desperate, and dependent. But it's not just them. It's also your everyday average American who they know, hmm, this person doesn't really have a lot of job prospects. There's not really a lot of hope for this person's future. So we're gonna let them work here and make them feel like this is the best thing that's ever happened to them and the best thing that ever will happen to them. And in that, we can control them to a great deal because they will be afraid to leave because they will be convinced there's nothing else they can ever do. And this is the best thing that can ever possibly happen to them. That's why you often see people accept low wages and you wonder how. You know, that's a simple minded person. That's the first thing they'll say. Oh, well, if you don't like your low wages, just leave. You don't understand that a lot of those low wage employees are really subject to a lot of mental abuse because they know that they can they can get away with it because they've convinced this particular individual you can't do any better than this. Doesn't that sound like a, an abusive relationship, a domestically abusive one? Hey, you can't do any better than me, baby. Where are you going to go? Who's gonna take better care of you than me? I pay all of your bills. All the clothes on your back are because of me. Yeah, remember that tooth that you needed to get fixed? Remember how I got your tooth fixed? Yeah, that was because of me. That apartment you live in, the furniture in it, yeah, that's all because of me. So who's, who's gonna set you up like that? Nobody. So 
you know, fall in line and accept anything that I give you because you can't do any better than me. Do you understand the problem? Is it starting to become more clear now? So kind of furthering that point, page 178, are employees so dependent on their corporations that they can't find fulfillment elsewhere? And he was kind of asking that question like an open question, but the answer to the question is, yes, very many people are so very dependent on their corporations they cannot find fulfillment elsewhere. And to me, that is the saddest thing ever. To me, that is the mark of a wasted life. So this is on page 178, 179. He said, in the book, Halftime, Bob Buford says the people spend the first half of their professional life seeking success and the enlightened spend the other half seeking significance. So that means that the unenlightened are gonna spend their whole professional lives seeking success. They're, they're constantly going to be chasing that. And the one half that does wake up will start to look for significance at some point in their life. They'll start to seek it out and search for it. And you don't want to find that when you are retiring and you look back and you realize I gave up my entire youth to a company that <laughs> kind of threatened my life if I ever showed any interest in my own affairs. Low key threat in your life though, not high key. It's a low key threat in your life. Moving on, page 178. He was speaking on this one particular employee in the book and how basically her lifestyle wasn't sustainable. And so the quote is, since the workplace is dependent on her fanatically committed lifestyle, the two are codependent. So then it says following Buford's advice demands a break from corporate cults that honor the workaholic dysfunction that is inherent in so many employees. So when he says fanatically committed, that is the same thing as workaholic dysfunction. Super committed, above and beyond committed, going way above the call of duty. And what he's basically saying is the organization has to have that in order to survive. So the note that I made to myself was, this is why a lot of businesses folded during our little health crisis here, because they've always been set up to be dependent on fanatically committed people. They never had a normal business plan. It's not like they had a normal season and then they're in peak season and then it's gonna go back to normal. It's always been peak is what I'm trying to tell you. So you're not going to get to have a life in these type of companies because they never designed it to be normal. They never designed it to have like a neutral operating zone. It's always been panic mode from day one. And you cannot sustain panic mode because panic mode is always hanging on by a thin thread. And all it takes is a strong wind to break a thin thread. And that's exactly what happened. They're not rooted in any business fundamentals. Business fundamentals are frowned upon now. You know, that's considered like old. So this is on 179 also. It says American business honors dysfunction. And I couldn't think of a, a more brilliant way to summarize it all. American business honors dysfunction. They absolutely do. They honor it and pretty much tell you that right in the interview. They'll say, are you capable of multitasking and handling multiple competing projects and multiple competing timelines and deadlines? You better say yes. If you say no, they're not going to hire you. If you look them in the eye and say, well, sure, I could do that, but I probably would be more effective with just one or two projects to focus on, they're not going to hire you. They're not. What they really need are like four different people working on all the projects they have, but they're going to try to get the work of four people out of one person. So you have to lie in the interview and say, oh yes, absolutely, I'm great at multitasking and handling competing deadlines and priorities. And because they just love to hear it because they're so easily flattered and taken by words, you're gonna get the job and you're, you're gonna discover what a disaster it is once you get inside the walls because nobody ever sat down to kind of really map it out. Let's move on, same theme. Organizations thrive on dysfunctional workaholics, and they really do. And you can tell. Like they never ever seem like they've got 
a grip on all the work ever. You could be there a year, two years, and they never seem like they actually have a, a grasp on all of the work that's going on because they don't. It's kind of like a, a very long game of hot potato. <laughs> Page 179 still, it says people who chase after society's definition of success will never reach it. It's a self-perpetuating problem. Individuals seek society's definition of success, status and money, but as they gain more of both, they still feel unsatisfied. So they seek still more status and money by working harder and longer. The organization loves this kind of dysfunctional activity. So we're still on this theme of dysfunction. And essentially what this is saying is people are chasing after these things, status and money. So they start to get little bits of it, but it doesn't take long before they start to feel unsatisfied. So they're willing to do more and more and more to achieve this place in their mind that they actually are never probably going to reach in this particular search. And the, the organization, the corporate cult loves it because that means you'll give everything to achieve this little dream in your mind. <laughs> like they really benefit from your motivations, I guess you could say. And they'll probably feed into it in many ways. <laughs> like, yeah, 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 be all you can be. It made me think of like the mass indoctrination we as Americans have experienced. Like, oh, this is the land of opportunity. You can achieve anything. You can be anything you want to be. Hmm. So what would you do as a person if you've been told you live in a place where you can literally do anything you want to do if you just work hard enough? And for a long time, we believed that to be true until we discovered that there are some people who simply just have to be associated with the right company or born into the right family. And you really don't have to work at all. And you're going to have everything that other people have to work hard enough for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can be anything you want to be. Yeah, there are no barriers. There are no walls. There are no traps to success. You can do anything. You can be anything you want to be. Look at this person. They did it. Look at this one person over there. They did it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just go into like $100,000 of student loan debt. No problem. You can be whatever you want to be. Yeah, 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 yeah. Do it, do it, do it. Just something to think about. All right. Let's keep going. So this quote actually came from a Xerox vice president. I don't know if she still is because this book is 20 years old at this point. It says, you always have to be in control of your boundaries. The minute you let any company, any manager try to set them for you, you've lost it. And I thought that was brilliant. And it made me wonder and it got me to thinking like, I know this particular author says that pretty much everyone in high positions are members of cults, corporate cults. But I wonder if there's also an unspoken group who reach these high positions in these companies because they maintain their boundaries. And it's almost like a situation where, oh, wow, he or she is uncrackable. You can't, you can't shake that one. Yeah, we need that type of strength up high. It's just a thought. He doesn't talk about that in the book, but it was just something I think about. I was thinking about like, yeah, I'm sure half of them are culted, but I wonder if the other half make it that far up because they refuse to be culted. So maybe it's like a long term project like, oh, I'm going to crack this one. I'm going to break her down. I'm going to make her crawl. <laughs> it's like, no, you won't. The only thing you will make happen is me walk out of the door. That's it. Don't make me file a lawsuit now. Always have to be in control of your boundaries. And here's the thing, your boundaries are violated and pulled on in so many different ways. There are big ways, but there are also small ways. And the issue is you have to be cognizant and aware at all times, because once you start to give in little ways, it's not long before you're giving in big ways. But you have to set them because if not, you will lose it. And before you know it, you won't even recognize yourself anymore. I was very, very good about setting boundaries in the corporate environment. And it always got me in trouble, but the boundaries were set. I have a right to set certain boundaries. So then he kind of got into the discussion of like them analyzing data of people who get hired and all this. And he said, recruits who ask lifestyle questions in the pre-hire interviews, 
end up being top performers in their jobs. Meaning questions like what is the work life balance here? Uh, what are the after work expectations? How many hours will I be working each week? And the reason I believe is because they, they know what's important. So when they're working, they're going to prioritize your work because they know what's important. They have a life that they're trying to get back to. They want to do good on the job because the job is indeed funding their life. So why would they mess up in an area that's funding the life that they actually love? So of course, they're going to be top performers for you because they like or they want the money at minimum, but maybe they need the job to fund the life that they love. So this correlation makes sense to me versus a person who doesn't necessarily love their life. They may not work as hard or perform as well on the job because they don't really like their life anyway. So if they lose this money, is it really going to be a big impact on the life that they don't really care about that much anyway? Maybe not. It all makes perfect sense to me. The correlation makes sense to me. So let's keep going. We're on page 184. <laughs> this made me laugh. It says continuing to be a member in good standing of a corporate cult means putting in FaceTime at the office. Since corporate cults hire people for who they are, not what they do, the measure of success is being who you are at the office and spending a lot of time there. Now, haven't we talked about this many times before? And I've said, I feel like you're just paying me for my presence. Like, you just do you just want to see me? Is that what this is about? Because if so, take away some of these job duties and responsibilities, honey, and I'll show up here every day. I'll literally just get dressed to come hang out if that's what you want. But you got to take away these other job duties as well. I'll be the company ambassador. Just walk around all day. Just go from floor to floor, talking to people, letting them dump all their issues and problems on me, fluttering up to the 10th floor, seeing what's up there, grabbing a few cookies that they brought in for the team meeting. You know, I can do that all day if that's what you want me to do. But you've got to remove these other job duties that you gave me that I thought you were paying me for. Being a good member means putting in FaceTime at the office. So I thought this was interesting because in the absence of the office, you know, these narcs have been losing their minds, right? So what took the place of FaceTime at the office? Bam. Now, obviously, this particular picture was taken back when everyone was still in the office, but still, you get the drift. This is what's going on nationwide all across the country. If I can't see you, I need to see you. Camera on, in your face, the whole time. It's just weird. <laughs> to me, it's more natural for the speaker to be seen. So I'll just pick the guy in the upper left-hand corner. It looks like his name is Josh Witte. Like if Josh Witte is speaking, we should only be looking at him really because he's the one talking. That's, that's what we would be doing in real life. If we were in a, a big conference room or a meeting room, whoever is talking is generally the person we're looking at. And then when they stop talking, we start looking at the person who is talking now. But in this scenario, we're literally staring at everyone all at once. And it's weird because if you think about it as a person, you're not an actor and you're not an actress. Actors and actresses have to be aware of their face and their movements and their body at all times because the camera could be on them at any given moment. So they can't like come out of character thinking the camera is not on them because the camera might be on them especially if they're taking multiple different angles. So an actor or an actress must stay in character the whole time because the camera is on them and it's part of the movie, but you're a normal human, most of you. So you're not always prepped to remember, hey, don't stare off in the corner because everyone's looking at you right now. So you stare straight ahead like a psychopath because to do otherwise makes you look unusual, but it's not, it wouldn't really be unusual in real life. Anyway, 
this has taken the place of, well, if I can't stare at you in your desk, in your seat, you better turn that camera on for every single interaction we have. And guess what started to happen? These platforms can't support it. And I think it's hilarious. WebEx, Zoom, what else? There's another one. They can't support all these webcams on at once. They still don't have the bandwidth for it. So what ends up happening is the first half of the meeting is everyone turning on their camera. Then everyone figuring, trying to figure out who's unmuted and making all the noise in the background. Then you get them muted finally. Then the person starts talking, it's choppy. And finally, someone has the courage to say, hey, maybe, maybe if you killed your camera, it'll come through clearer. They kill their camera clear, crystal clear. And before you know it, all the cameras are off because it chops up the sound. It's just silly. <laughs> it's a silly time, but you have to understand who we're dealing with. We're dealing with people who demand to see you, who do not trust you, who really probably don't even know what they hired you for or what you do. All they know is that you are theirs and they want to look at you. You're like their little goldfish. Wouldn't you want to see your goldfish if you bought one? Moving on to page 184, it says, in this sense, corporate cults are one era behind. So it says, since corporate cults hire people for who they are, not what they do, the measure of success is being who you are at the office and spending a lot of time there. In this sense, corporate cults are one era behind. Now, I agree. Now, how many times have I said to you guys, these companies are dated they need overhauls. Like some of them you walk in, you feel like you're walking 30 years into the past. It really feels that way. Now, in a futuristic sense and on like a black mirror type conversation, I actually think these corporate cults are one era ahead. And I'll tell you why. Who'd have thought and who'd have known that like Instead of moving away from like a corporate cult design, we're moving closer and closer to it, towards it, if we don't talk about it and break it up before it completely solidifies. So he wrote this book in 2000. He said they're one era behind. That was correct, but this was also before social media took off the way it did. Now it's become a situation where like, like we've been discussing, your physical presence is more important than the work you're actually doing. That's very futuristic, black mirror type, you know, we'll make all your decisions for you type situation. Like you don't even need to leave your house anymore. We'll wake you up. We'll cook your breakfast in your kitchen. We'll automate that. Mess around. Eventually they'll regulate when you can go to the bathroom. They'll put it in there. They'll put a little chip in there. Hey, it's time for you to go to the bathroom. Like, I'm just kidding, but aren't we kind of close to that? So that's up for debate. Are we one era behind or are we actually moving into the scary future that nobody predicted? I heard a good quote and I forgot how it went, but essentially the guy said to him, he said, you suffer from the same problem all optimists suffer from, which is you only think about the good things that could happen. <laughs> It's something like that. I don't know the exact quote, but I think this would be an example of that. Like with the rise of all this technology, yeah, it connected us more, but no one ever thought that this might actually turn the people who were already monsters into bigger monsters because it's like, well, now I can control every little aspect of your life. Like monitoring what you do in your home. Like if I, I'm so against that, like if this is a company computer, I get you wanting to monitor it. It's com it's a company resource, but they've got it. Some softwares now that are down to keystrokes, meaning, you know, in the past hour, this employee made three keystrokes. So it won't necessarily tell you what they were doing, but like, say like an average hour, you make like 3000 keystrokes. So your boss knows you're working, but this software can report like in the past hour, this employee made zero keystrokes, meaning you're, your computer is on, but you're not doing anything. I feel like that's so invasive. And I would never allow that on my personal computer. Work computer, fine. But as soon as I find out about it, I'm probably going to quit because you can't make assumptions. Just ask me. Anyway, non-cult companies measure success by output, not FaceTime. And I made a note to myself that says, I can't imagine measuring by anything else. I hired you for a reason. 
Like, <laughs> I just find that to be so weird and so bizarre. You hire this person, maybe to be a data scientist at your company, and you could care less about the data science. All you care about is that you get to see them every day. You're a weirdo. That's strange. Like you gotta understand how strange that is. And to me, if you don't have anything else you're measuring by like output, to me, you're probably a sham operation. You're a shell company. You're just propped up by investor money. And when the investor money runs out, the company is gonna fold because what are you making? What are you doing? <laughs> what do you actually make? And if I can't measure whether or not you're delivering on that, what are we doing? Is this a pyramid scheme? So let's move on. So this is not how this appears in the book. I just took it and kind of broke it down and made it like a list format. But he got into a conversation about star performers. Now, the corporate cult would have you believe that the star performer is everything that we just talked about, the person who wants to stay late, work overtime, always striving for success, reaching higher and higher and higher. That's not really your star performer. Your star performer is the one who's getting the work done, doing it well and making your company look really good in the process. But the thing about star performers is they're very, very different people. So here's kind of the qualities that he attributed to star performers. They have rich, interesting lives outside of work, meaning they have a life that they're trying to get back to. They use shortcuts that would be considered indiscretions in corporate cults, meaning within a few weeks or a few months, your star performer is gonna be thinking in terms of efficiency. Because remember, they have a life they're trying to get back to. So they, they wanna do the job 100%, if not 110, but they're not going to like lollygag and play games and waste time with you. They're gonna do it in the most efficient method possible. The, of course, that's within the boundaries of the company rules. But to do so is considered like, and I've seen this happen, this has happened to me. Like I find like a better way to do something and it's like they get uncomfortable. Star performers are generally no nonsense, meaning they're here to work. They're not here to like play games. Like if friendships form, that's fantastic. But overall, they're not there to make friends. They already have friends. They're there to work. They're very frustrated by bureaucracy and red tape, just crazy, unnecessary rules, multiple layers of clearance, and this is not the federal government. And they will leave organizations with a the quickness. They will get out of there quickly, quickly, because they, they recognize their value and they recognize when they're spinning their wheels also. And they just recognize that life is precious, time is precious. And if I have to devote so much of it to you on a daily basis, I want, to, want it to be a valuable time spend. Star performers value their time. And if you are intent on wasting it, they will leave you quickly. Page 186, healthy corporations like healthy families teach choice and independence. Corporate cults don't. Corporate cults are afraid that employees who go elsewhere for education might be indoctrinated with foreign ideas or values. So what he was speaking on there was how many corporate cults have their own in-house training and they rarely refer their employees to external training. Now, in fairness, external training is very expensive. It's not cheap, but take finances away. Corporate cults are gonna prefer in-house training because then you can keep all that indoctrination in-house. And the note that I made to myself was, it's kind of like how victimizers isolate their victims from their friends and families. Like, no, you're not gonna go get any outside knowledge. We'll teach you everything you need to know. You don't need to know what's going on out there. There is no out there. There's only in here. So they're afraid that you'll get to talking to somebody and be like, wait a minute. I think the situation I'm in is in is kind of messed up. They don't want that indoctrination broken all in-house. Now, this was funny to me because he got on to company trainers and it says company trainers must be the most culted so that management can be confident of their ability to pass along company dogma in the educational setting. 
I had a thought. And this thought was, they run the same training classes year after year after year. 10 years later, you come back to the same company, they're running the same classes. Taught usually by the same trainers, 10 years later, same trainers, same classes, same books, same books are given out year after year after year. All this comes together to produce the exact same person. And this is kind of the point of this whole entire live stream. This is what they want. They want the same person reproduced over and over again. So when you start to show signs of independence, you're either going to be reprimanded <laughs> or removed one or the other. The goal is the same person because the objective is to create the same person year after year for 20 years. That's the objective. Moving on, this is page 191. It says the problem is caused by his escalation of commitment to his functional profession or company. Such people become proficient and knowledgeable about the function they are performing and their salary slowly increases until they are worth so much more in their functional specialization than they would be outside it that they can't leave. They are trapped. So this makes me think of a lot of different industries that ultimately become traps for people. And one of those traps that I thought about was Hollywood. It's a quick and easy way to get yourself trapped in a profession. Because I guarantee you there are so many celebrities who want to leave, who don't wanna be stars anymore, but they can't do anything else. Everybody recognizes them. Everybody knows them for that one thing. In many ways, these individuals are trapped. And this is not the only example. Another place people can get trapped is like in the medical field. When you've devoted that many years to the study, that much money to the schooling, you work so hard to work your way up in the ranks, where are you gonna go after that? It's hard to reverse course, but it all has to do with the escalation of commitment. Let's keep going. It says corporate cult members have confused the organon, meaning organization, with its product. And the example he gave in the book was, he said musicians admire the instrument for what it is, but they like the instrument for what it does more. So if you play a violin, you might appreciate a very expensive violin, but chances are you appreciate it because of the music it makes, because of the sound that it makes, not necessarily just because it's expensive. He was saying the same thing with companies. Companies are supposed to produce something, a paycheck. But what happens is people fall in love with the instrument and not the product or the output of that instrument. The instrument in this case would be the organization. People fall in love with the organization and not what the organization is supposed to be doing for them. It's an exchange, remember? Be careful not to fall in love with the instrument and focus on what that instrument is supposed to be doing for you. This chapter is chapter nine, which is all about the cult test. How culted are you? Up until this point, we have gone through chapters one through eight, and you can find those reviews on the playlist entitled Corporate Cults Review Series. And as always, I like to kind of set the context and the purpose for this discussion. The purpose of us covering this, especially now more than ever before, is to redefine and reshape working in corporate culture. We want it to be a place where people can earn an honest living, free of harassment and mental duress, and where individuals can be treated as autonomous, freestanding adults with respect to relevant rules. That last part is new. I just put that in there. The where individuals can be treated as autonomous, freestanding adults with respect to relevant rules, meaning we're not saying you should have the right to just march into an organization and do whatever you want. No, there are rules in place and we want to make sure that they're relevant rules, but yes, we're gonna respect the rules, but you're also gonna treat us like adults. 
what we've discovered as we've gone through this review and as we're just kind of taking a look at everything that's going on is that an undercurrent of this is a deep desire to treat adults like children. You're gonna have a lot of problems out of people when you do that. And it's kind of what drives all of these behaviors. You stop treating adults like children, almost all of this goes away overnight. But that's another discussion for another video. Let's jump into today's topic, which is chapter nine, the cult test. So many of you may have been wondering up until this point, am I in a corporate cult? Am I culted? Am I a corporate cult member? Well, tonight you're going to find out. So let's jump right in. It's gonna be a mixture of quotes pulled from the book, as well as the test itself, how it's scored, and where you fall on the culted spectrum. So let's go. The first quote I wanna start off with is on page 164, and it says, only individuals can make their corporation into a cult. With everything that's been going on in the world, globally, nationally, locally, I recently did a video called Work and Die, Prisoners by Choice. And in that video, I mentioned that the author of this book that we're reviewing says many times that this is the making of the people, that this is only able to go into the future and survive because the people allow it to be so. The people support it, the people uphold it. And as I've shared before, that was always really hard for me to swallow because I've never been that person. But then critical thinking has to kick in and say, PTE, just because you've never been that person doesn't mean other people aren't. And what I've discovered with the fallout from this illness is that people indeed make their corporations into cults. People are out here drinking the proverbial Kool-Aid in the form of being willing to lay down their lives for their corporation. I don't think it gets much more culted than that. So I have to agree now, my eyes have been open to this reality that yes, the people who are in charge and who have the resources and all the money can design these ridiculous, wicked rules but it's on us to obey them. And when we not only obey them, we're willing to die for them. Well then yes, individuals are making their corporations into cults. And I could go down an entire rabbit hole on that point, and I just might. I already kind of did, but I just wanted to bring that point out first and foremost here, that yes, the individuals are doing this, maybe even more so than the overlords. The overlords just send out the notion, the individuals take over and make it happen for them. So we won't get too deep into that. However, everybody is not those individuals. And I would like to bring this out and bring this up in this live stream. Now I know I'm a few days late because this is all occurring on May 1st. So I'm only a few days late, but I wanted to show my support for this. I wanted to show and give my encouragement for those who are going on strike, for those who are unaware. We had a May Day, May Day. General strike on May 1st. Employees of Amazon, Whole Foods, Target, and Instacart were striking. There are a lot of different demands being made, but among the most important are the demands for personal protection of themselves, making sure that they're getting hazard pay, access to healthcare, the proper protective equipment to do their jobs, being considered essential workers because they kind of can't close. I mean, they can, but they kind of can't. I support it. I think this is the only way to achieve a healthier and more balanced and more reasonable society. I think we've been out of whack and unreasonable for a very long time and people are so anxious to get back to something that was already abnormal. So we cannot fight to go back to abnormal. We have to fight for something that makes more sense. So I completely support this. I hope they're doing well. I need to follow up and figure out what's been taking place, but we are the voice. We have the voice, guys. Remember, this is a man-made system. So if man made it, man can change it man can alter it. It's not immutable. It's not one of the laws of nature. We made this up along with all of the rules and policies and procedures. We can fix them. We can change them. But you just have to make the decision that greed will not be the order of the day. Are you willing to do that? Until then, I hope individuals like these continue to fight for their rights, stand up for yourself, protect yourself, because there is no any of this if you're not healthy. And there certainly is none of it if you're not alive anymore, okay? Force these companies that have the resources, which by the way, 3M, hello, where are our masks? <laughs> where are the masks, 3M? Where are they? Where are they? We're waiting. 
So until we have what we need, stand up for yourself, fight for yourself. So that's my two cents regarding this and kind of our back end context for all of this. We don't want to create corporate cults anymore. We're tired of this. We've been doing this for a long time. Let's keep moving in this review. Page 163 says, the examination of an employee's level of cultedness requires an all-encompassing view of the organization, including both its psychological and its structural elements. So he's kind of setting up the survey. This is actually a very in-depth chapter and to put it all on slides would deeply complicate it and kind of get us really deep in the weeds. I highly recommend you check out the book so you can get the full appreciation of the research that he put into the survey. He is pulling from multiple different credible sources to craft the survey. So part of what he's saying as he's setting it up is that you're analyzing it from the psychological elements and the structural elements. It's not a one-dimensional analysis. So going back to a reminder, page 165, the three traits of a cult. And this is also what the survey is measuring are devotion, charismatic leadership, and separation from the community. So the whole survey is based on the analysis of these three areas. Moving on, page 166. This was a very important quote to pull out, and we're going to spend just a little bit of time here. Physical location in the company affects scoring. Employees who work at company headquarters with top-level management tend to be more highly culted, than those who work in a branch location. So in other words, the people who work on site or on premises tend to end up more culted than employees who work in a remote office location or from home have their attention diverted from the corporation more easily. So they will maintain outside interests that prevent culting. I'm going to pause here for a moment because we've actually covered this in recent weeks. I did a video called Advice from the Experts, You Can't Work From Home where this expert broke down all the reasons why working from home is ineffective for everybody. No qualifications, no disclaimers. It just doesn't work for anybody. You need to be in the office. And essentially what this quote is saying, I don't think this was the intent, but in the context of today's climate, employees who work in remote locations have their attentions diverted from the corporation more easily, so they will maintain outside interests that prevent culting. In other words, when you don't spend all your time in these offices, you're able to remember your own life. You're able to remember what makes you happy, your hobbies, your pets, your friends, your family, your unique interests, you, your home, You're able to put energy and attention into those things quickly and easily when you're away from the office. So the implied other statement is that when you're in the office, that's what they want. They want all of your attention and all of your energy, even if it's not necessarily in relation to the job. Some jobs require a lot of attention and a lot of focus and a lot of detail, but that has more to do with the actual job itself than the company. The point that I'm pulling out from this is that corporate cults want all of you. They want every ounce of you. They want to marry you. We've covered this in this series before. And they are not offering or putting forward enough of anything for anyone to actually marry these people. But corporate cults want you to marry them when they're still acting single. They still want to behave like they're single, but they want you to behave like a committed partner, even though they have not made an equal commitment to you. And that has always been my point. And my other point has always been, even if you work for a great company, you're still not supposed to sell your soul you're still supposed to retain a portion of yourself. Always work hard, give it your best, do what you're being paid to do, but you're still important, you still matter, because what happens in situations like the ones we're in right now? You might've been working for a great company, but by federal or local mandate, you had to shut down. Now what? Now who are you? Sure, you had a great boss, great company, great coworkers, great customers, great work environment. Everything was great, but it's temporarily shut down and we don't know when it's going to come back online. Now, who are you? So that's what I mean by even if it's going well, you have to retain a portion of yourself. You still matter. You were not born for a job. You were born to be born. You were born to be a human being first. And you always have to remember that. So anyway, I thought this quote was very interesting. And I feel like this is what they're trying to run interference on in terms of the remote work. They don't want you to remember happiness again because if you start to remember happiness you might actually try to spend more time happy than in their miserable corporate environments. 
And it's worrisome to me that everyone who's begging and banging on the doors to get back in to that, you want to get back into that flat, dirty carpet, those dusty cubicles, gray walls everywhere. That's what you're, you're wanting to rush back to that. And then the flip of that is some of you want to rush back to sitting face to face with someone all day long, no privacy whatsoever. Like, isn't there some sort of middle ground? Where's the modern office is all we're asking for. That applies logic, engineering, humanity. Like, can we blend those three things? Autonomy, <laughs> logic, engineering, humanity, and autonomy. Can we, can we find a way to mix those together and make something that makes sense? Because if I can ever get through to the owners of these corporations and heads of corporate cults, it's that. If you learn to treat your people well, you will actually make more money. You won't need to be bailed out all the time because you'll be constantly making money because you know how to treat people. You know how to treat your employees and you know how to treat your customers. But many of you are comfortable rolling the dice all the time because you know you'll be bailed out. So you don't bother. But I think from a strategic standpoint, it would make more sense to engage in a long-term strategy that makes you money over the long term versus gambling. Really what you are, gamblers. Let's move on. We're going to go ahead and take a look at the cult test. So let's kind of set up the test first and then we'll take a look at it and debrief it. So it's 20 questions long. Each question you rate yourself on a scale of one to five. One is you strongly agree. Five is you strongly disagree. Now here's where it may get a little confusing. The scoring is in three separate constructs. So in other words, you score yourself in three separate areas. Devotion, charismatic leader and separation from the community. So in other words, when you're through taking the test, you'll end up with three different scores for those areas. However, he does have a compilation score and we'll look at that as well. So here's the actual test. I'm gonna go quiet for about two or three minutes so you can read through the questions, score yourself, and then we'll look at the results of your score on the next couple of slides. Okay, hopefully that was enough time for you to take the test and score yourself. We're going to look at both your total score and the breakdown of each category. Let's go ahead and start off with the categories. Questions one through eight were measuring your devotion. If you score between eight and 14 points here, you have very high devotion to your corporation, 15 to 19 points medium, 20 to 40 points low. Moving on to questions 9 through 12, which were measuring charismatic leadership. If you score between 4 and 10 points here, you have very high charismatic leadership or very high perception of them. 11 to 13 points medium and 14 to 20 points low. Finally, separation from the community, questions 13 through 20. If you score between 8 to 23 points here, you have very high separation from the community, 24 to 29 points medium separation and 30 to 40 points very low separation from the community and this is all on page 170 of the book now and as he states throughout this chapter this test is really not intended to be taken on the whole meaning it's really not intended to be measured based on your total score because it is measuring these individual categories however because he has an awareness that people will still tally it up and do a total score anyway he went ahead and did that that breakdown for everybody. He calls them combined constructs, which essentially means all three devotion, charismatic leadership, and separation from community combined. If you scored between 20 and 39 points, you're highly culted. Between 40 to 59 points, you're somewhat culted. Between 60 to 79 points, you're pretty independent. And between 80 to 100 points, you are a maverick. <laughs> and another way that he puts maverick in the book is extremely unculted. So this is gonna be your cult test. I highly recommend you take it and take it seriously and then really meditate on the results. 
If you're listening to my channel or if you've been listening to my channel for a while, I imagine you're probably not highly culted. However, some of you might be in highly culted situations and perhaps this is your first time having an awareness of such. And as we look through some of these questions, some of you may be going, well, what's wrong with some of these things? For example, what's wrong with believing in the work your organization does? What's wrong with your work serving a good cause? What's wrong with admiring the leader? What's wrong with having close personal friends at work. It's not necessarily that anything is wrong with those things. All it's really telling you is how deeply culted you are within your organization. So I think that actually brings out a very good point, which is for those of you who took the test and maybe even scored high on the cultedness scale, that might be your underlying thought. Well, I really like my job and I believe in what we do. And yeah, I'm really devoted to work, but it's for a good cause. That's fine. But the question becomes, are you actually able to be yourself? Are you able to have a different opinion? Are optional group events really mandatory, but They'll never call them mandatory, but if you don't go, you're in trouble. Also, the thing about cults is they're supposed to be fun. They're supposed to feel good. They're not supposed to feel bad. If they felt bad, you probably wouldn't want to be there. The danger and what you have to be watchful for is the minute you start to show signs of individuality, are you now an outcast? Are you a black sheep? Do people start treating you differently in this organization that you love so much? And the other part of that is, if all of these things are true, could anyone ever come to you and bring up something to you that's out of the ordinary or that you've never seen before or a perspective you've never considered before? Are you open to those or are are you so sold on your organization that you could never hear any feedback other than positive feedback? Because that's what else happens to highly culted people. They can't hear anything other than positive feedback in regard to the cult that they're so loyal to. So these are the things that you have to think about as you're taking this test and analyzing your score results. Has there ever been a customer or an employee who's come to you with an idea or with feedback that is so different from what you believe of the organization that you dismissed it? That's a quick and easy way to form a cult. Dismiss all outside feedback that doesn't align with what we believe about this organization, even if it's not true or not able to be proven true. So that is the danger and therein lies the danger of corporate cults. Now he goes and breaks it down a little bit further. And so I just kind of took the summary of each section in regard to the devotion questions, questions one through eight, the spirit of those questions is how far will the employee go for the organization? Another way that you could ask this question is what wouldn't you do for your company? What would you not do? What would you not say? How far will you go for the organization? How much will you stick your neck out on the line for these people that you really just met like six months ago? How far will you go? So those are the devotion questions. Then the charismatic leadership questions are essentially illustrating the awe that is defined as the followers unreasoned faith in the leader's abilities. In other words, you believe in this person in spite of the fact that they've never actually given you a strong reason to, or may have even demonstrated the complete opposite of what they proclaim to be or what they say that they can do, but you still blindly follow them or you have unreasoned faith in them anyway. So that is your devotion to your charismatic leader. That's the spirit of those questions. And then finally, the separation from the community questions are essentially trying to get at how much you view your corporate cult as a surrogate family, or as it says in the book, a corporate cult becomes a surrogate family that meets the emotional and psychological needs of its members. How far are you willing to go for your organization and why? Why are you willing to go that far for them? What have they done for you that has inspired that level of devotion and commitment to them? What else in your life are you that devoted and that committed to? Is there anything else in your life that you're that devoted and that committed to? Prior to you working for this particular company, who were you and what were you devoted to prior to working for this particular company? Why were you able and why have you been able to so easily give up your identity for an institution that existed before you and will likely exist after you barring any major circumstances? Why? My question is why? 
And some of you may answer and say, because they pay me PTE, because they provide benefits PTE. I've been able to buy a house and send my kids to college and buy cars and go on vacations because of the money that they pay me. And while all of that may be true, remember that you did exchange something for it. So they didn't give it to you for free. So they haven't done you any favors by paying you for the work that you agreed to give to them for that paycheck. That's not a favor. Again, the question becomes, how far are you willing to go for your organization and why? And would they go that far for you? Hello, everybody, and welcome. Today is Monday, July 27, 2020. And this is the final installment of our Corporate Cults Review Series. Covering chapters 11 and 12, we made it to the end, you guys. Can you believe it? So I'm super excited to bring you the final installment of this series so we can go ahead and get started on our next one. I want to give a big shout out to my patrons. Thank you all so much for your support. You really do help the channel continue on into the future. Thank you so much. If you're interested in becoming a patron, that link is patreon.com slash permission to exist. And you can also find it in the description box. I do have a playlist put together and I'm thinking about, and this is a lofty goal, but I'm thinking about going through editing them all and putting them into like a package format that I can sell like an MP4 or something like that. I don't know if it would be an MP4 or something else, but I'm thinking about doing that, cleaning it up, editing out, you know, unnecessary material and things like that. So we'll see. That's lofty though. That's a lofty goal. That would take me forever, but we'll see. The purpose of this series has been to redefine and reshape working in corporate culture, to be a place where people can earn an honest living free of harassment and mental duress, and where individuals can be treated as autonomous, freestanding adults with respect to relevant rules. That is the purpose. For many, many years now, these companies have been slowly getting away with turning their organizations into some form of corporate cult, some form, some version of it, meaning your personality is more important than what you're actually doing for the company, which leads to the question that I ask every stream, which is then how are you guys making any money at all? If we're here for personality, what are you selling? What are you doing? What are you making? And how are you making money? That's kind of been the direction of this whole entire thing. And as we can see, as a direct result of this global health situation that we're all in, many of these companies would have folded had it not been for the Federal Reserve propping them up but had mathematics and natural laws had their way, many of these corporate cults would have folded because they never built out their infrastructure. They never updated, they never intended to update. Their only intention is to replicate each day as the day before, which is why in many ways, in my opinion, our society hasn't changed that much in like 20 years, you guys. If you really stop and think about it, I mean, yes, our technology has gotten a little better. The phones have gotten a little better. But overall, nothing has really changed that much over the past 20 years. And this would be part of the reason why. The companies and the corporations that essentially prop life up, all of life, have decided that it's best to just replicate the same day than ever try to make a different day or a new day or a better day. Hey, we have one day that worked. It worked that one time. So let's keep doing it because it worked that one time. So let's just keep doing that over and over again. Who cares if we're living the same day every day for the next 20 to 30 years? As long as it keeps working, that's all that matters. And the problem is that's just not how life itself is. Life is fluid. Life is dynamic. Life changes. So you have to be kind of willing to flow with that or risk extinction. And like I said, a lot of these companies would have been extinct or would have gone extinct 
if they had allowed natural law to take its course. So that is why we're here. Let's go ahead and wrap up our final two chapters of Corporate Cults. Chapter 11 is all about, is it my personality or just bad timing? So this starts on page 198. And it starts off by talking about how everyone is susceptible to cult membership at certain times in life. Meaning none of us are necessarily immune or unable to accidentally end up in a cult somehow. Some of your families have cult-like structures. So your family of origin might be a cult. So that's tough. When you're born into one, it's really hard to break out of a cult-like family. And then the odds of you just taking yourself into another cult-like situation, coming from a cult-like family is extremely high. But you don't necessarily have to come from a cult-like family to end up in a cult at some point in time in your life. So we will talk a little bit about what those different circumstances are that have people finding themselves in corporate cults from time to time. So he moves on. He said, people who have a strong internal locus of control believe that they are in charge of their environment. People who have an external locus of control believe that the environment or fate is in control. So in other words, another way to look at this is what drives a person. Does, is a person driven from the inside or is a person driven from the outside? So another example would be, let's say a person has a dirty room, right? And let's say 24 hours from now, the room is cleaned up. So the question is, was the room cleaned up because that person wanted to clean it from within because for them, it's very rewarding. Maybe they don't like being in a dirty room. So they did it because of themselves and for themselves, or is the room now clean because someone else threatened them? Hey son, Hey daughter, clean up this room or you won't get your allowance. Was the driver coming from inside or outside? So that's what internal locus of control, external locus of control means. And this is actually pretty important. I could spend some time here. I'm just not going to, but this <laughs> puppy, it's, it's fine. <laughs> um, <laughs> because people who tend to have external locuses of control tend to be tossed about in the wind because they believe the environment is what's actually controlling their lives. So I could go down a whole rabbit hole on that, but I'm not going to. Let's move on. Page 201 says people with an external locus of control not only are more likely to become culted, but fully expect some stroke of fate to throw them into an organization in which all their needs are met. They welcome corporate cult membership because they want an external force, in this case, the organization, to have control over their lives. <laughs> I'm laughing because this little, this little bark is just too funny to me. It's like, what are you going to do, girl? You are so little. What are you going to do? It's fine. So like the slide says, they welcome corporate cult membership because they want someone else to tell them what to do, basically. They want that. They seek it out. They crave it. They deeply desire for someone else to manage their lives, control their lives, tell them what to do. Believe it or not, this is why a lot of prisoners actually do pretty well in jail because their days are structured for the first time, maybe. So someone's telling them when to wake up. Someone is telling them when to go to bed, when to shower, when to eat, how far they can go and how long they can go there. So the structure is highly appreciated for some inmates, obviously not for all, but for some, it actually works out pretty well, which is why they don't do well upon release often. There's no structure in the real world unless you impose it upon yourself. So people who tend to allow environment to dictate their lives tend to purposely drift towards corporate cults because that's all the corporate cult wants to do. There is no internal driver for the people who end up 
in or end up staying in rather is probably better because a lot of us can find our way to a corporate cult. The question is, can you find your way out of it? And they love it. Like you, you've seen those people before. They are planted and nested down like a happy little, happy little bird. Like they're totally content. They love it. Even though their lives are so slowly being siphoned away from them, they don't care because somebody is telling them what to do, when to do it, and they are perfectly content and happy with that. So that's kind of the, the overall gist of that particular slide. Let me continue. Also on page 201, he says, it's the individual's responsibility to refuse. And what he was referencing there was the responsibility to refuse being culted. The responsibility to refuse staying in a situation like that. And this has actually been a theme throughout the book. He said often people make corporate cults. He was like, the corporate cult is what it is you know, by itself, but it's the people who make it a corporate cult. And I wrestled with that idea a lot at the beginning of this book, but I really do truly understand now. It's the people who uphold it. It's the people who create it. It's the people who nourish it either in silence or by looking the other way. It's the people who create these things. And the, and the corporation loves it because they benefit from it. They're not going to stop that. That unwavering loyalty and devotion, why would they ever discourage that and, just, and encourage you to have your own life? That doesn't profit them. So moving on, he started talking about his early career and how early in his career, he said, let me see if I highlighted it. Or it might be a few pages down. But he was basically saying he was newly married with a new baby, a new house, and just right to be culted, 100%. He said that the manager that he was working for refused to take advantage of that willingness. So the manager refused to take advantage of his openness. So I did a video a long time ago called Narcissists Are Opportunist or something like that. And essentially what it is and what it's related to is the fact that narcissists are always looking for that person with stars in their eyes, wide-eyed, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, naive, doesn't know their worth, doesn't know how much they're supposed to be charging, doesn't know the ropes, so they take advantage of that. And that is what makes narcissists and people who act like them predators. That's what a predator does. And that's what a predator is doing. A predator is lying in wait, watching, scanning, observing, waiting to see an opportunity, an opening, something that they can go get quickly, easily without a lot of fuss behind it. You see, and a lot of companies are like this, which is why a lot of companies often will explicitly say they want newly hired or excuse me, newly new graduates, basically new college graduates. You know, did you have you graduated within the past six months to a year, which is really a really shady way to get away with age discrimination. But they want young, bright eyed, bushy tailed, hungry, broke and eager because that is very, very easy to exploit. And we're talking about corporations and businesses right now, but this could very easily be carried over into the relationships realm very easily. It's the same print underlying principle. So the point he was making here is that the boss he was working for at that time refused to take advantage of that eagerness and that willingness and that vulnerability really, which really speaks highly to the character of that particular boss. Because there's a lot of people who would jump all over it and not say a word. So you have to ask yourself, is the company I'm working for predatory in nature? Are they predators? Do they have a predatory outlook? Because if so, you're in for a wild ride. You're not going to have a great time there unless you're one of them. So and in companies like that, you're either predator or prey. And I don't want you to be either. I want you to get out. I want you to leave. I obviously don't want you to be prey, but I also don't want you to become a predator just to earn a paycheck. 
Where's your dignity? Do you have any self-respect at all? So I just want you to leave. I don't want you to participate on either side. So he moves on. This is also on page 203. Situations in which people are susceptible to corporate cult membership. So I'm sure there's a variety of other situations, but these are the ones that he listed in the book. One, they're new to the corporation. Remember how they always sometimes will actually say, looking for new college grads, graduated one year ago or less, new to the organization, brand new, you don't know anybody, you don't know the cliques, you don't know the unspoken rules. They've all given you the spoken rules, but what are the unspoken rules? You don't know those yet. So you're very, very likely to fall under the wing of some flying monkey who's going to teach you the ropes, right? Second under that is young. So those kind of go hand in hand. Young, fresh out of college, new to the corporation. You're just kind of floating out there and you're very, very ripe for cultedness and indoctrination if you're not careful, if you're not careful. But he goes on, he gives a few more. After the death of a spouse. So what is that? Or what does that mean? Essentially that person has lost their covering in either direction, husband or wife. They've lost that structure, that cover that they've been accustomed to. So now they're open whether they realize it or not, to be covered by someone else or something else. Same thing with the upon moving away from family, moving away from that family system or that family structure, that covering. Now you're desperately, or maybe not desperately, but you're looking around for that new covering, that new structure. Changing industries, kind of the same as being a rookie or being young, you don't know the clicks, the rules, the unspoken rules, the nuances. After leaving a church or synagogue, so that's probably extremely high because you're looking for a new church to cover you. They even call it that in the church world. They'll say you need a, a new church to cover you or do watch care is what it's called. So if you're away from your home church because you move, they want you to find a church to cover you and do watch care for you. It's a real thing. And then finally, after a divorce, very similar to after the death of a spouse. So what this is just showing you are all the different ways or situations that a person can suddenly find themselves in over their head in a cult-like situation. So if you examine your life and you've ever found yourself in some sort of cult-like situation, chances are it followed one of these major events in your life, if not a different one that's not on the list. I'd be curious to see what other reasons you guys would be able to come up with. So let's move on. This is page 205. It says the system gap between financial and family concerns has produced the formula for corporate cults. So this was actually really involved and I was going to put it all on here, but I decided not to just for the sake of brevity he was saying that there are two systems that are in conflict in our society. And those systems are essentially the family system and the career system. So what happens is we tell the kids, go to high school, get your diploma or graduate, get your diploma, then do something, go to the military, go to college, go to a trade school, do something or get a job and kind of financially start your future so you can have a family in the future, right? So let's just say people follow that formula lockstep, high school diploma, college graduation, new job, on the job for a few years, get married at age 25, first baby by age 28. What he was saying in this book was, that system right there that I just described to you produces a major gap in structure, in family structure, basically, because a lot of young people will move away from home, not for any bad reasons, but because they're trying to find that career. They're trying to find the money. Their city may not have a lot of job opportunities there. So they're looking for the money, looking for the career, putting off family because anyone who can do math 
will quickly figure out that they can't afford a family unless they have a decent job or something like that going for themselves. So what he's saying is in that base, we'll just say a 10 year gap from age 18 to 28, corporate cults can swoop in right there because you're kind of flapping and floating in the wind in that time frame. Does that make sense? Versus let's say the culture was this. Let's say the culture was your sophomore year of high school. They encourage the kids, male and female, to link up and find your life partner, right? Prom is all about finding your wife or finding your husband. And everyone by their junior year is engaged. And then around graduation, around age 18, everyone for the most part is married by age 18, kind of like how it used to be back in the day a little bit. But let's just pretend, let's bring that modern. Let's just pretend that never left. Let's pretend that never changed. So everyone is married to their life partner by age 18. So what that means then is chances are within the next two to three years, they're going to start having babies. So most of them will be parents by age 21 or 22. So what that means now is there's all these little family systems all over the place instead of a bunch of single students all over the place. So when you have a family structure or a family system that you're trying to build or you're trying to protect, you're a little less likely, and I do mean a little less likely to be culted because you already have a family that you're working on, that you're nourishing, that you're bringing up. So your job really becomes or should become just that, a job. Hey guys, I'm here. I work. I work hard while I'm here. I earn my paycheck and I leave because I actually already have a family versus what our current culture actually is, which is, yeah, put that family off until about age 30 and come work for us. Think about it. Like I have always admired the people who could have like these full lives outside of work. I've never understood how they've been able to do it how they've been able to keep up with the laundry, their groceries, going on dates, traveling out of town, traveling out of town on a Friday, coming back on a Sunday night, and then coming to work nine o'clock on a Monday morning. Like how, like, how are you able to pull that off? Why are you not sleepy? What am I doing wrong? <laughs> Where are you finding all this extra energy? And time, like I've never understood how people have been able to do both, but people do. It's not impossible, but overall the culture is at minimum graduate from college before you get married and start a family. That's the culture. And that creates a system gap. So that's what that is all about. So then moving on talks about another reason. So the system gap was one reason. This is another reason he called it unconditional acceptance. And it says that some corporations promise unconditional acceptance in the form of lifetime employment or a no layoff policy. Such promises are valid only for the lifetime of the corporation and are based on policies that can change. And that has always, always been one of my major points when dealing with these companies, you guys. It's that, and I think I said this last live stream, second to the last live stream, if your job is going very well, that's when I want you to save the most money because you don't know what the future holds. They might intend to be in business for the next 50 years and they might be, but guess what? They also might not be. Look how many businesses are folding right now because of this global health situation. Folding, who intended to be in business for at least the next 25 years and think about how many people put all of their eggs in that one basket because they're solid. They were a solid company. Nothing will ever happen to them, right? So it's very easy to become culted into a situation like that and become very, very comfortable because you don't think that they're destructible. You actually think that company is indestructible. But as we have seen, external circumstances can come in and affect everything. So you can have a great boss, great coworkers, great working situation. 
and then something external come in and affect all of that. So what is your plan B? What is your backup plan? Do you have a backup plan? So that's not really the point of this slide. The point is that the unconditional acceptance is what ends up drawing a lot of people in and locking them into these corporate cults. But he's, he's pointing out the fallacy of that belief system. Those promises are only valid for the lifetime of the company and are based on policies that can change. Remember, companies aren't real. They're not alive. The human beings that make them up are alive, but the company itself is not, not a real entity. Well, legally it is, but you get my point. So moving on to page 207, it says, whatever the corporation demands, the worker must do or lose his or her value as a person. So here he was talking about how one of the secondary or I guess side effects of being in a corporate cult is your affiliation. So a lot of people don't mind being in a corporate cult because of the affiliation, the name, the name recognition. You get to say you work for fill in the blank. So the clout that comes with working for a particular company, when those things are present, which have no monetary value, theoretically, it's very easy to cult a person. And in that, the person finds all their value from the corporation. So in other words, as long as the person is doing exactly what the corporation wants them to do, they are a valuable person and they should think of themselves as valuable. But if the person starts to drift or has an opinion or starts to deviate in any way, they lose their value as a person in the eyes of the corporation and in, in their own eyes. And so as a result, when that individual becomes small or goes back into their hole, they retreat, they ask for forgiveness and they go back into their assigned place. So the whole quote is, arguing indicates that the individual's needs are not being met in some way. When the individual becomes small, he retreats, asks forgiveness and goes back to his assigned place in the corporation. So in other words, if you're piping up about anything really, Anything other than yay and amen, you're awesome. Wow, that's great. That's really great. Wow, that's the most amazing thing I've ever seen. Unless your speech is along those lines, I'm happy. I've never been happier in my life. This is the best thing that's ever happened to me. Unless your speech pattern is following along those lines, you're going to be perceived as arguing so asking for something that you need, advocating for something that you need, anything when you're in a corporate cult is sending a sign to them that your needs aren't being met in some way, which is when they come up with the happiness. Are you happy? Are you happy here? And it might just be because you asked a question or you asked if a resource was available. Hey, do you guys have blank here? Hey, do you guys have blank? Oh, she's asking for things. She must not be happy. That's literally how simple-minded these people are. If she's not asking for anything, she must be happy. And if she's asking for things, she must not be happy. That's how simple-minded these people are. Simple. And it's perceived as arguing. So again, this could carry over into the relational realm as well. How many of you have been in relationships where you're not actually arguing, you're just bringing something up, but it's being perceived as arguing. It's because in that narcissist's simple-minded logic and simple-minded brain, when you're asking for something, you're arguing and it's a sign that your needs are not being met in some way. So for those of you who they intend to keep, what they would very much like for you to do is become small, meaning retreat, stand down, Ask for forgiveness for speaking up for yourself. How dare you raise a valid point, an invalid point? How dare you raise anything? And then go back into your position. Get back in line. <laughs> Get back in line. Are your needs not being met? Are you not happy here? Okay, that's what I thought. Get back in line. See, 
everyone's going on and on and getting all up in arms over the masks and this and that and the other. And I'm thinking about doing like a temper tantrum series about this <laughs> because it's just getting funny. For example, Delta just turned a flight around because of y'all grown adult brats. But anyway, it's amazing what people think is like the loss of freedom. But like I've said before in this series, I don't think you realize what freedom really is, because if you did, you would see it happening in your own company. You would see this as a complete loss of freedom. Like, wow, you can't ask for anything because asking for something is falsely interpreted as your needs not being met and therefore arguing. And arguing is frowned upon. So you need to retreat ask for forgiveness and get back in line. This is your loss of freedom. If your paycheck is being threatened because you raise a concern or a question, or you ask for something that you need and your paycheck, your livelihood is threatened because of that, that's your loss of freedom. Somebody, I don't know who said it, but I hope they're listening tonight, said in a live chat once, Find who you can't speak the truth to, and you have found your oppressors. Now, I don't know if that's their quote or someone else's quote. Like, I don't know if that's a famous person's quote or if that's something they made up, but it always, it has stuck with me ever since I read it. Figure out who you can't speak the truth to, and you have found your oppressors. So if that is the situation in your workplace, you're already being oppressed, honey. You need to fight the battle, <laughs> fight the battle at home first. I'll tell you how you know you're in this situation. If you've ever seen a new person come into the job and notice something right away that everyone else is very aware of, but for whatever reason can't speak on it, and the new person raises it and everyone in the room gets uncomfortable, like, oh no, oh no, why didn't she shut up? Oh, God. Well, she won't be here much longer. Six weeks tops, probably four. Dang, girl, why didn't you just shut up? If that has ever been you or you've ever been in that situation before, you're in a corporate cult. Because what that means is there's an issue that's well known that if you discuss it, you're on a quick, quick ticket out of there one way or the other. That's how you know. So let's keep going. Page 208, still in chapter 11, says, when what I do totally defines who I am, the employee is in a corporate cult. So when your whole identity is wrapped into your career field and you cannot separate the two, you're in some form of a corporate cult. So to me, it begs the question, where did you learn that who you were was determined by what you did as a career. Who taught you that? Where did you get that from? Did that come from your family? Did it come from your friends? Did it come from the schools or the schools you went to? Society? Where did you get that from? Where did we get that from? That what we do or who we are is determined by what we do as a career field. Because it always begs the question, then what about the kids who haven't even graduated from high school yet? So are they nothing? They're nobodies until they have a career? So you're nothing for 18 years. You're nobody for 21 years until you are defined by a job. Who taught us that? Where do we get that from? Just a thought, just something to think about. So on page 210, he goes on to say, in healthy organizations, conflict centers on actions and behavior, not on personalities. In corporate cults, conflict is attributed to the personality of the combatants. Now, this is highly characteristic of narcissistic behavior. They focus on you, the person, and flip-flopped when you're trying to bring something to their attention and have a conversation about something. You can't because they're making it about them. They believe that you're attacking them, the person. No matter how many times you explain, 
I'm not calling you blank. I'm not saying you're blank. I'm saying when you did this or when you said this, this was the impact. It made me feel this way or it had this impact. I'm not saying you're that type of person or you are that. I'm saying this is what that looks like. When you do that kind of stuff, this is what that behavior is mimicking. They don't hear it, can't hear it. All they hear is, oh, you're attacking me. You're attacking me. You're calling me names. Oh, you're calling me names. And so now you're finding yourself constantly having to delicately put together your words in order to try to get the narc to figure out, I'm not talking about you. We're talking about what you did, but they cannot separate the two and vice versa. So in healthy organizations or relationships or whatever, when you're having a conflict, you're actually able to isolate the person from the behavior. Now, when it starts to look like it might be the person is when it's a pattern, when the pattern starts to come out. But if it's like a one-time thing, people can say, hey, did you re realize the other day when you said blank, how that made blank feel? You know, and then hopefully they're like, oh my God, no, I apologize. Or, oh yeah, I said that, but here's what I meant or whatever. But they're not saying, hey, you're a jerk because you said this. You see, that's, that's attaching the two to each other. So you should be able to focus on actions and behavior, not the actual people, but in corporate cults and when dealing with narcissists, any conflict is attributed to you. You're the problem. It's you. Something's wrong with you and you need to fix yourself. Not what you did. It's you. They want it to be about you. So you're not happy. You're not positive. You're a negative person when you bring up things and start arguing all the time. <laughs> so the final uh, thought for chapter 11 you are still a worthy person, even if you never do another thing in your life. And I know that that's a tough thought for a lot of people to hold on to and believe and wrestle with. If you want something to meditate on for the week, meditate on that. You are still a worthy person, even if you never do another thing in your life. And that's kind of been one of the primary themes of this channel. And one of the things I've been trying to get people to understand is that the narc tries to define you and define your value and your worth based on what you do. But you have inherent worth that is always, it's constant. But the narc doesn't want you to believe that. The narc wants you to believe your worth is contingent upon something. And they love pulling that cord and pulling that string to make you believe that, well, now today you're less worthy than you were yesterday. And tomorrow, hopefully you'll be more worthy than you are today, but today you're definitely not as worthy as you were yesterday. And up and down and up and down and up and down you go. So this is a strong thought to meditate on. You are still a worthy person, even if you never do another thing in your life. So let's move on to the final chapter, chapter 12, how to avoid a corporate cult next time. This starts on page 213. Welcome to everybody in the chat. <laughs> exactly. It says the puppy has an external locus of control, but it's a dog. So if you're just now joining, we were talking about internal versus external locus of control earlier. And yes, she very much has an external locus of control, but she is a dog. Exactly. Exactly. How to avoid a corporate cult next time. So it starts on page 213. And he was talking about success and like what our definition of success means to us. And he was saying that when people get frustrated with their idea of success or if they're frustrated typically with where they are today, the frustration comes from trying to live out someone else's dream which often has organizational success as a big part of the formula. So for a lot of us, that was kind of the way we were raised. We were raised to visualize ourselves in someone's corporation, but of course, big time, 
oh, climb the ladder and get high up. But if you really think about it, think about what that's saying to your child. Like you, small child, have all this potential in the world. And I want you to visualize yourself completely plugged in to somebody else's organization. Someone else in the future will take care of you. Now, some of you would argue and push back and say, well, no, they're taking care of themselves because they have to get the job. They have to show up. They have to actually do the work. They have to do their part. So no, the company is not taking care of them. Yes, the company is. Because in exchange for your child's life, they're providing money, health insurance benefits, things of that nature. So yes, they are taking care of your child. Sure, your child exchanges time, effort, energy, and life for those things, but they are taking care of your child. So it's like, I want you to prepare yourself to go belong to somebody else for the rest of your working years anyway. I don't want that for my child. I really don't. I don't want that to be their mindset. Like I just think of all the people who put in so much time, effort, and energy to one career and then lost it all due to layoffs. No fault of their own, basically, is what I'm saying. And they never could have seen it coming. All that trust they put in these corporations, which is part of the reason I don't really understand why, for example, when buying a house, they base that mortgage largely on your job. But your job is a private entity. Your job, for the most part, unless it's a government job, your job is a private entity. So we don't know what a private entity is going to do for 30 years. So I might have a great job today, but what if my CEO develops a drug habit, goes on a bender and loses everything 10 years into this? You see what I mean? So we're basing all of our major life decisions on these people. Anyway, I'm digressing. His point is that when we find ourselves frustrated along our walk in life, oftentimes it's because we are trying to live out someone else's dream. And a big part of that dream is often, who am I going to work for? And is that what we should be teaching our children? Yes, we need these corporations and things. They help us in life. I'm sure you're currently surrounded by many products, goods, and services that are brought to you by some corporation. So I'm not saying nobody work for companies. Everybody quit and go work for yourself. That's not what I'm saying. We'll always need someone to help us out, help us build out that big idea, help us execute on an idea. But what we're not going to have are these cults of personality and people's whole livelihoods hanging on whether or not they're liked by the in crowd at work. Somehow we've got to find a way to make that illegal unless it's part of your job. Unless being liked is part of your job, we have to find a way to make that illegal. Like if you're a Disney character, who puts on the costumes and walks around the park, you probably shouldn't be mean to the kids. I would imagine you kind of have to be a nice person, at least while you have the costume on. So you get my point. Personality matters in some jobs, but most of them they don't. So anyway, moving on, page 214. Once again, he reminds us that gaining a closer work relationship means a decrease in the intensity of family or community relationships. So the more hours you give to work, the fewer hours are available for your home life, which is why this period of lockdown, as dramatic as it has all been, has really brought a lot of clarity to a lot of people all over the world, really, but especially in America, just how much they had been giving up, just how much life they had missed, just how many different things they had put to the side because of the daily grind of work. So now there's lots of different companies talking about how their company, uh, their employees can work remotely forever. Excellent. Or other companies offering the option of 
they can do whatever they want. If they want to work from home, great. If they want to come in, great, whatever. And I think this is beautiful. You know, I hate that so many people had to die in a global health crisis to bring about changes such as, as that. But I am happy to see these changes finally taking place because I really feel like we were teeter tottering right on the edge of like just complete collapse, global health crisis or not. So people are picking back up old hobbies, spending time with their children, actually teaching and raising their own children, spending time with their spouses. Now that hasn't been great for everyone. Some people are actually splitting up as a result, but a lot of spouses are finding each other again. Like the benefits have been tremendous. So this is just your, this is just your reminder that the more hours you spend at work, the fewer hours you have available to yourself. And you were yourself before you ever had that job. Let's move on. It says page 217, a way to limit, <laughs> a way to limit devotion to the organizational workplace is to change jobs. He didn't put the word frequently in there, but I would like to go ahead and put the word frequently in there. Stay for about three years. And <laughs> if you're able to get another job, maybe consider doing that unless it's such a good opportunity and they're taking such good care of you that to give it up would be foolish and ridiculous or there's nothing else around. So to give it up would mean you would have no job for the next couple of months or years or whatever. My point is don't ever be afraid to go. Don't ever be afraid to leave. Don't be afraid to try something new. If a recruiter calls, entertain all recruiter phone calls. I don't care how happy you are. If a recruiter reaches out to you with a job opportunity, say, hey, listen, I'm pretty happy in my current circumstance, but I'd love to hear about the role anyway. You know, and then if it's not something you would take, just be like, you know, listen, let's keep each other's contact information. You know, for the future, let's touch base six months to a year from now. If you're happy where you are, I'm not saying if you're happy, just quit for no reason. Like, don't be a psychopath. OK, but keep those contacts open. Keep those doors open. Don't ever get too comfortable. OK, because one of the downfalls of that comfort is the potential to be culted. But the other thing is that you just start to completely lose faith in your ability to start over. So you want to keep your connections fresh, keep your skills fresh, keep your eyes open, keep the doors open. And if your fear is that someone will hear that you talk to a recruiter and you'll get in trouble and might lose your current job, then you're already in a corporate cult. You're already in a cult. If you're like, man, I don't want to talk to that recruiter because what if somebody finds out? then they'll think I'm not happy and then they might want me out of here. Yeah, you're in a cult. Some of the highest paid people circulating in these different industries have had multiple jobs, you guys, multiple. They'll work one place for six months, another place for 18 months, one place for two years, multiple jobs. Because part of what that is also saying to the world at large is I don't live in fear. Clearly you manage your money to an extent to where you can actually afford to leave a job at will. So you manage your money to some extent, you don't live in fear and you have some sort of self-respect and dignity about yourself. So it's almost like it develops a certain respect for that person, the person who can back away from the table and just say, you know what, this actually is not working out very well for me. But a way to limit that devotion and that culting is to change jobs frequently, if you're able, unless you're happy. Or if it's yours, like you're a self-employed person and you're happy, you know. People become codependent when they become too reliant on an institution. So it becomes a situation where they no longer know how to survive without that particular institution. What would they do? They don't think about the future anymore. 
they don't think with apprehension about the future enough for them to protect themselves. Oh, I'm not going to start an emergency fund or emergency, what I like to call an exit fund. I'm happy here. They treat me good. There's no need for me to be planning my next move. You should always be planning your next move. <laughs> Because if they snatch the legs out from underneath you, will you be able to catch yourself? Page 215, individuals can make the contribution in life that they are uniquely qualified to make only by being themselves, not by being someone else. So this is another one for you guys to meditate on. You're here to deliver something and only you can deliver that thing. And you constantly trying to force yourself to be somebody that you're not is not serving the world and it's not serving yourself. You have a unique contribution to make that only you are qualified to make. And the more you sacrifice that identity to a literal non-living entity, the less able you are to make that splash. Finally, and then I'll have some closing thoughts this is on page 230, and that is actually, I think that is the last page of the book. You're the one in charge of how much you give up. And I know that we've been trained to do whatever it takes, go the extra mile, be all that you can be, and give your all on the job and you will be rewarded. But I'm venturing to say that even if you are rewarded, it may not be worth it necessarily because next year you may be asked to give up even more and more and more until they finally hit whatever your wall is. If you have a wall and the people who don't have walls generally get gobbled up, they get sick, depressed, anxious, strung out, heavily medicated because they never formed that boundary for themselves. They have allowed others to dictate their lives to them their entire lives. And that's exhausting. It's exhausting to be everybody's puppet. It's enough to be one person's puppet. Can you imagine being more than one person's puppet? That's exhausting. So ultimately, we are the ones that are in charge of how much we give up. And I will tell you this, establishing boundaries, having boundaries, holding firm to your boundaries in the workplace will get you in a lot of trouble. It will. But it's good trouble, right? I'd rather be in that kind of trouble than the anxious, nervous wreck that I've been before from not speaking up for myself, not standing up for myself, just allowing myself to be pulled in multiple different directions, just being a little bit of everybody's puppet, your puppet now and pass me off. Now I'm your puppet. They don't like it when the puppet starts talking on its own. And they definitely don't like it when the puppet starts walking on its own. It's not, it's not how this works, not how any of this works. But ultimately you are the one in charge of how much you give up. And I know a lot of people have told you that that's not the case but I'm telling you it is, and it's a worthy fight. It's worth fighting for. And my hope is that maybe one day we won't actually have to have this fight. That humane treatment and knowing how to treat humans will be very natural. It'll be second nature, but right now it's not. So since it's not, you have to be the one in charge of setting those personal boundaries and not allowing these things to happen to you. So with that, just a few more closing thoughts. I've already stated this, that work is an expectation. So therefore it should be as humane an experience as possible. We no longer have time to waste in terms of work, productivity, and the economy. These past few months have proven that. This is not a game. It never has been a game, really but it's been treated as such because everything was fine. When you keep living the same day, day after day for 20 plus years, you, of course you would never think anything could go wrong. So now that we've been proven otherwise, now it's game time. It's time for us to rethink how we're doing all of these things. 
get rid of and put aside these silly little childish corporate cult type games and mentalities. And let's focus on the task at hand, which is resurrecting or attempting to resurrect this economy in this country. If it can be saved at this point, I don't know. Your life is more important than a paycheck title or career. Yes, money supports our life. Money supports the things that we need to buy for our lives. But if you don't have the actual life for the money to support, then what good is it? So even if you're out on the street, broke, busted and disgusted, you're still alive and there's still a chance versus if you're sitting at your desk and you just kill over from a heart attack because you refuse to take care of yourself or refuse to take a day off or were too afraid to ask for a day off so you could go to the doctor because you weren't feeling well, because you were afraid you wouldn't look like a team player. So you could be broke, busted, living out of your car or on the street, but at least you're still alive versus well-dressed, housed and paid and dead, hunched over at your desk because you were too afraid to speak up from your, for yourself and set those boundaries. Finally, we have the power to change our working world, especially now. Right now, the world is wide open for change. No one knows what the next day is going to hold. And as such, they're very open and very willing to try new things. Right now, we have a lot of leverage and we are in the power position. And we also have something working on our side and in our favor, and that is this global health situation, which is forcing the hand of these people who would have had you all back at work and back at school back in March if they had had their way. But something out of their control forced their hand. Let's take advantage of this pause and start advocating for the things that will make sense even once everything is back up and running, if it comes back up. Thank you so much for watching the Corporate Cults Marathon. Check the description box for more information and resources. Please share this marathon and help free someone else from the corporate cult system. Finally, remember you were a person before you were ever an employee.